Preface of Frederick the Great by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. Frederick the Great by G. A. Henty. Preface. Among the great wars of history, there are few, if any, instances of so long and successfully sustained a struggle against enormous odds as that of the Seven Years' War, maintained by Prussia, then a small and comparatively insignificant kingdom against Russia, Austria, and France simultaneously, who were raided also by the forces of most of the minor principalities of Germany population of prussia was not more than five million while that of the allies considerably exceeded a hundred millions prussia could put with the greatest efforts but a hundred and fifty thousand men into the field and as these were exhausted she had but small reserves to draw upon while the allies could with comparatively little difficulty put five hundred thousand men into the field and replenish them as there was occasion that the struggle was successfully carried on for seven years was due chiefly to the military genius of the king to his indomitable perseverance and to a resolution that no disaster could shake no situation although apparently hopeless appall something was due also at the commencement of the war to the splendid discipline of the prussian army at that time but as comparatively few of those who fought at Lobositz could have stood in the ranks of Torgel, the quickness of the Prussian people to acquire military discipline must have been great, and this was aided by the perfect confidence they felt in their king and the enthusiasm with which he inspired them. Although it was not nominally a war for religion, the consequences were as great and important as those which arose from the Thirty Years' War. Had Prussia been crushed and divided, Protestantism would have disappeared in Germany, and the whole course of subsequent events would have been changed. The war was scarcely less important to Britain than to Prussia. Our close connections with Hanover brought us into the fray, and the weakening of France by her effort against Prussia enabled us to wrest Canada from her to crush her rising power in India, and to obtain that absolute supremacy at sea that we have never since lost. And yet, while every schoolboy knows of the battles of ancient Greece, not one in a hundred has any knowledge whatever of the momentous struggle in Germany, or has ever as much as heard the names of the memorable battles of Rossbach, Lutheran, Prague, Zondorf, Hotchkirch, and Torgel. Carlyle's great work has done much to familiarize older readers with the story, but its bulk, its fullness of detail, and still more the peculiarity of Carlyle's diction and style, place it altogether out of the category of books that can be read and enjoyed by boys. I have therefore endeavored to give the outlines of the struggle for their benefit, but regret that in a story so full of great events, I have necessarily been obliged to devote a smaller share than usual to the doings of my hero, G. A. Henty. End of preface. Chapter One of With Frederick the Great: A Story of the Seven Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. With Frederick the Great, A Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. Chapter 1. King and Marshal. It was early in 1756 that a Scottish trader from Edinburgh entered the port of Stettin. Among the few passengers was a tall young Scots lad, Fergus Drummond by name, though scarcely sixteen, he stood five feet ten in height, and it was evident from his broad shoulders and sinewy appearance that his strength was in full proportion to his height. 
His father had fallen at Culloden ten years before. The glens had been harried by Cumberland soldiers, and the estates confiscated. His mother had fled with him to the hills, and had lived there for some years in the cottage of a faithful clansman, whose wife had been her nurse. Fortunately, they were sufficiently well off to be able to maintain their guests in comfort, and indeed the presence of game, fish, and other matters frequently sent in by other members of the clan had enabled her to feel that her maintenance was no great burden on her faithful friends. For some years she devoted herself to her son's education, and then, through the influence of friends at court, she obtained the grant of a small portion of her late husband's estates, as was able to live in comfort in a position more suited to her former rank. Fergus's life had been passed almost entirely in the open year, accompanied by one or two companions, sons of the clansmen. He would start soon after daybreak and not return until sunset, when they would often bring back a deer from the forest or a heavy creel of salmon or trout from the streams. His mother encouraged him in these excursions, and also in the practice of arms. She confined her lessons to the evening, and even after she settled on a recovered farm at Kilgowie, and obtained the services of a tutor for him, she arranged that he should be permitted to pass the greater part of the day according to his own devices. She herself was a cousin of the two brothers, Keith, the one whom then Lord Marischal had proclaimed the old pretender king of Edinburgh, and both of whom had attained very high rank abroad. The younger Keith, having served with great distinction in the Spanish and Russian armies, and had then taken service under Frederick the Great, from whom he had received the rank of field marshal, and was the king's greatest counsellor and friend. His brother had joined him there, and stood equally high in the king's favour. Although both were devoted Jacobites, and had risked all, at the first rising in favour of the old pretender, neither had taken part in that of Charles Edward, seeing that it was doomed to failure. After Culloden, James Keith, the field marshal, had written to his cousin, Mrs. Drummond, as follows. Dear cousin, I have heard with grief from Alexander Graham, who has come over here to escape the troubles of the grievous loss that has befallen you. He tells me that when in hiding among the mountains, he learned that you had, with your boy, taken refuge with Ian the Forester, whom I well remember when I was last staying with your good husband, Sir John. He also said that your estates had been confiscated, but that he was sure you would be well cared for by your clansmen. Graham told me that he stayed with you for a few hours while he was flying from Cumberland's bloodhounds, and that you told him you intended to remain there and to devote yourself to the boy's education until better times came. I doubt not that ere long, when the hot blood that has been stirred up by this rising has cooled down somewhat, milder measures will be used and some mercy be shown. But it may be long, for the Hanoverian has been badly frightened, and the wings throughout the country greatly scared, and this, for the second time, I am no lover of the usurper. But I cannot agree with all that has been said about the severity of the punishment that has been dealt out. I have been fighting all over Europe, and I know of no country where a heavy reckoning would not have been made after so serious an insurrection. Men who take up arms against the king know that they are staking their lives, but after vengeance comes pardon and the desire to heal wounds, and I trust you will get some portion of your state again. It is early yet to think of what you are going to make of the boy, but I am sure you will not want to see him fighting in the Hanoverian uniform. So if he has a taste for adventure, let him, when the time comes, make his way out to me, or if I should be under the sod by that time, let him go to my brother. There will, methinks, be no difficulty in finding out where we are, for there are so many Scottish abroad that news of us might often come home. However, from time to time I will write to you. Do not expect to hear too often, for I spend far more time in the saddle than at my table, and my fingers are more accustomed to grasp a sword than a pen. 
however be sure that wherever i may be i shall be glad to see your son and to do my best for him see that he is not brought up at your apron string but is well trained in all exercises for we scots have gained a great name for strength and muscle and i would not that one of my kin should fall short of the mark maggie drummond had been much pleased with her kinsman's letter there were few Scotchmen who stood higher in the regard of their countrymen, and the two Keiths had also a European reputation. A husband and many other fiery spirits had expressed surprise and even indignation that the brothers who had taken so prominent a part in the first rising should not have hastened to join Prince Charlie, but the more thoughtful men felt it was a bad omen that they did not do so it was certainly not from any want of adventurous spirit or of courage for wherever adventures were to be obtained wherever blows were most plentiful james keith and his brother were certainly to be in the midst of them but maggie drummond knew the reason for their holding aloof for she had shortly before the coming over of prince charlie received a short note from the field marshal they say that prince charlie edward is meditating a mad scheme of crossing to scotland and raising his standard there if so do what you can to prevent your husband from joining him we made but a poor hand of it last time and the chances of success are vastly smaller now than it was but a comparatively short time since the stuarts had lost the throne of england and there were great numbers who wished them back. Now, the Hanoverian is very much more firmly seated on the throne. The present man has a considerable army, and the troops have had experience of war on the continent and have shown themselves rare soldiers. Were not my brother Lord Marischal of Scotland, and my name somewhat widely known, I should not hang back from the adventure however desperate but our example might lead many who might otherwise stand aloof to take up arms which would bring i think some destruction upon them therefore we shall restrain our own inclinations and shall watch what i feel sure will be a terrible tragedy from a distance striking perhaps somewhat heavier blows than usual upon the heads of turks boors frenchmen and others to make up for our not being able to use our swords where our inclinations would lead us. The King of France will assuredly give no efficient aid to the Stuarts. He has all along used them as puppets, by whose means he can, when he chooses, annoy or coerce England. But I have no belief that he will render any useful aid either now or hereafter use then cousin all your influence to keep drummond at home knowing him as i do i have no great hope that it will avail for i know that he is jacobite to the backbone and that if the prince lands he will be one of the first to join him maggie had not carried out keats injunction she had indeed told her husband when she received the letter that keith believed the enterprise to be so hopeless a one that he should not join in it but she was as ardent in the cause of the stewards as was her husband and said no single word to deter him when an hour after he heard the news of the prince's landing he mounted and rode off to meet him and to assure him that he would bring every man of his following to the spot where his adherents were to assemble from time to time his widow had continued to write to keith though owing to his being continually engaged on campaigns against the turks and tartars he received but two or three of her letters so long as he remained in the service of russia however he displeased the empress elizabeth and at once left the service and entered that of prussia her letters again reached him the connection between france and scotland had always been close and france was a language familiar to most of the upper class and since the civil troubles began such numbers of scottish gentlemen were forced 
either to shelter in france or to take service in the french or other foreign armies that a knowledge of the language became almost a matter of necessity in one of his short letters keith had told him that of all things it was necessary that the lad should speak french with perfect fluency and master as much german as possible and it was to these points that his education had been almost entirely directed as to french there was no difficulty and when she recovered a portion of the estate drummond was lucky in hearing of a hanoverian trooper who having been wounded and left behind in glasgow his term of service having expired had on his recovery married the daughter of the woman who had nursed him he was earning a somewhat precarious living by giving lessons in the use of the rapier and in teaching german and gladly accepted the offer to move out to kilgory where he was established in a cottage close to the house where his wife aided in the housework he became a companion of fergus in his walks and rambles and being an honest and pleasant fellow the lad took to him and after a few months their conversation at first somewhat disjointed become easy and animated he learned too much from him as to the use of his sword the scotch clansmen used their claymores chiefly for striking but under rudolph's tuition the lad came to be as apt with the point as he had before been with the edge and fully recognized the great advantage of the former by the time he reached the age of sixteen his skill with the weapon was fully recognized by the young clansmen who on occasion of festive gatherings sometimes came up to try their skill with the young lord from rudolph too he came to know a great deal of the affairs of europe as to which he had hitherto been profoundly ignorant he learned how by the capture of the province of silesia from the empress of austria the king of prussia had from a minor principality raised his country to a considerable power and was regarded with hostility and jealousy by all his neighbors but it's only a small territory now rudolph fergus said tis small master fergus but the position is a very strong one silesia cannot well be invaded save by an army forcing its way through very formidable defiles while on the other hand the prussian forces can suddenly pour out into saxony or hanover prussia has perhaps the best drilled army in europe and though its numbers are small in proportion to those which austria can put in the field they are a compact force while the austrian army is made up of many peoples and could not be gathered with the speed with which frederick could place his force in the field the king too is himself above all things a soldier he has good generals and his troops are devoted to him though the discipline is terribly strict it is a pity that he and the king of england are not good friends they are natural allies both countries being protestant and to say the truth we at hanover should be well pleased to see them make common cause together and should feel much more comfortable with prussia as our friend than as a possible enemy however tis not likely that at present prussia will turn her hand against us i hear by letters from home that it is said that the empress of russia as well as the empress of austria both hate Frederick the latter because he has stolen silesia from her the former because he has openly said things about her such as a woman never forgives saxony and poland are jealous of him and france none too well disposed so at present the king of prussia is like to leave his neighbors alone for he may need to draw his sword at any time in self-defence it was but a few days after this that Maggie Drummond received this short letter from her cousin, Marshal James Keith. My dear cousin, by your letter received a few days since, I learned that Fergus is now nearly sixteen years old and is, you say, as well grown and strong as many lads two or three years older. Therefore, it is as well 
that you should send him off to me at once there are signs in the air that we shall shortly have stirring times and the sooner he is here the better i would send money for his outfit but as your letter tells me that you have by your own economy saved a sum ample for this purpose i abstain from doing so let him come straight to berlin and inquire for me at the palace i have a suite of apartments there and he could not have a better time for entering upon military service nor a better master than the king who loves his scotchman and under whom he is like to find opportunity to distinguish himself a week later fergus started it needed a heroic effort on the part of his mother to let him go from her but she had all along recognized that it was for the best that he should leave her there he should grow up as a petty lord where his ancestors had been the owners of wide estates and were powerful chiefs with a large following of clansmen and retainers was not to be thought of scotland offered few openings especially to those belonging to jacobite families and it was therefore deemed the natural cause for a young man of spirit to seek his fortune abroad and from the days of the union there was scarcely a foreign army that did not contain a considerable contingent of scottish soldiers and officers they formed nearly a third of the army of gustavus adolphus and the service of the protestant princes of germany had always been popular among them then her own cousin being a marshal in the prussian army it seemed to mrs drummond almost a matter of course when the time came that fergus should go to him and she had for many years devoted herself to preparing the lad for that service nevertheless now that the time had come she felt the parting no less sorely but she bore up well and the sudden notice kept her fully occupied with preparations till the hour came for his departure two of the men rode with him as far as leith and saw him on board ship rudolph had volunteered to accompany him as servant but his mother had said to the lad it would be better not fergus of course you will have a soldier servant there and there might be difficult in having a civilian with him it was however arranged that rudolph should become a member of the household being a handy fellow, a fair carpenter, ready to turn his hand to anything, there would be no difficulty in making him useful about the farm. Fergus had learnt from him the price at which he ought to be able to buy a useful horse, and his first step after landing at Stetton and taking up his quarters at an inn was to inquire the address of a horse dealer. The latter found, somewhat to his surprise, that the young scot was a fair judge of a horse and a close hand at driving a bargain and when he left the lad had the satisfaction of knowing that he was the possessor of a serviceable animal and one which by its looks would do him no discredit three days later he rode into berlin he dismounted at a quiet inn changed his travelling dress for the new one that he carried in his valise and then after inquiring for the palace made his way there he was struck by the number of soldiers in the streets and with the neatness and indeed almost stiffness of their uniform and bearing each man walked as if on parade and the eye of the strictest martinet could not have detected a speck of dust on their equipment or an ill-adjusted strap or buckle I hope they do not brace and tie up their officers in that style, Fergus said to himself. He himself had always been accustomed to a loose and easy attire, suitable for mountain work, and the high cravats and stiff cows, powdered heads and pigtails, and, and tight-fitting garments seemed to him the acne of discomfort. It was not long however before he came upon a group of officers and saw that the military etiquette was no less strict in their case than in that of the soldiers save that their collars were less high and their stocks more easy their walk too was somewhat less automatic and machine-like 
but they were certainly in strong contrast to the British officers he had seen on the occasions of one or two visits to Perth. On reaching the palace and saying that he wished to see Marshal Keith, he was conducted by a soldier to his apartment, and on the former taking in the youth's name, he was at once admitted. The marshal rose from his chair, came forward, and shook him heartily by the hand. So you are Fergus Drummond, he said, the son of my cousin Maggie. Truly, she lost no time in sending your wife after she got my letter. I was afraid she might be long before she could bring herself to part from you. She had made up her mind to it so long sir that she was prepared for it and indeed i think that she did her best to hurry me off as soon as possible not only because your letter was somewhat urgent but because it gave her less time to think that was right and sensible lad as indeed maggie always was from a child she did not speak too strongly about you for indeed i should have taken you for fully two years older than you are you have lost no time in growing, lad, and if you lose no more in climbing, you will not be long before you are well up the tree. Now sit down and let me first hear all about your mother and how she fares. In the first place, sir, she charged me to give you her love and affection and to thank you for your good remembrance of her and for writing to her so often when you must have had so many other matters on your mind. I was right glad when I heard that they had given her back, Kilgowrie. It is but a corner of your father's lands, but I remember the old house well going over there once when I was staying with your grandmother to see his mother, who was then living there. How much land goes with it? About a thousand acres, but the greater part is moor and mountain. Still the land suffices for her to live on, seeing that she keeps up no show and lives as quietly as if she had never known anything better ay she was ever of a contented spirit i mind her when she was a tiny child if no one would play with her she would sit by the hour talking with her dolls till someone could spare time to perch her on his shoulder and take her out marshal keith was a tall man with a face thoughtful and repose but having a pleasant smile and an eye that lit up with quiet humor when he spoke he enjoyed the king's confidence to the fullest extent and was regarded by him not only as a general in whose sagacity and skill he could entirely rely but as one on whose opinion he could trust upon all political questions he was his favorite companion when as happened not unfrequently he donned a disguise and went about the town, listening to the talk of the citizens and learning their opinions upon public affairs. I have spoken to the king about your coming, lad, and told him that you were a kinsman of mine. Indeed, Marshal, the king said, from what I can see, it appears to me that all Scotchmen are more or less kin to each other. It is so to some extent, Your Majesty. We Scotchmen pride ourselves on genealogy and know every marriage that has taken place for ages past between the members of our family and those of others and claim as kin, even though very distant all those who have any of our blood running in their veins. But in this case, the kinship is close. The lad's mother being a first cousin of mine, his father was killed at Culloden, and I promised her, as soon as the news came to me, that when he had grown up strong and hearty, he should join me, wherever I might be, and should have a chance of making his fortune by his sword. You say that he speaks both French and German? Well, it is more than I can do, the king said with a laugh. German-born and German king as I am, I get on but badly when I try my native tongue for from a child i have spoken nothing but french still it is well that he should know the language in my case it matters but little seeing that all my court and all my generals speak french but one who has to give orders to soldiers should be understood by them well what do you want me to do for the lad i propose to make him one of my own aide de camps i replied and therefore i care not so much to what regiment he is appointed 
though i own that i would far rather see him in the uniform of the guards than any other you are modest marshal but i observe that it is a common fault among your countrymen well which shall it be infantry or cavalry cavalry since you are good enough to give me the choice sire the uniform looks better for an aide-de-camp than that of the infantry very well then you may consider him gazetted as a cornet in my third regiment of guards you have no more kinsmen coming at present keith no sir not at present if many more come i shall form them into a separate regiment your majesty might do worse i said the king nodded i wish i had half a dozen scotch regiments ay a score or two they were the cream of the army of gustavus adolphus and if matters turn out as i fear they will it would be a welcome reinforcement i will give you a note pleasantly continued the marshal to a man who makes my uniform so that i may present you to the king as soon as you are enrolled you must remember that your favour or otherwise with him will depend very largely upon the fit of your uniform and the manner in which you carry yourself there is nothing so unpardonable in his eyes as a slovenly and ill-fitting dress everything must be correct to a nicety under all circumstances even during hot campaigns you must turn out in the morning as if you came from a bandbox i will get colonel grunow who commands your regiment to tell off an old trooper one who is thoroughly up to his work as your servant i doubt not that he may be even able to find you a scotchman but there are many in the ranks gentlemen who came over after culloden and hundreds of bay fellows who escaped cumberland's harriers by taking ship and coming over here where as they supposed they would fight under a protestant king but the king is a protestant is he not sir he is nominally a protestant fergus absolutely his majesty has so many things to see about that he does not trouble himself greatly about religion i should say that he was a discipline of voltaire until voltaire came here when upon acquaintance he saw through the vanity of the little frenchman and has been much less enthusiastic about him since by the way how did you come here we heard of a ship sailing for stettin and that hurried my departure by some days i made a good voyage there and on landing brought a horse and rode here well i'm afraid your horse won't do to carry one of my aides de camps so you had best dispose of it for what it will fetch i will mount you myself his majesty was pleased to give me two horses the other day and my stable is therefore over full now fergus we will drink a goblet of wine to your new appointment and success to your career for what you said in your letter to my mother sir are you think it likely that we shall see service before long ay lad and desperate service too we have but mind this this must go no further sure news that russia austria france and saxony have formed a secret league against prussia and that they intend to crush us first and then partition the kingdom among themselves the empress of austria has shamelessly denied that any such treaty exists but tomorrow morning a messenger will start with a demand from the king that the treaty shall be publicly acknowledged and then broken off or that he will at once proclaim war if we say nine days for the journey there nine days to return and three days waiting for the answer you see that in three weeks from the present we may be on the move for our only chance depends upon striking a heavy blow before they are ready we have not wasted our time the king has already made an alliance with england but england has no troops or scarcely any fergus said no lad but she has what is of quite as much importance in war namely money and she can grant us a large subsidy the king's interest in the matter is almost as great as ours he is a hanoverian more than an englishman and you may be sure that if prussia were to be crushed the allies would make but a single bite of hanover you see this will be a war of life and death to us 
and the fighting will be hard and long. But what grievance has France against the king? His majesty is open-spoken and no respecter of persons, and a woman may forgive an injury, but never a scornful jibe. It is this that has brought both France and Russia on him. Madame Pompadour, who is all-powerful, hates Frederick for having made disrespectful remarks concerning her. The Empress of Russia detests him. For the same reason, she of Austria had a better cause, for she has never forgiven the loss of Silesia, and it is the enmity of these women, as much as the desire to partition Prussia, that is about to plunge Europe into a war to the full as terrible as that of the Thirty Years' War. Keith now rang a bell, and a soldier entered. Tell Lieutenant Lindsay that I wish to speak to him. A minute later, an officer entered the room and saluted stiffly. Lindsay, this is a young cousin of mine, Fergus Drummond. King has appointed him to a cornetcy in the Third Royal Dragoon Guards, but he is going to be one of my aide-de-camps, now that things are beginning to move. You and Gordon will need help. Take him first to Torts. I have written a note to the man telling him that he must hurry everything on. There is still a spare room on your corridor, is there not? Get your man to see his things bestowed there. I shall get his appointment this evening, I expect, but it will be a day or two before he will be able to get a soldier from his regiment. He has a horse to sell and various other matters to see to. At any rate, look after him till tomorrow. Tis my hour to go to the king. Lindsay was a young man of two or three and twenty. He had a merry, joyous face, a fine figure, and a good carriage. But until he and Fergus were beyond the limits of the palace, he walked by the lad's side with scarce a word. When once past the entrance, however, he gave a sigh of relief. Now, Drummond, he said, we will shake hands and begin to make each other's acquaintance. First, I am Nigel Lindsay, very much at your service. On duty, I am another person altogether, scarcely recognizable, even by myself, a sort of wooden machine, ready when a button is touched, to bring my heels smartly together, and my hand to the salute. There is something in the air that stiffens one's backbone and freezes one from the tip of one's toes to the end of one's pigtail. When one is with the marshal alone, one thaws, for there is no better fellow living, and he chats to us as if we were on a mountainside in Scotland instead of in Frederick's palace. But one is always being interrupted. Either a general or a colonel, or possibly the king himself, comes in. For the time, one becomes a military statue, and even when they go, it is difficult to take up the talk as it was left. Oh, it is wearing some work, and heartily glad I shall be when the trumpets blow and we march out of Berlin. However, we are beginning to be pretty busy. I have been on horseback 12 hours a day on an average for the past week. Gordon started yesterday for Magdeburg, and McGregor, has been two days absent, but I don't know where. Everyone is busy from the king himself, who is always busy about something to the youngest drummer. Nobody outside a small circle knows what it is all about. Apparently, we are in a state of profound peace, without a cloud in the sky, and yet the military preparations are going on actively everywhere. Convoys of provisions are being sent to the frontier fortresses. Troops are in movement from the northern provinces. Drilling is going on. I was going to say night and day, for it is pretty nearly that, and no one can make out what it is all about. There is one thing no one asks questions. His Majesty thinks for his subjects, and as he certainly is the cleverest man in his dominions, everyone is well content that it should be so. And now, about yourself, I am running on and talking nonsense when I have all sorts of questions to ask you, but that is always the way with me. I am like a bottle of champagne, corked down while I'm in the palace, and directly I get away, the cork flies out by itself, and for a minute or two is all froth and emptiness. Now, when did you arrive? How did you arrive? What is the latest news from Scotland? 
which of the branches of the drummonds do you belong to and how near kin are you to the marshal oh by the way i ought to know the last without asking as you are a drummond and a releasing a key you can be no other than the son of drummond of tarbay who married margaret ugly life who was a first cousin of keith that is right fergus said my father fell at culloden you know as to all your other questions they are answered easily enough i know very little of the news in scotland for my mother lived a very secluded life at kilgowrie and little news came to us from without i came from leith to stet and there i bought a horse and rode on here his companion laughed and how about yourself i suppose you know nothing about this beastly language yes i can speak it pretty fluently and of course no french i congratulate you though how you learnt it up in the hills i know not i did not know a word of it when i came out two years ago and it's always on my mind for of course i have a master who when i am not otherwise engaged comes to me for an hour a day and well nigh maddens me with his cracked jaw words but i don't seem to make much progress if i am sent with an order and the officer to whom i take it does not understand french i am floored of course i hand the order if it is a written one to him if it is not but just some verbal message asking him to call on the marshal at such and such a time i generally make a horrible mess of it he gets in a rage with me because he cannot understand me i get in a rage with him for his dullness and were it not that he generally manages to find some other officer who does understand French, the chances are very strongly against Keith's message being attended to. First of all, I will take you to our quarters. That is the house. Why, I thought you lodged in the palace. Heaven forbid. MacGregor has a room in the chief suite of apartments. He is a senior aide de camp, and if there is any message to be sent led he takes it but that is not often the case gordon lodges here with me the house is a sort of branch establishment to the palace malcolm menzies and horace farquhar two junior aides of the king are in the same corridor with us of course we make up a party by ourselves then there are ten or twelve german officers some of them aide de camps of the prince's maurice and henry the prince of bevern and general schwerin beside a score or two of palace officials fortunately the scotch corridor as we call it has a separate entrance so we can go in or out without disturbing anyone it is a good thing for in fact we and the prussians do not get on very well together they have a sort of jealousy of us which is i suppose natural enough foreigners are never favorites and george's hanoverian officers are not greatly loved in london i expect the campaign will do good that way they will see at any rate that we don't take our pay for nothing and we are ready to do full share and more of fighting while we shall find that these stiff pipe clay figures are brave fellows and good comrades when they get a little of the starch washed out of them now this is my room and i see my man has got dinner ready end of chapter one chapter two of with frederick the great a story of the seven years war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Oldham. With Frederick the Great, A Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. Chapter 2. Joining. In answer to the shout of Donald, a tall man in the pantaloons of a Prussian regiment, but with his tunic laid aside, came out from a small room that served as a kitchen and dormitory for himself. 
i am just ready sir he said hearing you talking as you came along and not knowing who you might have with you i just ran in to put on my coat but as you passed and i heard it was scottish you were speaking i knew that it didn't matter put another plate and goblet on the table donald i hope that you have meat enough for two of us plenty for four the soldier said the market was full this morning and the folks so tanned up with this talk of war and so puzzled because no one could make out what it was about that they did more gossiping than marketing so when the time came for the market to close i got half a young pig at less than i should have paid for a joint as the woman did not want to carry it home again this is lucky as you are from perth donald it is possible you may know this gentleman he is mr fergus drummond of tarbet i kenned his father weel i and was close beside him at Culloden. for when our company was broken i joined one that was making a stand close by and it was drummond who was leading it stoutly did we fight and to the end stood back to back hewing with our claymores at their muskets at last i fell wounded i could not say where at the time when i came to myself and finding that all was quiet sat up and felt myself over i found that it was a musket bullet that had ploughed along the top of my head and would have killed me had it not been that my skull was as my father has often said when i was a boy thicker than ordinary there was dead men lying all about me but it was a dark night and as there was no time to be lost if i was to save my skin i crawled away to some distance from the field and then took to my heels and did not stop till next morning when i was far away among the hills while he was talking donald had been occupied in adding a second plate and knife and fork and glass and the two officers sat down to their meal fergus asked the soldier other questions as to the fight in which his father had lost his life for beyond that he had fought to the last with his face to the foe the lad had never learnt any particulars for of the clansmen who had accompanied his father that one had ever returned mr drummond will take the empty room next to mine donald i am going down now with him to the inn where he has left his horse as he has a few things there you had best come with us and bring them here the landlord of the inn on hearing that fergus wished to sell his horse and said that there were two travellers in the house who had asked him about horses as both had sold two officers fine animals they had brought in from the country there being at present a great demand for horses of that class one of these persons came in as they were speaking and after a little bargaining fergus sold the horse to him at a small advance on the price he had given for it at stettin the landlord himself bought the saddle and bridle for a few marks saying that he could at any time find a customer for such matters donald took the valises and cloak and carried them back to the palace the matter is all comfortably settled lindsay said now we are free men but my liberty won't last long i shall have to go on duty again in half an hour but at any rate there is time to go first with you to the tailors and put your uniform in hand i wish to be measured for the uniform of the third royal dragoon guards fergus said as he entered the shop and the proprietor came up to him yes herr tots and his excellency marshal keith lindsay put in wishes you to know that the dress suit must be made instantly or quicker if possible for his majesty may at any moment order mr drummond to attend upon him mr drummond is appointed one of the marshal's aides de camp and therefore he will often come under the king's eye you may well believe that the fit must be of the best or you are likely to hear of it as well as mr drummond i will put it in hand at once lieutenant it shall be cut out without delay and in three hours if mr drummond will call here it shall be tacked together in readiness for the first trying on by eight o'clock tomorrow morning it shall be ready to be properly fitted and unless my men have bungled which they very seldom do it shall be delivered by midday mr drummond lodges in the next room to myself the lieutenant said and my servant is looking after him till he gets one of his own so you can leave it with him 
while the conversation was going on two of the assistants were measuring fergus will you have the uniform complete with belts helmet and all equipments everything except the sword fergus said at least i suppose lindsay we can carry our own swords yes the king has made that concession which is a wonderful one for him that scottish officers in his service may carry their own swords you see ours are longer and straighter than the german ones and most of us have learnt our exercises with them and certainly we would not fight so well with others besides the iron basket protects one's hand and wrist vastly better than the foreign guard the concession was first made only to generals field officers and aides de camp but keith persuaded the king at last to grant it to all scottish officers pointing out that they were able to do much better service with their own claymores than with weapons to which they were altogether unaccustomed and that scottish men were accustomed to fight with the edge and to strike downright sweeping blows whereas the swords here are fitted only for the point which although doubtless superior in a duel is far less effective in a general melee i should certainly be sorry to give up my own sword fergus said it was one of my fathers and since the days when i was big enough to begin to use it i have always exercised myself with though i too have learned to use the point a great deal as i had a german instructor as well as several scottish ones except in a duel lindsay said i should doubt if skill goes for very much i have never tried it myself for i have never had the luck to be in a battle but i fancy that in a cavalry charge strength goes for more than skill and the man who can strike quickly and heavily will do more execution than one trained to all sorts of nice points and feints i grant that these are useful when two men are watching each other but in the heat of battle when every one is cutting and thrusting for his life i cannot think that there is any time for fooling about with your weapon they had by this time left the shop and were strolling down the streets. Is there much dueling here? It is strictly forbidden, Lindsay said with a laugh, but I need hardly say that there is a good deal of it. Of course, pains are taken that these affairs do not come to His Majesty's ears. Fever or a fall from a horse account satisfactorily enough for the absence of an officer from parade, and even his total disappearance from the scene can be similarly explained should the affair come to the king's ears tis best to keep out of his way until it has blown over of course with us it does not matter quite so much as with prussian officers Frederick's is not the only service open to us good swords are welcome either at the russian or austrian courts to say nothing of those of half a dozen minor principalities at all of these we are sure to find countrymen and friends and if england really enters upon the struggle and it seems to me that if there is a general row she can scarcely stand aloof men who have learned their drill and seen some service might be welcome even if their fathers wielded their arms on the losing side ten years ago of course to a prussian officer it would be practical ruin to be dismissed from the army this is so thoroughly well understood that in cases of duels there is sort of a general conspiracy on the part of all the officers and surgeons of a regiment to hush the matter up still if an officer is insulted or thinks that he is insulted which is about the same thing he fights and takes the consequences i am not altogether sorry that i am an aide-de-camp and i think that you can congratulate yourself on the same fact for we are not thrown as is a regimental officer into the company of prussians and there is therefore far less risk of getting into a quarrel i have no doubt the marshal himself will give you a few lessons shortly he is considered to be one of the finest swordsmen in europe and in many respects he is as young as i am and as fond of adventure he gave me a few when i first came to him but he said that it was time thrown away for that i must put myself in the hands of some good mate the arms before he could teach me anything that would be useful i have been working hard with one since and know a good deal more about it than i did but my teacher says that i am too hot and impetuous to make a good swordsman 
and that though i should do well enough in a melee i shall never be able to stand up against a cool man in a duel of course the marshal had no idea of teaching me arms but merely as he said of showing me a few passes that might be useful to me on occasion in reality he loves to keep up his sword play and once or twice a week van bruff who is the best master in berlin comes in for half an hour's practice with him before breakfast after lindsay had left him at the entrance to the palace fergus wandered about the town for some hours and then went into the tailor's and had his uniform tried on merely run together though it was the coat fitted admirably you are an easy figure to fit herr drummond the tailor said there is no credit in putting together a coat for you your breeches are a little too tight you have a much more powerful leg than is common but that however is easily altered here are a dozen pairs of high boots i notice the size of your foot and have no doubt that you will find some of these to fit you this was indeed the case and among a similar collection of helmets fergus also had no difficulty in suiting himself i think that you will find everything ready for you by half past eight the tailor said and i trust that no further alteration will be required six of my best journeymen will work all night at the close and even should his majesty send for you by ten i trust that you will be able to make a proper appearance before him though at present i cannot guarantee that some trifling alteration will not be found necessary when you try the uniforms on fergus supped with the marshal who had now time to ask him many more questions about his home life and the state of things in scotland tis a sore pity he said that we scotchmen and irishmen who are to be found in such numbers in every european army are not all arrayed under the flag of our country methinks that the time is not far distant when it will be so i am as you know a jacobite but there is no shutting one's eyes to the fact that the cause is a lost one the expedition of james the third and still more that of charles edward have caused such widespread misery among the stuart's friends that i cannot conceive that any further attempt of the same kind will be made in fact there is no one to make it the prince has lost almost all his friends by his drunken habits and his quarrelsome and overbearing disposition he has gone from court to court as a suppliant but has everywhere alienated the sympathies of those most willing to befriend him i may say that as a king of england and scotland he is now impossible and his own habits have done more to ruin his cause than even the defeat of collodion there are doubtless many in both countries who consider themselves jacobites but it is a matter of sentiment and not of passion at any rate there is no head to the cause now and cannot possibly be unless the prince had a son therefore for at least five and twenty years the cause is dead even if the prince leaves an heir it would be absurd to entertain the idea that after the stuarts had been expelled from england a hundred years any scotchman or englishman would be mad enough to risk his life and property to restore them to the throne another generation and the hanoverians will have become englishmen and the sentiment against them as foreigners will have died out then there will be no reason why scotchmen and irishmen should any longer go abroad and all who wish it will be able to find employment in the army of their own country this indeed might have happened long before this had the georges forgotten that they were electors of hanover as well as kings of great britain and had surrounded themselves with englishmen instead of filling their courts with germans whose arrogance and greed made them hateful to the englishmen and kept before their eyes the fact that the kings were foreigners hanover is a source of weakness instead of strength to great britain and its loss would be an unmixed benefit to her for as long as it remains under the british crown so long must britain play a part in european politics a part too sometimes absolutely opposed to the interests of the country at large after supper was over two general officers dropped in for a chat with the marshal he introduced fergus to them and the latter then retired and joined the little party of scottish officers at lindsay's quarters 
lindsay introduced him to them and he was very heartily received and it was not until very late that they turned in to bed at half past eight next morning fergus went to the tailors and found that he had kept his promise to the letter the uniforms fitted admirably and were complete in every particular as marshal keith had the evening before informed them that he had received his appointment to the third royal dragoon guards he had no hesitation in putting on a uniform when a quarter of an hour later it arrived at his quarters donald went out and fetched the hairdresser who combed powdered and tied up his hair in proper military fashion when he left donald took him in hand and attired him in his uniform showed him the exact angle at which his belt should be worn and the military salute that should be given it was fortunate that he was in readiness for at half past ten lindsay came in with a message from the marshal that he was at once to repair to the palace with or without a uniform as the king had sent to say that he should visit keith at eleven and that he could then present his cousin to him it could not be said that fergus felt comfortable as he started from his quarters accustomed to a loose dress and light shoes he felt stiff and awkward in his tight garments closely buttoned up and his heavy jack-boots and he found himself constrained to walk with the same stiffness and precision that had amused him in the prussian offices on the previous day so you have got your uniform the marshal said as fergus entered and saluted as donald had instructed him it becomes you well lad and the king will be pleased at seeing you in it he could not have blamed you had it not be ready for the time has been short indeed but he will like to see you in it and will consider that it shows alacrity and zeal presently the door opened and as the marshal rose and saluted fergus knew that it was the king he had never had the king described to him and he had depicted to himself a stiff and somewhat austere figure but the newcomer was somewhat below middle height with a kindly face and the air rather of a sober citizen than of a military martinet the remarkable feature of his face were his eyes which were very large and blue with a quick piercing glance that seemed to read the mind of any one to whom he addressed himself so striking were they that the king when he went about the town in disguise was always obliged to keep his eyes somewhat downcast as however well made up they would have betrayed him at once had he looked fixedly at any one who had once caught sight of his face good morning marshal he said in a friendly tone so this is my last recruit a goodly young fellow truly he walked round fergus as if he were examining a lay figure closely scrutinizing every article of his appointment then gave a nod of approbation always keep yourself like that young sir an officer is unfit to take charge of men unless he can set an example of exactness in dress if a man is precise in little things he will be careful in other matters although he is going to be your aide-de-camp keith he had better go to his regimental barracks and drill for a few hours a day if you can spare him he shall certainly do so sire i spoke to his colonel yesterday evening and told him that i would myself take the lad down to him this morning and present him to his comrades of the regiment it would be well if he could have six months drilling for an aide-de-camp should be well acquainted with the meaning of the orders he carries as he is in this case far less likely to make mistakes than he would otherwise be your majesty has nothing more to say to him nothing i hope he is not quarrelsome but there it is of no use my hoping that keith for your scotchman is a quarrelsome creature by nature at least so it seems to me of the duels that in spite of my orders take place i know you all try to hide them from me keith i hear of a good many between these hot-headed countrymen of yours and my prussian officers with deference to your majesty i don't think that that proves much it would be as fair to say that these duels show how aggressive are your prussian officers towards my quiet and patient countrymen now you can retire cornet fergus gave the military salute and retired to the anteroom have you passed muster lindsay asked him with a laugh yes at least the king found nothing wrong he was not at all what i thought he would be no i was astonished myself the first time i saw him 
he is a capital fellow in spite of his severity in matters of military etiquette and discipline he is very kind-hearted does not stand at all upon his dignity bears no malice and very soon remits punishment he has given in the heat of the moment i think that he regards us scotch as being a people for whom allowances must be made on the ground of our inborn savagery and ignorance of civilized customs he does not mind plain speaking on our part and if in the humor will talk with us much more familiarly than he would do to a prussian officer in a few minutes the bell in the next room sounded lindsay went in are the horses at the door yes marshal then we will mount at once i told the colonel of the third that i should be at the barracks by twelve o'clock unless the king wanted me on his business fergus had already put on his helmet and he and lindsay followed keith downstairs in the courtyard where the horses which were held by orderlies that is yours fergus keith said it has plenty of bone and blood and should carry you well for any distance fergus warmly thanked the marshal for the gift it was a very fine horse and capable of carrying double his weight it was fully caparisoned with military bridle and saddle and horse cloth they mounted at once the orderlies ran to their horses which was held by a mounted trooper and the four fell in behind the officers lindsay and fergus rode half a length behind the marshal but the latter had some difficulty in keeping his horse in that position the marshal smiled it does not understand playing second fiddle fergus you see it has been accustomed to head the procession as they rode along the street all officers and soldiers stood as stiff as statues at the salute the marshal returning it as punctiliously though not as stiffly in a quarter of an hour they arrived at the gate of a large barracks the guard turned out as soon as the marshal was seen approaching and a trumpet call was heard in the courtyard as they entered the gate fergus was struck with the spectacle the like of which he had never seen before the whole regiment was drawn up in parade order the colonel was some distance in the front the officers ranged at intervals behind him suddenly the colonel raised the sword above his head a flash of steel ran along the line eight trumpeters sounded the first note of a military air and the regiment stood at the salute men and horses immovable as if carved in stone a minute later the music stopped the colonel raised his sword again there was another flash of steel and the salute was over then the colonel rode forward to meet the marshal nothing could have been better my dear colonel the latter said and i told you yesterday my inspection of your regiment is but mere form for i know well that nothing could be more perfect than its order but i must report to the king that i have inspected all the regiments now in berlin and potsdam and others that will form my command should any untold event disturb the peace of the country but before i begin permit me to present to you this young officer who was yesterday appointed to your regiment i have already spoken to you of him this is cornet fergus drummond a cousin of my own and whom i recommend strongly to you as i informed you he will for the present act as one of my aide de camp you have lost no time in getting a uniform mr drummond the colonel said i am sure that you will be most cordially received by all my officers as by myself as a relation of the marshal whom we all respect and love i will now proceed to the inspection the marshal said as he proceeded towards the end of the line the colonel rode beside him but a little behind the two aides de camps followed and the four troopers brought up the rear they proceeded along the front rank the officers having before this taken up their position in the line the marshal looked closely at each man as he passed horse as well as man being inspected i do not think colonel that the king himself could have discovered the slightest fault or blemish the regiment is simply perfect i hope that during the next few days you will have every shoe inspected by the farrier and every one showing the least sign of wear taken off and replace and that you will also direct the captains of troops to see that the men's kits are in perfect order 
that shall be done sir though i own that i cannot see against whom we are likely to march for though the air is full of rumours all our neighbours seem to think of nothing so little as war it may be keith said with a smile that is merely his majesty's attention to see in how short a time we can place an army complete in every particular and ready for a campaign in the field his majesty is fond of trying military experiments i hope marshal that you will do us the honour of drinking a goblet of champagne with us some of my officers have not yet been presented to you and i shall be glad to take the opportunity of doing so with pleasure colonel a good offer should never be refused by this time they had moved to the front of the regiment officers and men of the third royal dragoon guards keith said in a loud voice i shall have great pleasure in reporting to the king the results of my inspection that the regiment is in a state of perfect efficiency and that i have been unable to detect the smallest irregularity or blemish i am quite sure that if you should at any time be called upon to fight the enemies of your country you will show that your conduct and courage will be fully equal to the excellence of your appearance i feel that whatever men can do you will do god save the king he lifted his plumed hat the trumpet sounded and the men gave the royal salute and then a loud cheer burst from the ranks for the rumours current had raised a feeling of excitement throughout the regiment and though no man could see from what point danger threatened all felt that great events were at hand the regiment was then dismissed hoarse words of command were shouted and each troop moved off to its stable, while the colonel and Keith rode to the officers' anteroom. The trumpets at the same time sounding the officers' call. In a few minutes, all were gathered there. The colonel first presented some of his young officers to the marshal, and then introduced Fergus to his new comrades, among whom were two Scotch officers. Mr. Drummond will, for the present, serve with the marshal as one of his aides de camp, but I hope that he will soon join the regiment where, at any rate, he will at all times find a warm welcome. Keith had already told the colonel that, for the present, Fergus would be released from all duty as an aide de camp and would spend his time in acquiring the rudiments of drill. Champagne was now served round. The officers drank the health of the marshal and he in return drank to the regiment then all formality was laid aside for a time and the marshal laughed and chatted with the officers as if he had been one of themselves fergus was surrounded by a group were all pleased at finding that he could already talk the language fluently and in spite of the jealousy of the scottish officers felt throughout the service the impression that he made was a very favourable one and the hostility of race was softened by the fact that he was a near relation of the marshal who was universally popular he won favour too by saying when the colonel asked whether he would rather have a scottish or a prussian troopers signed to him as servant and orderly that he would choose one of the latter after speaking to the adjutant the colonel gave an order and two minutes later a tall and powerful trooper entered the room and saluted the adjutant went up to him. Carl Hoger, he said, you are appointed orderly and servant to Mr. Fergus Drummond. He is quartered at the officer's house facing the palace. You will take your horse round there and await his arrival. He will show you where it is to be stabled. You are released from all regimental duty until further orders. The man saluted and retired, without the slightest change of face to show whether the appointment was agreeable to him or otherwise. Half an hour later, the marshal mounted and with his party rode back to the palace. After he had dismounted, Lindsay and Fergus rode across to their quarters. Carl Hoger was standing at the entrance holding his horse. He saluted as the two officers came up. I will go in and see if dinner is ready, Lindsay said. I told Donald that we should be back at half past one and it is nearly two now and i am hungry as a hunter fergus led the way to the stable and pointed out to the troop of the two stalls that the horses were to occupy for each room in the officers quarter had two stalls attached to it the one for the occupant the other for his orderly 
i suppose you have not dined yet carl no sir but that does not matter i don't want you to begin by fasting here are a couple of walks when you have stabled the horse and finished here you had better go out and get yourself dinner i shall not be able to draw rations for you today after you have done come to the main entrance where i met you and take the first corridor to the left mine is the fifth room on the right hand side if i am not in knock at the next door to it on this side you will see lieutenant lindsay's name on it you need not be in any hurry over your meal for i am just going to have dinner and certainly shall not watch you for an hour on reaching lindsay's quarters fergus found that dinner was waiting and he and Lindsay lost no time in attacking a fine fish that Donald had bought in the market. This is a fine regiment of yours, Drummond, Lindsay said. Magnificent, of course. I never saw anything like it before, but it was certainly splendid. Yes, they distinguished themselves in the campaigns of Silesia very much. Their Colonel Grimm is a capital officer very strict but a really good fellow and very much liked by his officers however if i were you i should be in no hurry to join i had two years and a half in an infantry regiment before keith appointed me one of his aide-de-camps and i can tell you it was hard work drill from morning till night we were stationed at a miserable country place without any amusements or anything to do and as at that time there did not seem the most remote chance of active service it was a dog's life every one was surly and ill-tempered and i had to fight two duels what about about nothing as far as i could see a man said something about scotch officers in a tone i did not like i was out of temper and instead of turning it off with a laugh i took it up seriously and threw a glass at his head so of course we fought we wounded each other twice and then the others stopped the second affair was just as absurd except that i got the best of it and i sliced the man's sword arm so deeply that he was on the sick list for two months the result of an accident as the surgeon put down so although i didn't say but that there is much better class of men in the third than there was in my regiment i should not be in any hurry to join if there is a row you will see ten times as much as an aide-de-camp as you would in your regiment while during peacetime there is no comparison at all between our lives as aide-de-camps and that of regimental officers i fancy you have rather a treasure in the man they have told off to you he was the colonel's servant at one time but he got drunk one day and of course the colonel had to send him back to the ranks one of the officers told me about him when he came in and said that he was one of the best riders and swordsmen in the regiment the adjutant told me that he has specially chosen him for you because he had a particularly good mount and that as your orderly it would be of great importance that he should be able to keep up with you of course he got the horse when he was the colonel's orderly and though he was sent back to the ranks six months ago the colonel who was really fond of the man allowed him to keep it i thought it seemed an uncommonly good animal when he led it into the stable fergus said plenty of bone and splendid quarters i hope he is not unwilling to come to me it is a great fall from being a colonel's servant to becoming a cornet's i don't suppose he will mind that and at any rate while he is here the birth will be such an easy one that i have no doubt he will be well content with it and i dare say that he and donald will get on well together donald is a cuirassier after keith appointed me as one of his aides he got me transferred to the cuirassiers who are stationed at potsdam that was how i came to get hold of donald as a servant a few minutes after they had done dinner there was a knock at the door the orderly entered and saluted you will find my man in there lindsay said at present mr drummond and i are living together i dare say you and he will get on very comfortably for the next fortnight fergus spent the whole day in barracks he was not put through the usual preliminary work 
but the colonel understanding what would be most useful to him had him instructed in the words of command necessary for carrying out simple movements his place as cornet with a troop when in line or column and being quick intelligent and anxious to learn fergus soon began to feel himself at home end of chapter two chapter three of with frederick the great a story of the seven years war by g a henty this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. the outbreak of war as lindsay had predicted the marshal had on the evening of the day fergus joined his regiment said to him i generally have half an hour's fencing the first thing of a morning fergus it is good exercise and keeps one's muscles listen come round to my room at six i should like to see what the instructors at home have done for you and i may be able to put you up to a few tricks of the sword that may be of use to you if you are ever called upon to break his majesty's edicts against dueling fergus of course kept the appointment very good very good indeed the marshal said after the first rally you have made the most of your opportunities your wrist is strong and supple your eye quick you are a match now for most men who have not worked hard in the school of arms like almost all our countrymen you lack precision now let us try again for a few minutes fergus exerted himself to the utmost but failed to get his point past the marshal's guard he had never seen fencing like this keith's point seemed to be ever threatening him the circles that were described were so small that the blade seemed scarcely to move and yet every thrust was put aside by a slight movement of the wrist and he felt that he was at his opponent's mercy for the whole time presently there was a slight jerk and on the instant his weapon was twisted from his hand and sent flying across the room keith smiled at his look of bewilderment you see you have much to learn fergus i have indeed sir i thought that i knew something about fencing but i see that i know nothing at all that is going too far the other way lad you know for example a vast deal more than lindsay did when he came to me six months ago i fancy you know more than he does now or ever will know for he still pins his faith on the utility of a slashing blow as if the sabre had a chance against a rapier in the hands of a skilful man however i will give you a lesson every morning and i should advise you to go to van bruff every evening i will give you a note to him he is by far the best master we have indeed he is the best in europe i will tell him that the time at your disposal is too short for you to attempt to become a thorough swordsman but that you wish to devote yourself to learning a few thrusts and parries such as will be useful in a duel thoroughly and perfectly i myself will teach you that trick i played on you just now and two others like it and i think it possible that in a short time you will be able to hold your own even against men who may know a good deal more of the principles and the general practice of the art than yourself armed with a note from the marshal fergus went the next day to the famous professor the latter read the letter through carefully and then said i should be very glad to oblige the marshal for whom i have the highest respect and whom i regard as the best swordsman in europe i often practice with him and always come away having learned something moreover the terms he offers for me to give you an hour and a half instruction every evening are more than liberal but every moment of my time in the evening is occupied from five to ten. Could you come at that hour? Certainly I could, Professor. Then so be it. Come at ten, punctually. My school is closed at that hour, and you will find me ready for you. Accordingly, during the next three weeks, Fergus worked from ten till half past eleven with Herr Van Bruff, and from six till half past with the Marshal. His mountain training was useful indeed to him now, for the day's work 
in the barrack was in itself hard and fatiguing and tough as his muscles were his wrist at first ached at nights that he had to hold it for some time under a tap of cold water to allay the pain at the end of a week however it hardened again and he was sustained by the commendations of his two teachers and the satisfaction he felt in the skill he was acquiring where is your new aide-de-camp marshal the king asked one evening it was the close of one of his receptions as a rule these young fellows are fond of showing off in their uniform at first he is better employed sire he has the makings of a very fine swordsman and having some reputation myself that way i should be glad that my young cousin should be able to hold his own well when we get to blows with the enemy so i and van bruff have taken him in hand and for the last three weeks he has made such progress that this morning when we had open play it put me on my mettle to hold my own so what with that and his regimental work his hands are more than full and indeed he could not get through it had he to attend here in the evening and i know that as soon as he has finished his supper he turns in for a sound sleep till he is woke in time to dress and get to the fencing school at ten had there been a longer time to spare i would not have suffered him to work so hard but seeing that in a few days we may be on the march to the frontier we have to make the most of the time he has done well keith and his zeal shows that he will make a good soldier yes another three days and our messenger should return from vienna and the next morning unless the reply is satisfactory the troops will be on the move after that who knows during the last few days the vague rumors that had been circulating had gained strength and consistency every day fresh regiments arrived and encamped near the city and there were reports that a great concentration of troops were taking place at halley under the command of prince ferdinand of brunswick and another under the duke of brevern at frankfurt on the oder nevertheless the public announcement that war was declared with austria and that the army would march for the frontier in three days time came as a sudden shock the proclamation stated that it having been discovered that austria had entered into the secret confederacy with other powers to attack prussia and the king having after long and fruitless negotiations try to obtain satisfaction from that power no resource remained but to declare war at once before the confederates could combine their forces for the destruction of the kingdom something like dismay was at first excited by the proclamation a war with austria was in itself a serious undertaking but if the latter had the powerful allies such as russia france and saxony and it was well known that all three looked with jealousy on the growing power of the kingdom, the position seemed well nigh desperate. Among the troops, however, the news was received with enthusiasm. Confident in their strength and discipline, the question of the odds that might be assembled against them in no way troubled them. The conquest of Silesia had raised the prestige of the army, and the troops felt proud that they should have the opportunity of proving their valor in an even more serious struggle never was there a more brilliant assembly than that at the palace the evening before the troops marched all the general officers and their staffs were assembled together with the ladies of the courts and those of the nobility and army the king was in high good humor and moved about the rooms chatting freely with all so you have come to see us at last young sir he said to fergus i should scold you but i hear that you have been utilizing your time well remember that your sword is to be used against the enemies of the country only and nodding he walked on the princess amelia was the centre of a group of ladies she was a charming princess but at times her face bore an expression of deep melancholy and all knew that she had never ceased to mourn the fate of the man she would have chosen baron trench who had been thrown into prison by her angry father for his insolence in aspiring to his daughter's hand. 
you must be glad that your hard work is over drummond lindsay said as they stood together watching the scene i am glad that the drill is over fergus replied but i should have liked my work with the professor to have gone on for another six months ah well you will have opportunities to take it up again when we return after thrashing the austrians how long will that be lindsay the latter shrugged his shoulders six months six years who can tell he said if it be true that russia and france to say nothing of saxony are with her it is more likely to be years than months and we may both come out colonels by the time it is over that is if we come out at all fergus said with a smile at the other's confidence oh of course there is that contingency but it is one never worth reckoning with at any rate it is pretty certain that if we do fall it will be with odds against us but of course as aides de camp our chance is a good deal better than that of regimental officers at any rate we have had good preparation for the campaign for your work will be child's play in comparison to what you have been going through how you stood it i cannot make out i worked pretty hard when i first arrived but the drill for the first six months was tremendous and i used to be glad to crawl into bed as soon as i had my supper well you have been a poor companion so far drummond i'm afraid i have been and but will try and make up for it in the future i suppose there is no doubt that we shall march in the first place on dresden i think that there is no doubt of that there is no saxon army to speak of certainly nothing that can offer any serious opposition from there there are three or four passes by which we can pour into bohemia saxony is a rich country too and will afford us a fine base for supplies as we move on i suppose the austrians will collect an army to oppose us in bohemia when we have thrashed them i expect we shall go on straight to vienna fergus laughed it all sounds easy enough lindsay i only hope that it will come off just as you prophesize that is one advantage of fighting in a foreign service fergus one fights just as stoutly for victory as if one were fighting for home but if one is beaten it does not affect one so much it is sad to see the country overrun and pillaged but the houses are not the houses of our own people the people massacred are not one's own relations and friends one's military vanity may be hurt by defeat otherwise one can bear it philosophically i never looked at it in that light before lindsay but no doubt there is a great deal in what you say if my father had fallen on a german battlefield instead of at culloden our estates would not have been confiscated our glens harried and our clansmen hunted down and massacred no i see there is a great difference i suppose i should fight just as hard against the austrians as i should have done against the english at culloden had i been there but defeat would have none of the same consequences no putting it as you do i must own that there is a distinct advantage in foreign service that i never appreciated before but i see people are leaving and i am not sorry as we are going to be up before daybreak the sooner one turns in the better Carl had received the order to call his master at three to have breakfast ready at half past and the horses at the door at four with somewhat less than his usual stolidity you will have hard work in the future Carl fergus said i shall be glad of it sir never have i had such a lazy time as i have had for the last month the first three or four days were very pleasant then i began to think that i should like a little to do so as to remind me that there was such a thing as work but the last fortnight has been terrible a man cannot sleep for twenty-four hours and if it had not been that donald and i have had an occasional quarrel as to our respective regiments and over the native land he is so proud of bragging about i should have been ready to hang myself ah sir how often have i to thank my stars that i did not take my discharge which i could have asked for as i have served my time i had thought of it many times 
and have said to myself how delightful it would be to hear the morning call sound at a barracks near and to turn over in my bed and go to sleep again to have no guard to keep no sergeant to bully or provost guard to arrest one if one has taken a cup too much this fortnight has shown me the folly of such ideas it has taught me when i am well off then what misery it is to be one's own master and to be always wondering how the day is to be got through well you are not likely to have to complain that you have nothing to do for some time now carl no cornet i have felt a new man since i heard the great news there is always plenty to do on a campaign there are the horses to be cleaned food to be cooked forage and rations to be fetched then too on a campaign every one is merry and good-tempered and one sings as one marches and sits round the campfire one may be cold and wet and hungry but who cares one swears at the moment, but one laughs again as soon as the sun shines. Well, Carl, you had best turn in at once, for at three o'clock we shall want to be called. You can rely upon my waking, sir. Does my officer wish to take a full dress suit with him? No, the order is that all are to start in marching order, and that all baggage is to be cut down to the smallest proportions. No officer is to take more than can be carried in his valises. It was the first week in August when the three columns, each 20,000 strong, moved from their respective starting points. Although the king was nominally in command of the central division, Marshal Keith was the real commander. He rode with the king at the head of the column, and his aides de camp, and those of Frederick, were constantly on their way up and down the line, carrying orders and bringing in reports as to the manner in which the regiments maintained their respective position, and especially how the artillery and baggage train kept up. There was no necessity at present for taking precautions. The march would, for some days, lead through Prussia, and it was morally certain that the Saxon army, which was small and scattered, and even if united, would not equal the strength of one of the Prussian armies, would not attempt any serious resistance, for the country was flat, and there would be no defiles where a small force of men could successfully oppose a larger one. Nevertheless, the daily marches were long for the infantry and the baggage, but by no means fatiguing for mounted men. The staff and aides de camp with their orderlies rode behind the leaders. The troopers were sometimes employed instead of the officers when a short written order had to be sent back to the rear of the column. The harvest having been gathered in, the cavalry rode across the open country, thus reducing the length of the column. The day was very hot, and the infantry opened their ranks as much as possible to allow the passage of what little air was moving. At nine o'clock the troops were halted. Each man had been served with a breakfast before starting, and the haversacks were now opened, and a meal made of the bread they contained, washed down with an allowance of rough wine, carried in each regimental wagon. Then the men sat down under the shade of greatcoats supported by ramrods and other contrivances, and either slept or talked until half-past two, when the bugle sounded. The great coats were rolled up and strapped on to the knapsacks. Then there was a rigorous use of the brush to remove the thick dust gathered on the march. At three, the column got into motion again and halted for the night at half past six. When fires were lighted, coppers put on, and the main meal of the day presently served. The rations of the officers were the same as those of the men but the greater part of them supplemented the food by that carried in their orderly saddlebags. Lindsay, Fergus, and the marshal's other two aide-de-camps had arranged that, where possible, they should mess together and their servants should prepare the meal by turns, while those not so engaged looked after the horses, saw that they were fed, watered, and groomed. The servants were all old campaigners, and though neither Lindsay nor Fergus had thought of giving them orders to that effect, both Donald and Carl had laid in a stock of provisions. 
Donald had cooked a pair of fowls on the previous evening. Carl had brought a suckling pig. One of the German officer's servants had a huge piece of salt beef that had already been boiled, while the other had a hare. It was agreed at once that the fowls should be left for early breakfast and the beef put aside for dinner. And for supper also, if nothing else could be obtained, Carl, as the servant of the junior officer, was cook for the evening, and he acquitted himself admirably. Each officer carried in his saddlebag a tin plate, drinking horn, and a knife, fork, and spoon. There was no dish, but the spit was handed around, and each cut off a portion. Soup made from the ration of meat was first served, then the hare, then the suckling pig, while the four orderlies had an ample meal from the ration of meat. A supply of spirits had been carried in the staff wagon. This they took, plentifully watered with the meal, with a stronger cup afterwards. The night was so fine that all agreed that it was not worth while to erect the tent carried for them in the wagon. At eight o'clock the order for the next day's march came out, and two of the king's orderlies started on horseback with copies of it to the commanders of brigades, who in their turn communicated to the colonels of their respective regiments. The next evening the force encamped round Torgau, a very strong fortress where a great store of provisions had been collected. Ample quarters were assigned to the marshal and his staff in the town. Here they halted for a day to allow the other armies, which had both farther to march, to keep abreast of them on their respective lines of route. Then, following the Elbe, the army arrived after two marches in front of Dresden. The court of Saxony had, for years, been wasting the revenues of the country in extravagance and luxury, while intriguing incessantly with Austria and dreaming of obtaining an increase of territory at the expense of Prussia. No effort had been made to prepare to carry out the engagements entered into with Austria and the army. Utterly neglected, numbered but some 15,000. These were scattered over the country and but poorly provided with artillery. When then the news arrived that three Prussian armies had crossed the frontier, there was no thought of resistance, but orders were dispatched for the whole force to concentrate at Pima a strongly fortified camp among the defiles of the mountains separating saxony from bohemia the position was almost an impregnable one and they could receive reinforcements from bohemia on the arrival of the prussian army the king fled and dresden threw open its gates as frederick hoped to detach saxony from the alliance against him the greater portion of the army were encamped outside the town, three or four regiments only, marching in and quartering themselves in the empty Saxon barracks. The aid Saxony could render Frederick would be insignificant, but it was most desirable for him that he should ensure its neutrality in order to secure his communications with Prussia when he marched forward into Bohemia. Finding the king had gone, his first step was to send a general officer with a party of soldiers to seize the archives in the palace. Among these was discovered the prize he most desired to find, namely a signed copy of the secret treaty between Austria, Russia, France, and Saxony for the evasion and partition of Prussia. Copies of this document were instantly sent off to the courts of Europe, thus affording an ample justification for what would otherwise have appeared a wholly unprovoked attack by Prussia upon her neighbors. Had it not been for the discovery of this document, Frederick would probably have always remained under the stigma of engaging in an unprovoked and ambitious war, for the court of Austria had hitherto positively and categorically declared to Frederick's ambassador and envoys the non-existence of any such treaty or agreement between the powers. As the queen had remained in the palace, Frederick took up his abode in another royal building, Marshal Keith and a large number of officers being also quartered there. 
in order to prevent any broils with the citizens orders were issued that certain places of refreshments were to be used only by officers while the soldiers were only to frequent wine and beer shops selected in the neighborhood of the barracks and were strictly forbidden to enter any others any soldier caught in an act of theft or pillage was to be hung forthwith and all were enjoined to observe a friendly demeanor to the people one evening fergus had been sent with a message to the camp two miles from the town it was nearly ten o'clock when he started to ride back when within half a mile of the town he heard a pistol shot in the direction of a large house a quarter of a mile from the road without hesitation he turned his horse's head in that direction in a couple of minutes he arrived at a pair of large gates they were closed but he dismounted fastened the bridle chain to them and snatching the pistols from his holster ran along by the side of a high wall until he came to a tree growing close to it with some difficulty for his high boots were ill adapted for such work he climbed the tree got on to the wall and dropped down he was in a large park-like grounds guided by a light in a window he ran to the house the door was closed after hesitating for a moment he ran along and soon coming as he expected to an open window he had once climbed through it a door was opened and passing on he entered a large hall in which a light was burning pausing to listen now he heard voices upstairs and holding a pistol in each hand and his drawn sword in his teeth he lightly ascended the stairs on the landing two men lay dead light was issuing from a half-closed door and noiselessly approaching it he looked in it was a small room at the end stood eight or ten scared women huddled together while a soldier with a pistol in one hand and a sword in the other stood sentry over them these were evidently the servants of the chateau who had been unceremoniously hauled from their beds and gathered there under a guard to prevent them from screaming or giving any alarm as fergus was equally anxious that no alarm should be given at present he retired quietly a pair of double doors faced the top of the staircase this was evidently the grand reception room and listening intently he could hear a murmur of voices inside turning the handle and throwing them suddenly open he entered upon the floor lay the body of a gentleman a lady pale as death and in a half fainting condition leaned back in a settee while a girl of thirteen or fourteen lay on a couch with bound hands and a handkerchief fastened across her mouth three soldiers were engaged in examining the contents of a large coffer of jewels as the doors opened they turned around and on seeing a solitary officer sprang forward with terrible odds fergus shot one of them as they did so dropped the pistol seized his sword both men fired fergus felt a stinging sensation in his left arm and then the pistol held in that hand dropped to the ground confident in his swordmanship he awaited the onslaught of the two marauders the swords clashed and at the second pass one of them fell back run through the body the other shouting for aid stood on the defensive fergus heard the rush of heavy steps coming down the staircase and just as three other men rushed into the room he almost clove his opponent's head and toe with a tremendous blow from his claymore two of the newcomers fired their pistols hastily both missed then rushed at him with their swords and as he was hotly engaged with them the third who was the sentry who had been placed over the women advanced slowly with his pistol pointed with the intention of making sure of his aim he paused close to the combatants waiting for an opportunity to fire between the shifting figures of his comrades when a white figure after peering in at the door ran swiftly forward and threw herself on his back hurling him forward to the ground, his pistol exploding as he fell. One of the others started back at the sound, and as he did so, Fergus ran him through the body. He then attacked his remaining opponent, and after a few passes, laid him dead beside his comrade. Picking up his own fallen pistol, 
Fergus blew out the brains of the soldier who was struggling to free himself from the girl's weight and then helped her to her feet. Well done, my brave girl, she, he said. You have saved my life. Now run and tell those wretches to stop screaming and come and help their mistress. These scoundrels are all killed and there is nothing more for them to be alarmed at. Then he ran to the girl on a sofa, cut her cords with a dagger and freed her from the gag. As he did so, she leaped up and ran to her mother's side, while Fergus, kneeling by the gentleman who had fallen before he had entered, turned him over and, laying his ear over his heart, listened intently. He is alive, he said. His heart beats, but faintly. Tell the men to fetch some cordial. The women were coming in now, some crying hysterically, some shrieking afresh at the sight of the bodies that were strewn about the room. Silence, Fergus shouted sternly. Now, while one runs to fetch some cordial, do three others come here and aid me to lift your master gently on to the couch. The maid who had overthrown the soldier at once came forward to his assistance. Now, Trucan and Lisa, the young girl said, stamping her foot, come at once. Do you, Caroline, run and fetch the stand of cordials from the dining room? The two women approached timidly. Now, Fergus said, get your arm under his shoulders on your side, and I will do the same. One of you others support his head when we lift, the other take his feet. So gently he was raised and laid on the couch. By the time this was done, the women returned with a bottle of spirits. Now, he said, water and glass. The young girl ran and fetched a carafe of water and a tumbler. Standing on a table by the wall, her hands shook as she handed it to Fergus. Are you sure that he is not dead, sir? She asked in a hushed voice. Quite sure. I fear that he is grievously wounded, but he certainly lives. Now get another glass and put some spirits in it and fill it up with water and make your mother drink it. As soon as you have roused her from her faint. Fergus now gave all his attention to the wounded man poured two or three spoonfuls of strong spirits and water between his lips, and then proceeded to examine his wounds. He had three. One was a very severe cut upon the shoulder. His left arm had been broken by a pistol bullet, and he had a dangerous sword thrust in the body. Under Fergus's direction, the servant had cut off the doublet, and, after pouring some more spirits down the wounded man's throat, he bade one of the other women fetch him some soft linen and a sheet. When these arrived, he made a pad of the linen and bound it over the wounded man's shoulder with some strips torn from the sheet. Then he sent for some straight strips of wood, cut them to the right length, wrapped some linen round them, and straightening the arm, applied them to it, and with the assistance of the girl, bandaged it firmly. Then he placed a pad of linen over the wound in the body and passed bandages round and round. Well done, he said to his assistant. You are a stout girl and a brave one. Then he turned to the others who were crowded round their mistress. Stand back, he said, and throw open the window and let the air come to her. This will do. The young lady and this girl will be enough. Now, do the rest of you run off and get some clothes on. She has opened her eyes once, sir. She will come round directly, young lady. Pour a spoonful or two from the glass between her lips. It is stronger than that you have in your hand. She has had a terrible shock, but as soon as she hears that your father is alive, will do more for her than all our services. Will he live, sir? That I cannot say for certain, but I have great hopes that he will do so. However, I will send the surgeon out as soon as I get to the city. The lady was longer in a swoon than Fergus had expected, and the servants had returned before she opened her eyes. Now, he said, the four of you lend me your assistance. It would be well to carry this sofa with your master into the next room, and then we will take your mistress in there too, so that she will be spared seeing these ruffians scattered about when she comes to herself. The doors leading to the adjoining apartment were opened, candles lighted there, and the wounded man carried in on his sofa. And now for your mistress. It would be easier to lift her out of the chair and carry her in bodily. 
this he did with the assistance of two of the servants now he said to the young girl do you stay by her my brave maid i think she will recover in a minute or two her eyelids moved as i brought her in i will look round and see about things were these the only two men in the house he asked the other women as he joined them on the landing no sir there were six men the other four have gone to bed but the two outside always waited up till the count and countess retired where are their rooms he asked taking a candle one of the women led him upstairs as he expected he found the four men lying dead one had apparently leaped up as the door was open and the other three had been killed in their beds where can i get help from there are the men at the stables it is at the back of the house three or four hundred yards away well take one of your other women with you and go and rouse them tell them to dress and come here at once he now went down to the gate undid the fastenings and then led his horse up to the house in a few minutes the stablemen arrived he ordered them to carry the bodies of the six marauders out and lay them in the front of the house when they had done so they were to take those of the servants and place them in an outhouse then he went upstairs again the countess has recovered sir one of the women said tell her that i will send one of the army surgeons down at once but first bandage my arm it is but a flesh room i know but i am feeling faint and am sure that it is keeping on bleeding here my girl he said to the one who had before assisted i can trust to you not to faint with her assistance he took off his coat the arm of which was saturated with blood. You had better cut off the sleeve of the shirt, he said. This was done, and the nature of the wound was seen. A ball had ploughed through the flesh three inches below the shoulder, inflicting a gaping but not serious wound. It is lucky that it was not the inside of the arm, he said to the girl, as she bandaged it up. For well, had it been, I should have bled to death in a very few minutes had the count opened his eyes yet no sir he is lying just as he was what is the gentleman's name count eulen first you had better give me a draught of wine before i start i feel shaken and it is possible that writing may set my wound bleeding again having drunk a goblet of wine fergus went down and mounted his horse as he did so he said to one of the men take a lantern and go down to the spot where the road hither turns off from the main road surgeon will be here in half an hour or perhaps twenty minutes he will be on the lookout for you and your lantern events had passed quickly and the church bell chimed a quarter to eleven and he rode through the streets of dresden in three minutes he drew up at the entrance to the royal quarters as he dismounted carl came out keep the horse here carl he said it may be wanted in a minute or two again are you hurt sir the man asked as he dismounted for he saw his face by the light of the torches on each side of the gateway. It is only a flesh wound and of no consequences, but I have lost a good deal of blood. He made his way up the staircase to the marshal's quarter. He was feeling dizzy and faint now. Is the marshal in his room, he asked. He is in, sir, but I would speak to him immediately. Tis a most urgent matter. The surgeon went in. A moment later, held the door open and said, Will you enter, sir? Fergus entered and made the usual formal salute to the marshal. Two or three other officers were in the room, but he did not heed who they were, nor hear the exclamations of surprise that broke out at his appearance. I beg to report, sir, that the house of the Count Eulenfurst had been attacked by marauders, belonging to one of the Pomeranian regiments. The Count is desperately wounded, and I pray that a surgeon may be sent instantly to his aid. The house stands back from the road, about half a mile from the north gate. A man with a lantern will be standing in the road to guide him to it. My horse is at the door below, in readiness to take him. I pray you to allow me to retire. He swayed and would have fallen, had not the marshal and one of the others present caught him and laid him down on a couch. He is wounded, marshal, the other officer said. This sleeve is saturated with blood. The marshal raised his voice and called it attended run to the quarters of staff surgeon schmidt and ask him to come here immediately and to bring another of his staff with him if there is one in 
In two minutes, the king's chief surgeon entered, followed by another of his staff. First look to the wound of Cornet Drummond, the marshal said. It is in the arm, and I trust that he has only fainted from loss of blood. The surgeons examined the wound. It is in no way serious, Marshal. As you say, he has fainted from loss of blood. He must have neglected it for some time. Had it been bandaged at once, it would only have the consequence of disabling his arm for a fortnight or so. The assistant had already hurried away to get lint and bandages. Another voice now spoke. Surgeon Schmidt, you will please at once mount Mr. Drummond's horse, which is standing at the door. Ride out through the north gate, where you have gone about half a mile, you will see a man with a lantern. He will lead you to the house of Count Eulen first, who has been grievously wounded by some marauders. Surgeon Morfin will follow you as soon as he has bandaged Mr. Drummond's wound. There may be more wounded there who may need your care. Major Armfelt, will you order a horse to be brought round at once for the surgeon? Then hurry to the barracks order the colonel to turn out a troop of horse instantly and let him scour the country between the north gate and the camp and arrest every straggler he comes across end of chapter three chapter four of with frederick the great a story of the seven years war by g a henty this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. promotion as soon as the bandage was applied and a flow of blood ceased a few spoonfuls of wine were poured down the patient's throat it was not long before he opened his eyes and struggled into a sitting position i beg pardon sir he said faintly as his eyes fell on the marshal, who was standing just in front of him. I am sorry that I came into your apartments in this state, but it seemed to me you did quite right, sir, said a sharp voice that he at once recognized, while the speaker put his hand upon his shoulder to prevent him from trying to rise. You are quite right to bring the news here at once of this outrage, which, by heaven, shall be punished as it deserves. Now drink a cup of wine, and then perhaps you will be able to tell us a little more about it. Now, don't be in a hurry, but obey my orders. Fergus drank off the wine, then, after waiting a minute or two, said, Count Eulenfurst is solely wounded, sire, but I cannot say whether mortally or not. When I came away, he was still lying insensible. His wife and daughter are happily uninjured. Was anyone else hurt? Yes, sire, the six men-servants who were sleeping in the house were all killed, four in their beds, two while hastening from below to assist their master. The king gave an exclamation of fury. You said these men belonged to a Pomeranian regiment? Had they left before you got there? But I suppose not, or else you would not have been wounded. How was it that you heard of the attack? I had carried a dispatch from the marshal to the camp, sire, and was on my way back when I heard a pistol shot. The sound was faint, for it came from a house a quarter of a mile away, and was fired indoors. But the night was still, and fortunately some of the windows were open. Thinking that some evil work was being done, I rode straight for it, climbed the wall, and, making my way on foot to the house, happily arrived in time. You saw the fellows, then? How was it that they suffered you to escape with your life? They must have known that your evidence would hang them all. There were but six of them, sir, and they will need no hanging, for they are all disposed of. Though had it not been for the assistance of a brave servant maid, who had threw herself upon the back of one of them, my career would certainly have been terminated. But who had you with you to help you? the king asked. I had no one but the maid, sire. Do you mean to say, Mr. Drummond, that with your own hand you slew the whole of six villains? That was so, sire, but in respect to the one thrown down by the girl, I had but to blow out his brains before he could gain his feet. Can you give us the particulars, the king asked quietly. If you do not feel equal to it, we will wait 
till morning. I can tell you now, sire, I am feeling better and stronger. And he related the incident of the fight. One with his pistol, Keith, the king said, four with his sword, after his last hand was disabled, to say nothing of the six. This is not a bad beginning for an aide de camp, gentlemen. No, indeed, sire, it is most gallant deed, though it was well for him that he was able to dispose of the first three before the others appeared on the scene. It was a most gallant action, indeed, the king repeated, and a hearty assent was given by the general officers standing round. I congratulate you on your aide de camp, Keith, he went on, a man capable of killing single-handed six of my Pomeranians is a treasure. Do you see that his commission as lieutenant is given me tomorrow to sign? No, sit still, young sir. It is I who have to thank you for so promptly punishing those marauders who would have brought disgrace upon my army, and not you who have to thank me. Now, be off to your bed. Two of the attendants are called in, and these assisted Fergus, who was almost too weak to stand, to the apartment that he shared with Lindsay. Keith himself accompanied them. Lindsay leaped out of bed as they entered. Don't ask any questions, Lindsay, the marshal said. Drummond has performed a very gallant action and has been wounded and, as you see, can scarcely stand from the loss of blood. He will be asleep as soon as he lies down. You will hear all about it in the morning. The marshal then returned to his apartment. The king was on the point of leaving. I have left orders, he said, that as soon as either of the surgeons returns, I am to be awakened and informed of the state of Count Ellen first. He is a noble man of distinction and character, though I believe in no great favor at the court here since he resigned his seat on the council, because he disapproved of the resources of the state being wasted in extravagance, instead of being spent in maintaining the army in proper condition. Should he die, it would cause an extremely bad impression throughout Saxony. At daybreak the next morning, finding that the surgeons had not returned, Keith dispatched an officer to request them to furnish him at once with a written record of the state of the Count. He returned in three quarters of an hour, saying that the Count had just recovered consciousness, that two of his wounds were serious and the other very grave but that having probed it, they were of opinion that it might not prove fatal. The countess was completely prostrated, and had gone from one fainting fit into another, and required more attention than her husband. The rest of the household was uninjured. Lindsay got up quietly and dressed without awakening Fergus. He was disappointed at a dispatch being at once handed to him to carry to the Prince of Brunswick's army, which was ten miles away, and was therefore obliged to mount and ride off, without obtaining any news whatever as to the nature of Roman's adventure. As he passed through the camp of the Pomerians, he saw the bodies of six soldiers swinging from the bough of a tree close to the camp. He rode a little out of his way to discover the cause of this strange spectacle. In front of them was erected a large plaque out of canvas with the words painted on it. Marauders killed in the commission of crime and their bodies hung by order of the king as a lesson to anyone who ventures to break the law against plundering. Then he rode on his way and did not return until one o'clock. The marshal was occupied. He therefore simply handed in the reply to the dispatch that he had carried and immediately retired. Is Mr. Drummond up? He asked one of the attendants. He is still in his room, sir. His servant is with him and he is taking food. He went straight to the room. Fergus was sitting up in a chair eating a basin of strong chicken broth. This is a nice hour to be breakfasting, Lindsay, he said with a smile. I feel quite ashamed of myself, I can tell you, but I am under orders. The doctor came here half an hour ago. I had just woke and got out of bed. I was going to dress when he told me I was not to do so. I might sit up to take breakfast, but was to keep perfectly quiet for the rest of the day. He said I only needed feeding up that he would send me some strong broth, and three hours later I was to have some soup and a pint of burgundy, 
and that if I obeyed his instructions and ate and drank well, I should be able to leave my room tomorrow, though, of course, I should not be fit for active service till my arm begins to heal. But what is it all about, Drummond? I was sent off to Brunswick's camp as soon as I got up, and I've heard nothing about it, and the marshal forbade me to speak to you when you were brought in last night. He merely said that you had done a very gallant action. There was nothing very gallant in it, Lindsay, but it turned out very fortunate. Then he gave a brief account of the previous evening's events. Well, I should call that a gallant action, Drummond, if you don't. It is no joke for one man to tackle six, and those not ordinary marauders, but Pomeranian soldiers. Of course, it was somewhat lucky that you had rid yourself of three of them before the other three entered the room and had it not been as you say for the girl things might have turned out differently still that does not affect the matter it was a gallant business what happened when you came in i don't know much about what happened at first i made some sort of report to the marshal and then i believe i fainted when i came to i found that they had bandaged up my shoulder and poured some wine down my throat I felt very shaky at first, but I know that I drank some wine and was then able to give some sort of an account of what had happened. The king was there then and asked me questions, but whether or not he was there at first, I cannot say. I have a vague idea that he told the marshal, too, that he promoted me, but I am not quite sure about that, nor do I know how I got here. Well, if you are not mistaken about your step, I congratulate you most heartily. It is seldom indeed that anyone gains one in six weeks after his first appointment. I thought myself lucky indeed in getting it after serving only two years and a half, but I got it simply on nomination as one of the marshal's aide de camp. It is customary to get promotion on such appointment. If there has been two or three years previous service, well, you have drawn the first blood in this campaign, Drummond, and have not been long in giving very striking proof that your month's hard work in the fencing school has not been thrown away. The conversation was broken off by the entry of the marshal himself. Pooh, pooh, Fergus, he said as the letter arose. There is no occasion for saluting in a bedroom. I am glad to see you looking so much better. You could not have looked more ghastly when you came in yesterday evening, if you had been your own wrath. There, lad, he said, handing him a parchment. It is not usual to have a new commission on promotion. But the king told me that he had had it done in the present case in order that you might have a record of the exploit for which you had been promoted. You will see it is set down inside that. Although but six weeks in service, you were promoted to the rank of lieutenant for a deed of extraordinary gallantry. You had attacked and killed, with your own hand, six marauding soldiers who had entered the chateau of Count Ellenfurst, well-nigh murdered the Count, killed six of his servants, and were occupied in plundering the house. In token of his thankfulness that the life of so distinguished and enlightened a nobleman had been saved by you as well as of approbation for the gallantry of your conduct, his majesty promoted you to the rank of lieutenant. You should keep the papers, Fergus, and pass it down to your descendants as an heirloom. I congratulate you, my boy, with all my heart, feel some satisfaction on my own account, for such an action as this shows those who are inclined to grumble that what they may consider the favor shown the, to Scotchmen that at any rate the favor is not misplaced. A general order to the army has been issued this morning saying that some scoundrels, having disgraced their uniform and brought discredit upon the army by a murderous and wicked attack upon the house of Count Eulenfurst, the king reiterates and confirms his previous order that any man caught when engaged in pillaging or upon whose person any stolen goods are fined will be summarily hung by the provost marshal or by any general officer before whom he may be brought the king himself has ridden to the court's chateau this morning to make 
a personal inquiry into his state and to express his deep regret at the outrage that has taken place it is a politic action as well as a kind one of course the event has occasioned great excitement in the city and may i ask how the count is going on sir the last report of the surgeons is a favorable one he has partly recovered consciousness and at any rate recognizes his daughter who has divided her time between his bedside and her mother's the latter has fallen into a deep sleep of exhaustion but will i doubt not recover the girl came down into the hall when the king called she bore herself well they tell me it would have retained a composure had it not been for the king himself she came down the grand staircase with four of her maids before her for a notice had been sent half an hour before of his coming prepared no doubt to meet a stiff and haughty king but though frederick can be every inch a king when he chooses there is as you know no kinder-hearted man alive he went forward bareheaded to meet her and as she stopped and curtsied low he took her two hands and said my poor child i am sorry more sorry than i can tell you for what has happened and hope with all my heart that your father whom all respect and honor will not be taken from you no doubt you look upon me as an enemy but although compelled to come here because your king is leagued with those who intend to destroy me and my country i bear no ill will to the people and have given the strictest orders that my soldiers shall in all respects treat them as firm friends but unfortunately there are scoundrels everywhere these men have been punished as they deserved and the whole army will join with me in deep regret of what has happened and in the fervent hope that your father's life will be spared i grieve too to hear that the countess your mother has suffered so greatly from the shock and hope as soon to be able to express to her in person the regret i feel for what has taken place the kindness of his tone in saying all this broke her down more than the words of the king he saw that she was unable to speak there there child he said i know what you are feeling and that you are longing to go upstairs again so i will say good-bye keep up a brave heart the surgeon has every hope that your father will recover and believe that you will always have a friend in frederick of prussia he kissed her on the cheek and then turned and left the hall followed by his staff three days later the doctors were able to say confidently that unless some changes occurred for the worse they believed the count would recover three days later the doctors were able to say confidently that unless some changes occurred for the worse they believed the count would recover on the fourth day fergus was sufficiently well to mount his horse the countess and her daughter had repeatedly asked after him and expressed their desire that he would come over as soon as he was well enough to do so one of the aides de camp had gone over twice a day to inquire as to the progress the count was making a guard had been placed at the gate and an officer stationed there to receive the names of the stream of visitors from the city and to inform them that the count was making satisfactory progress by the doctor's orders even the count's most intimate friends were refused admission as absolute quiet was needed fergus dismounted at the gate walked up to the house the maid who opened the door recognized him at once will you come in sir she said with a baby face i will tell the young countess you are here and she will i am sure see you a minute later the girl ran down the stairs as she came forward she stopped with sudden shyness absorbed in her anxiety for her father and mother she had taken but little heed of the appearance of the officer who had saved them that he was kind as well as brave she was sure for although he had scarce spoken to her the gentleness with which he had moved her father and her mother from the blood-stained room and the promptness and decision with which he had given his orders had inspired her with absolute confidence in him 
She had a vague idea that he was young, but his face, flecked here and there with blood, had left but a faint impression upon her memory, and when she saw the young officer in his spotless and imposing uniform, she almost felt that there must be some mistake. Are you Lieutenant Drummond, sir? she asked timidly. I am, Countess. Was it really you who saved us the other night? I had that good fortune, he said with a smile. She took the hand he held out wonderingly, and then suddenly burst into tears. Oh, sir, she said, is it possible that you, who look so young, be, can be the one who came to our assistance and killed those six evil men? It seems impossible. I have been so unhappy since. I did not know that you were wounded until the maids told me. Afterwards, I had never even asked. I let you go without one word of thanks for all that you have done for us. What must you have thought of me? I thought that you were a very courageous girl, Fergus said earnestly, and that after what you had gone through, the sight of your father, as you believed, dying, and your mother in such a state you were wonderfully calm and composed, it would have been strange indeed had you thought of anything else at such a time. You are good to say so, sir, but when I heard from the surgeons you sent, that you had fainted from loss of blood after delivering your message, I felt that I should never forgive myself. You had thought so much of us and not of yourself. You had gone about seeing to our comfort and giving orders and arranging everything. And all the time you yourself needed aid. The wound was a mere trifle, he said, and I scarce give it a thought myself until I began to feel faint from loss of blood. I can assure you that the thought that you were ungrateful has never once entered my head. And now, will you please come up to see my mother, sir? She will be most anxiously expecting you. They went upstairs together, and, turning to the right on the top of the stairs, entered a pretty apartment that was evidently the Countess's boudoir. This is our preserver, mother, the girl said as she entered. The Countess, who was advancing towards the door, stopped in surprise. She has been able, from her daughter, to gain no idea of the age of their rescuer. But the maids had all asserted that he was quite young, as he was, for so the surgeons had told her, one of Marshal Keek's aides de camp, she had pictured to herself a fierce soldier, and the sight of his youth with his smooth, pleasant face surprised her indeed. Yes, mother, it is himself, the girl said. I was as surprised as you are. I have no words to thank you, sir, for the most inestimable service which you have rendered us. The countess said warmly, as she held out her hand, assuredly my husband would have died had aid been delayed but a few minutes. As to my daughter and myself, they would probably have killed us to prevent our ever recognizing or giving evidence against them. They only spared our lives for a time in order to learn where our jewels were kept. This was but a comparative trifle, though the jewels are precious, and there are some more valuable in Saxony. I have no doubt that after stripping the house of its valuables, they would have buried them, intending some day to recover them, and would then have fired the house, in order to conceal all evidence of the crime that had been committed. It seemed to me wonderful before that one man should, single-handed, have attacked and slain them. But now that I see you, it seems almost a miracle that you performed in our favor. It was no great feat, madam. I have a good fortune to be a fair swordsman, and soldiers, although they may know their military drill, have little chance with one who can use his weapon well. Then, too, I have fortunately but three to deal with at a time, and even then, I should not have come off victoriously had it not been for the courage of the maid who ran boldly in, sprang on the back of one, and threw him to the ground while he was waiting to get a steady aim at me with his pistol. I assuredly owe my life to her. The King of Prussia left twenty gold crowns for her when he was here, saying that it was payment for saving the life of one of his officers, and you may be sure that we shall not be ungrateful to her. Your death would have involved that of my husband and us. The king also ordered that inquiry should be made as to whether our men who were killed had families dependent upon them, and that if so, pensions were to be given to these, as their loss had been occasioned 
by the evil deeds of some of his soldiers it was very thoughtful and kind and my daughter seems quite to have fallen in love with him i hope that in a few days my husband will be able to see you he does not know that you are here if he did i am sure he would wish to see you now but the surgeons have insisted so strongly on absolute quiet that i dare not let him hear of your coming i am delighted to learn that he is going on so well madam i sincerely trust that he will not long remain an invalid i suppose you would not have recognized me the countess asked i should not indeed of course i could do nothing to aid you and was chiefly occupied by the count but indeed you were then so pale that i might well be excused for not knowing you again the countess was a very handsome woman of some seven or eight and thirty with a noble figure and a gracious air and bore no resemblance to the almost distraught woman with her hair falling over her face whom he had seen before i am not a coward mr drummond she said and when those villains first ran in and attacked my husband i struggled desperately with the two who seized me until i saw him drop as i believed dead then my strength suddenly left me and i should have fallen to the ground had the men not thrown me back into the chair i have a vague recollection of seeing thirza who had retired for the night but a minute or two previously carried inbound and gagged they asked me several questions but i could not reply and i think they learned from the frightened servants where the family jewels were kept the clashing of swords and the firing of pistols roused me a little and after it was all over and i heard you say that my husband was still living my heart gave one bound and i knew nothing more of what happened until next day after chatting for a short time longer fergus took his leave well pleased to have got through a visit he had somewhat dreaded the king remained for nearly a month at dresden engaged in carrying on negotiations with the elector by this delay he lost most of the advantages that his sudden movement had given him but he was most anxious to detach saxony and poland from the confederacy against him as he would then be able to turn his attention wholly to austria aided by the saxons while the poles would aid his army in the east to keep the russians in check the elector of saxony who was also king of poland however was only negotiating in order to give time for austria to gather an army in bohemia and so to relieve the saxons who were watched by the eastern column which had crossed the defiles into bohemia and taken post near Koengratz, while that of prince maurice of brunswick pushed forward further to threaten their line of retreat from the west the king at last became convinced that the king of poland was but trifling with him and in the last week of september started to take command of the center which was facing the entrance to the defile at pirna marshal keith had been sent a week after fergus was wounded to assume the command of the western column hitherto commanded by prince ferdinand of brunswick Fergus remained behind for ten days, at the end of which time he felt perfectly fit for service again. He still carried his arm in a sling, but a generous diet and good wine had filled his veins again, and upon the day the king left he rode with Carl to join the marshal. He had been several times over to the chateau, and had on the last occasion seen the count who, although still terribly weak, was now out of danger and able to sit on a couch propped up by pillows his thanks were as earnest as those of the countess and having heard that fergus was to start on the following morning to join the army on the frontier he said to him there is no saying how far your king may carry his arms nor where you may find yourself the countess will therefore write letters addressed to intimate friends at various large towns telling them that you have placed us under a vast obligation and praying them to do for our sake all in their power for you under whatever circumstances you may arrive there she will write them on small pieces of paper each with its name and address on the back so that they will make a small and compact packet not much bigger than an ordinary letter 
I trust that when you return to Dresden, Lieutenant, I shall be able, myself, to do my best to prove my gratitude for your services. After taking lead of the Count, his wife and daughter, Fergus rode back to the royal quarters. As Carl took his horse, he said, Herr Lieutenant, I know not how we are going to manage. In what way, Carl? Two magnificent horses, complete with saddlery, holsters, and pistols, arrived here half an hour since. The man who brought them said they were from Count Eulen first, and handed me this note. Pray accept the horses we send you, as a feeble token of our gratitude. May they, by their speed and staunchness, carry you unharmed through dangers well nigh as great as those you faced for us. Fergus walked by the side of the soldier as he led the horse round to the stable. There, sir, Carl said, pointing to a pair of splendid animals. They are fit for a king. Tis a noble gift, and, indeed, I doubt whether the king himself has such horses in his stables. The question is, what is to be done with them? My present charger is an excellent one, and as a gift of the marshal, I could not part with it. As to the others, it is out of the question that I can take both. It would be altogether contrary to rules. I am entitled to forage for two horses, and that is when forage is to be had. Ah, I see what had best be done. Come to my room with me. I will give you a letter to the Count, he wrote as follows. Dear Count Eulenfurst, I cannot refuse the noble gift that you have made me, and thank you and the Countess for it with all my heart. At present, however, it places me in a difficulty. Aides of the camp are allowed to take only two horses. Indeed, my orderly could not take with him more than one led horse. The animal I have was the gift of Marshal Keith. That being so, you will see that I could not part with it. The only solution, therefore, that occurs to me is to beg you to add to your kindness by taking care of the one that I send back to you by the bearer until I return to Dresden or find means to send for it, in the event of one of the others being killed. The only fault with your gifts is that they ought to be kept for state reviews or grand occasions, for it seems wrong to take such noble creatures into the midst of a heavy fire. I am sure that I shall feel more nervous, lest a ball should injure my horse, than I shall do for my own safety. When he had folded and sealed this, he handed it to Carl, who had followed shortly after him. I am sending back one of the horses, Carl, and asking the Count to take care of it for me until I return or send for it. Do you see any difference between them? It would be hard to pick the best, Lieutenant. They both struck me as being perfect at all points. Both are four years old. Well, then, you must take one at random, Carl. Had one been better than the other, I should have left it behind. As it is, take whichever you choose. The man who brought them told me, sir, that both were bred on the Count's estates, and that he prided himself on having some of the best blood in Europe, both for beauty and stamina. He thought this pair were the pick of the stables. I almost wish I could leave them both behind, but I could not do so without hurting the feelings of the Count and Countess, but they are too good for an aide-de-camp's work. I don't think anything can be too good for that, sir. An aide-de-camp wants a horse that will stop at nothing, and sometimes he has to ride for his life, pursued by the enemy's cavalry. You will be the envy of the division on one of those horses. Carl returned an hour later with a message from the countess saying that she could not disturb her husband, who was then resting, but that she understood Mr. Drummond's difficulty and they should be very glad to take care of the horse for him until he wanted it. You did not see the countess, I suppose, Carl. Yes, sir, I saw her. She had me taken upstairs to her room. She asked if I was your servant, and when I said yes, she told me that she hoped I would take great care of you. I said that was my duty. Nevertheless, do more than your duty, she said. His life is a very precious one to us. Is it not, Thirza? The young lady nodded. Here are five gold crowns for yourself, she went on, handing me the money. They may help to make your bivouac more comfortable. And now, she said, there is something else, but I do not wish you to tell your master. What am I to do, Your Honor? You had better keep it to yourself, Carl Fergus, last. I dare say I shall hear of it some day. Very well, Lieutenant. 
then that is all there is to report the next morning fergus started early two days previously a prussian governor had been appointed to dresden and three thousand men were left under the command similar appointments were also made to all the fortified towns in saxony for now that the negotiations were broken off and the king of poland had declared finally for the confederates saxony was to be treated as a conquered country nevertheless strict injunctions were given that all cattle wheat and other provisions taken for the use of the garrisons or for storing up in fortresses whence it might be forwarded to the army were to be paid for and that any act of pillage or ill treatment was to be most severely punished as the king was still most anxious to gain the goodwill of the mass of the population end of chapter four Chapter 5 of With Frederick the Great, The Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Lobositz. In Dresden itself, the feeling was far from hostile to the invaders. The discontent with the vicious government had been extreme, and the imposts now levied were less onerous than those which had been wasted in profusion and extravagance the conduct of the troops had been admirable and in the case of count eulenfurst the personal visit of the king to express his regrets and his generosity to the families of the servants had produced a most excellent effect as fergus rode into camp mounted on his new acquisition it at once caught the marshal's eye why fergus he exclaimed have you been robbing the king of poland's stables this is a noble animal indeed it was a present from count eulenfurst marshal fergus replied he sent me two but one of them he is going to keep for me until i return for i could not part with rollo who is as good a horse as any one can wish to ride and i know his paces you are right lad for it is always well to accustom yourself to a horse before you want to use it in action but in faith it will be a pity to ride such a horse as that through the heat of a battle i feel that sir but as the count in his letter with the horses said that he hoped they would carry me safely through dangers as grave as those i had accounted at his house i feel that he would be hurt if on my return i admitted to him that i had saved it for show occasions you are right keith said approvingly but that is the more reason that you should accustom yourself to it before you use it for such work as horse and rider should be as one on the field of battle and unless the horse has absolute confidence in the rider it is very difficult to keep it steady under fire i suppose we shall not see the king for some time marshal fergus said later as keith was chatting with him on the contrary he will be with us tomorrow he rides today to have another look at the saxon position he will tomorrow morning join us and to give his orders there it is we who are likely to have the first fighting for the austrians must come to the release of the saxons who are shut up as in a trap by our divisions they made a great mistake in not retiring at once into bohemia which they could have done without difficulty had they lost no time there is no greater mistake than shutting a large force up either in a fortress or an entrenched camp unless that fortress is an absolute obstacle to an enemy this is not the case with pirna the mountains can be crossed at many other points and by leaving five or six thousand men in a strong position at the end of each defile we could disregard them altogether and march on southward they have already been three weeks there and we believe that they cannot hold out very much longer however it is probable that they may be able to do so until an austrian force comes up and tries to relieve them from what we hear two armies have already entered bohemia and we may expect that our first battle will not be far distant. do we block the only line of retreat sir fergus asked no indeed we do not absolutely close 
the direct path, but our position and that of Marshal Schwerin facing Koningratz so menaces their line of retreat that they dare not venture from the shelter, and our cavalry render it impossible for any supplies to be thrown in unless the convoy is supported by an army. There are, we know, paths across the hills by which infantry might effect a passage, but as there is nowhere a place for them to retire to, we should easily overtake them and force them to surrender. No, their only hope is in the coming of relief. A few hours later, the king himself rode in. In the evening, orders were issued that a force of cavalry and infantry were to march at daylight, and that the rest of the army were to follow two hours later. It was soon known that the king had received news that Marshal Brown, an Irish officer of great distinction, who commanded the Austrian force gathered at Budin, on the Eiger, was expecting the arrival of artillery and pontoons from Vienna in the course of a day or two, and was prepared to cross the river. It was evident, then, that his intention was to relieve the Saxon army in the first place. The roads through the defiles were very heavy and difficult, but that afternoon the advance force reached Termitz. Late in the evening, the rest of the army arrived there. A squadron of cavalry had been sent off as soon as the vanguard arrived to ascertain the movements of the enemy, and they returned at ten at night with information that the Austrians had crossed the Eiger that day and were to encamp at Lobositz. The army at once moved on across the mountains and, after a very difficult and fatiguing march, arrived near Lobositz and lay down for some hours in the order in which they had marched, taking up their position as soon as it was right. The infantry were in two lines. Their left was posted on a steep hill known as the Lobost, part of whose lower slopes extended to the village of Lobositz. A battery with infantry supports took post on a hill called Homolka, which commanded the whole plain between the two armies. The center stretched across the valley between those two hills. On the low hill on which stood the little town, the Austrians had thrown up entrenchments and posted a very strong artillery force, whose fire would sweep a greater portion of the Prussian position. Except at this point, the ground between the two armies was low and swampy. The Austrian force was greatly superior in numbers, consisting of 72 squadrons of horse, 52 battalions of infantry, and 98 guns, while the Prussians had 55 squadrons, 26 battalions, and 102 guns. It was evident to both commanders that the village of Lobositz was the decisive point and indeed the nature of the ground was such as to render operations almost impossible in the marshy plain intersected by rivulets which in many places form large ponds at seven in the morning the prussian action began by a heavy fire between the left on the slopes of lobosch and four thousand croats and several battalions of hungarians scattered among the vineyards and the stone walls dividing them. A heavy fog covered the whole country, and until a full view could be obtained of the position of the enemy, neither of the commanders deemed it prudent to move. At twelve o'clock, however, the fog began to clear up. The main body of the Austrians was still invisible, and the king, seeing but a comparative small force in the plain near Lobositz, thought that this must be the rear guard of the Austrians, who, he imagines, having found the line by which they intended to succor the saxons occupied in force had retired having thrown up batteries and left a strong force at lobositz to prevent the prussians from advancing to ascertain this twenty squadrons of cavalry were ordered to advance but on doing so they were received by so tremendous a fire from the batteries of the village and from others at Sulowitz, another village in the plain on their right, that they fell back with much loss, pursued by the Austrian cavalry. By the time they had resumed their positions behind the infantry, the fog had entirely lifted, and the king and Marshal Keith obtained a full view of the Austrian position. 
from the spot where they had stationed themselves on the hill. They agreed that no attack could be made against the enemy center or left, and that they could be assailed only on their right. The troops on the Lobosch hill were, therefore, largely reinforced, and the whole army advanced, inclining towards the left so as to attack Lobositz from the side of the plain, as well as from that of the mountain. A tremendous artillery fire from the guns on the hill heralded the advance. The troops on the Lobosch hill made their way forward rapidly. The ground was so steep that they commanded a view down into the vineyard, and their fire was so heavy that the Croats and Hungarians fell as fast as they raised their heads above the stone walls to fire. And although General Brown reinforced them by some of the best Austrian infantry, they were rapidly driven down towards Lobositz. At the foot of the hill, they were supported by several more battalions, brought from the Austrian center. General Lacey, who commanded these, was wounded. The Prussians halted at the foot of the slope and were reformed, having fallen into some disorder from the irregular nature of the ground over which they had been fighting. The guns were brought forward so as to cover their next advance, while a very strong force was sent to support the batteries on the Homolka Hill so as to check the enemy's center and left should they attempt any movement across the plain. In the meantime, Marshal Brown was reinforcing the defendants of Lobositz with the whole of his right wing. The village was defended with desperate bravery, but owing to the position, the king was able to reinforce the assailants very much more rapidly than the Australian commander could bring up his distant troops. The Prussian artillery concentrated their fire upon the place, and set it in flames from end to end, and when its defenders were forced to abandon it and retreat with precipitation on their cavalry. In order to cover their withdrawal, the Austrian left moved down to the village of Sulowitz and endeavored to pass the dam over a marshy rivulet in front of it, but the fire from the battery on the Homolka rendered it impossible for them to form and also set that village on fire, and they were therefore called back. The Austrian center moved to its right and occupied the ground behind Lobositz. As soon as the defenders of the village had fallen back, and then Marshal Brown formed up his whole force afresh. His position was now as strong as it had been when the battle first began, for the Prussians could not advance except between the swampy ground and the river and would have been exposed while doing so to the fire of batteries both in front and in flank the austrians were still greatly superior in number and all the advantages that had been gained might have been lost by a renewal of the action the total loss in killed wounded and prisoners on the part of the austrians was three thousand three hundred and eight that of the prussians was about the same Although indecisive and indeed claimed as a victory by both parties, the consequences showed that the advantage lay with the Prussians. Marshal Brown's object had been to relieve the Saxons, Frederick's to prevent this, and for the moment he had wholly succeeded. On the other hand was the fact that Marshal Brown had drawn off his army practically intact, and that it was impossible for the king to winter in Bohemia, as he would have done had the Austrian army been defeated and dispersed, and the latter was still in a position to make a fresh attempt to rescue the Saxons. To prevent this, the king dispatched the Duke of Brevard with a large force, as if to get between the Austrians and the river Eiger. This movement had the desired effect. Marshal Brown at once fell back recrossed the river and took up his position at his former camp at Buden. From there he opened communications with the Saxons, and it was arranged that these should pass the Elbe, and that he, with 8,000 men, should also do so and march to beat them. The Saxons, however, were detained, owing to the terrible weather and the enormous difficulty of the defiles, and only crossed 
on the 13th. In the meantime, the Prussians had taken up position to cut off the Saxon retreat, and after crossing, they found themselves hemmed in, and the road so commanded by newly erected batteries that, being utterly exhausted by fatigue and hardships, they had no resource but to surrender. The terms enforced were hard. The officers were allowed to depart on giving their parole not to serve again, but the whole of the rank and file were incorporated in the Prussian army. Fergus Drummond and Lindsay stood by their horses with the other members of the staff, some short distance behind the king and Marshal Keith, as they anxiously endeavored to discover the whereabouts and intentions of the Austrian army, while the crack of musketry between the Croats and the troops who were gradually pressing them down the hill, continued unabated. This is slow work, Drummond, Lindsay said, as hour after hour passed. I should not like to have anything to do with the king, just at present. It is easy to see how fidgety he is, and no wonder. For aught we know, there may be only three or four thousand men facing us, and while we are waiting here, the whole Austrian army, may have crossed over again and be marching up the river bank to form a junction with the Saxons. Or they may have gone by the defiles we traversed the last two days and may come down into Saxony and fall on the rear of our camp, watching Perna, while the Saxons are attacking in front. No wonder His Majesty's paces backwards and forwards like a wild beast in a cage. From time to time, an aide-de-camp was sent off with some order involving the movement of a battalion farther to the right or left, and the addition of a few guns to the battery on Homoka Hill. Fergus had taken his turn in carrying the orders. He had, two days before, abandoned his sling and scarcely felt any inconvenience from the wound, which indeed would have been of slight consequence had it not been for the excessive loss of blood. These movements mean nothing, Lindsay said, as he returned from one of these rides. The marshal makes the changes simply for the sake of doing something, partly, perhaps, to take the king's attention off this confounded delay, partly to interest the troops, who must be just as restless and impatient as we are. The messages were taken alternately by the king's aide-de-camp and the marshals. At length, as the fog began to lift, the interest in the scene heightened. The king and Keith talked long and earnestly together as they watched the village of Lobositz. They have got some strong batteries there, Lindsay said, but as far as one can see, there does not appear to be any large body of troops. I suppose it is meant that the troops on the slopes shall retire there and make a strong stand i am bound to say that it looks very much as if brown had only left a strong guard here to keep us from issuing from this defile and that his whole army moved away last night and may now be some thirty miles away on their march towards saxony as the fog lifted still more they could see the stream running right across the plain and the little village of sulowitz on its bank apparently still and deserted presently keith wrote an order on a tablet and lindsay was sent off with it to the general commanding the cavalry something is going to be done at last drummond he said as he mounted it is an order to the cavalry an order was then dispatched to the battery on homoka hill and to the batteries on the left two more battalions of infantry then moved up to press the croats more quickly down the hill Fergus watched Lindsay and saw him ride up to the general. Several officers at once galloped off. There was a movement among the cavalry, and then twenty squadrons passed out through the intervals between the brigades of infantry and trotted out through the mouth of the valley. They went on without interruption until abreast of Lobositz, and then a great number of men ran suddenly up from the houses of the village to the batteries. A minute later, some thirty guns poured their fire into the Prussian cavalry, while at the same moment, the guns of a heavy battery hitherto 
unseen poured in their fire from Sulawitz on their left flank, while from rising ground not visible behind it came the roar of thirty more pieces. So rapidly had the aides de camp been sent off that Fergus was the only one remaining available. The king spoke a few words to the marshal and then said to Fergus, Ride, sir, with my orders to the officer commanding the cavalry out there and tell him to retire at once. Fergus ran back to where Carl was holding his horse. Follow me, Carl, he said, as he sprang into the saddle and then rode rapidly down the steep hill and as soon as he reached the valley dashed off at a headlong gallop. I have orders, Carl, to recall the cavalry who will be destroyed unless they return. Should I fail, carry the order to their commander. The din was now prodigious. The whole of the Prussian batteries had opened on Lobositz and Sulowitz, and between the thunder of the guns came the incessant crackling of musketry on the hill to his right. Passing through the infantry, Fergus dashed across the plain. He was mounted on the horse the marshal had given him, as the other was not yet accustomed to stand fire. The noble animal, as if delighted to be on level ground again, and excited by the roar of battle, carried him along at the top of its speed without any need of urging. Fergus knew that on the heights behind the king and Keith would be anxiously watching him, for the peril of the cavalry was great, and the concussion of the guns was now causing the fog to lift rapidly and as he rode he could dimly make out dark masses of men all along the rising ground behind Sulowitz, and knew that the austrian cavalry might at any moment sweep down on the prussians he was drawing abreast of lobositz when suddenly a squadron of cavalry dashed out from the village their object was evidently to cut him off and prevent any message that he might bear reaching the Prussian cavalry, which were now halted half a mile ahead. Their officers were endeavoring to reform them from the confusion in which they had fallen, from the speed at which they had ridden and the heavy losses they had sustained. He saw at once that the Austrians would cross his line and reined in his horse to allow Karl to come up to him. Had not the trooper been exceptionally well mounted, he would have been left far behind. As it was, while pressing his charger to the utmost, he was still some fifty yards in the rear of Fergus. As soon as he came up, the latter said, We must cut our way through the Austrians. Ride close to me. We will ease our horses a little until we are within fifty yards, and then go at them at full speed. If I fall and you get through, carry the orders to retire to the general commanding the cavalry. The Austrian cavalry had formed up in two troops, one twenty yards behind the other, and each in line two deep, extending across the road by which Fergus was riding. Seeing by the speed at which he was traveling that the Prussian staff officer had no intention of surrendering, the Austrian in command gave the order to charge when they were some fifty yards away. Now, Carl, boot to boot, go right at them. And with pistols in their left hands and their swords in their right, they sent their horses at full speed against the enemy. These had scarcely got into motion when, like a thunderbolt, Fergus and his orderly burst down upon them. Not a blow was struck. Horse and rider went down before them. All was swept aside. They were scarcely conscious that they were through before they encountered the second line. Here the fight was much more severe. Fergus cut down two of his opponents and, with a pistol shot, rid Carl of an antagonist who was pressing him hard. And after a minute of wild confusion, they were through the line and riding at headlong speed towards the Prussians. Pistols cracked out behind them, but before the Austrians had time to turn, and aim they were already fifty yards away and going at a speed that soon left their pursuers behind as soon as the latter saw this they drew off and trotted back to lobositz fergus rode up to the officer commanding the cavalry i bear the king's orders to you general to retire at once with your command 
it was time for a bloody austrian cavalry of much greater strength could be seen galloping towards them from the high ground half a mile distant in half a minute the prussians were in motion but as they returned the storm of fire from the two villages broke out again with redoubled violence men and horses rolled over but closing up quickly the squadron swept on the general remained stationary until his last squadron thundered by and then galloped forward again and took his place at their head fergus had followed him when there was a sudden crash and he was thrown with tremendous force over his horse's head and there lay stunned with the shock when he recovered he staggered to his feet and saw that he was surrounded by austrian cavalry these having halted just where he fell as pursuit of the prussians was hopeless and the balls from the prussian batteries were falling thick you are our prisoner sir an officer said to him so i see fergus said for bitterly it is hard luck just at the beginning of the campaign it is the fortune of war the austrian said with a smile and indeed i don't think you have any reason to grumble for had that shot struck a few inches further back it would have carried off both your legs a short order was now given to retire one of the troopers was ordered to give his horse to fergus and to mount behind a comrade and they rode back to the austrian main position on the rising ground fergus was at once taken to the marshal in command of the austrians what is your name sir the lad asked fergus drummond i have the honor to be an aide-de-camp on marshal keats staff a scotchman i suppose the marshal said breaking into english yes sir what force is there opposed to us that i cannot say sir i only joined the army two days ago and have been on march ever since who is your commander marshal keats sir but the king himself is with it i will see that you are made comfortable presently mr drummond captain wingratz will you conduct this officer to the rear and place a couple of soldiers to see that he is not annoyed or interfered with in any way fergus was led away captain wingratz called up two troopers and choosing an elevated spot of ground told them to dismount and allow no one to speak to the officer from here he said courteously to drummond you will get a view of the field of battle fergus sat down on the grass and remained a spectator of the fight to the end of the day he marked at once that the combat had rolled down the hill and that the prussians were making their way in force toward libowitz then he saw heavy masses of infantry from the austrian right move forward to aid in its defence for two hours the battle raged round the village the whole of the guns on both sides aiding in the fight then volumes of smoke and flame rose and the austrians were seen retiring sulowitz still kept up a heavy fire and he saw a strong body from the austrian left move down there while the centre advanced to cover the retreat of the defenders of lobositz and to check the advancing masses of the russians and he thought for a time that a general engagement was about to take place then he saw the prussian advance cease the roar of cannon gradually died away and the battle was at an end for an hour he remained apparently unnoticed then captain wingrakes rode up with another officer i am sorry to have neglected you so long lieutenant drummond but you see it was the fault of your own people who have kept us so busy this is lieutenant kerr a compatriot of yours who will take special charge of you i am sorry that our meeting cannot take place under more favorable circumstance kerr said holding out his hand it might well have been the other way now come with me to my tent i have no doubt that you are hungry i can assure you that i am the two walked together for about a quarter of a mile the austrian officer having left as soon as he had introduced them there were three of us here this morning kerr said as they entered the tent the other two are missing one i know is killed the other badly wounded but whether he is dead or a prisoner i cannot say by the way are you not the officer who cut his way through the squadron of our regiment and went on and joined your cavalry who at once fell back i was in lobositz myself 
my squadron was not ordered out as i hear that you were found by our cavalry as they followed the prussians it struck me that it might be you although from lobositz we could only see that it was a staff uniform that the officer wore yes it was i i was carrying an order for the cavalry to retire that was what we supposed as soon as you were seen coming down the valley and as it would have suited us much better for the prussian cavalry to have stayed where it was for a little longer the general sent out a squadron to intercept you it was a splendid thing to do on your part of course there was a number of us watching from the earthworks and i can assure you that there was a general inclination to cheer as you cut your way through our fellows i am sure that if i had known that it was a countryman i should have done it though the action was at the expense of my own regiment our squadron suffered heavily as they rode back again for that battery from the homolka turned its attention to them as soon as you had gone through they had an officer and nearly thirty men killed and wounded before they got back into shelter how long have you been out here only about two months really you are lucky in getting on to keith's staff he is a cousin of my mother's fergus said and he made you lieutenant and aide de camp at once no i was a first coronet but i was promoted at dresden the king had given strict orders about plundering and it happened that i came upon some marauders at their work and had the good fortune to rescue a gentleman of some importance from their hands and the king who was furious at his orders being disobeyed himself promoted me i have been lucky enough to get myself wounded in the affair as i lost a good deal of blood i looked no doubt a good deal worse than i was and i expect that had a good deal to do with my getting the step well you are a lucky fellow i was eight years at coronet before i got promoted i think my bad luck in getting captured balances my good fortune in being promoted so soon to some extent perhaps it does but you will get the benefit when you return no doubt fritz was watching you as you rode he must have seen our cavalry coming down the slope before the man in command of your squadrons could have done so and must have felt that they were lost unless his orders were received he must have been relieved indeed when he saw you reach out this has indeed been the case the king and marshal had been both watching through their glasses the prussian cavalry and marked how the ground behind them was dotted thickly with the bodies of horses and men will they never stop the king said impatiently these cavalrymen are always getting into scrapes with their impetuosity Gorlitz, must have known that he was only sent forward to ascertain the position of the austrians and not to fight the whole army he ought to have turned as soon as that crossfire of their batteries opened upon them he knew that your majesty and the whole army would be watching him sire keith said quietly and i fancy that under such circumstances few cavalrymen would draw rein till they had done something worthy of themselves at this moment the fog moved away see the king exclaimed there is a great deal of austrian cavalry moving along behind sulowitz that rise behind the village must hide them from our men where is your messenger keith there he goes sire he is well out of the valley now and by the pace he is riding and he won't be long before he reaches them he won't reach them at all the king said curtly a minute later see there is a squadron of horse riding out from lobo sits to cut him off no doubt they guess what his errand is i see them sire and he must see them too he is checking his horse for his orderly is coming up to him then the cavalry will be lost the king said the enemy batteries are playing havoc with them and they will have the austrians down upon them in a few minutes and i expect gaula sees them now our men are halting and forming up i suppose he means to charge the austrians when they come up but there are three to one against him he is lost 
There is hope yet, sire, he said, as again turned his glass on Fergus. My aide-de-camp is going to charge the Austrian squadron. So he is, the king exclaimed, lowering his glass, for the distance was a little more than half a mile from the spot where he stood. He must be mad. It is possible he may do it, sire. His orderly is riding boot to boot beside him. You know already that he is a good swordsman. He will have the advantage that the enemy won't dream of his attacking them, and the rate at which they are riding will help them through. There he goes. And he raised the glass again to his arm. Bravo! They are through the first troop, and still together. Now they are at it. There, sire. They are through the second troop. Bravo, Fergus. The king made no remark until he saw the Austrian squadron draw rein. Then he said, Thank God he has saved the cavalry. It was a glorious deed. Marshal Keith make out his commission as a captain today. He is very young, sire, the marshal said hesitantly. By heaven, sir, I would promote him if he were an infant at arms. The king replied, Why, Keith, the loss of half our cavalry would have crippled us, and the cavalry men are not made in a day. There, he has reached them now. I see they are wheeling. Well, and quickly done. Yes, they won't be overtaken but three minutes later, and yet not a man would have come back. Colonel Ragnar, he said to one of a group of officers behind him, you will please ride down and meet the cavalry when they come in and convey to Lieutenant Drummond my highest satisfaction at the gallant manner in which he has carried out my orders. You will also inform General Gorlitz that, in my opinion, he pushed his reconnaissance much too far, but that I am well content with the bravery shown by the troops and at the manner in which he drew them off on receipt of my order. In five and twenty minutes, the colonel returned and said, I regret to say, Your Majesty, that Lieutenant Drummond is missing. I have inquired among the officers and find that, as he was following General Gorlitz, he and his horse suddenly pitched forward and lay without movement. Evidently, the horse was killed by a cannon shot. But whether Mr. Drummond was also killed, they could not say. We must hope not, the king said warmly. I would not lose so gallant a young officer for a great deal. Keith, if we take Lobositz today, let a most careful search be made over the ground the cavalry passed for his body. If it is found, so much the worse. If not, it will be a proof that he is either wounded or unhurt, and that he has been carried off by the Austrian cavalry, who passed over the same ground as ours, and who certainly would not trouble themselves to carry off his body. End of chapter 5「6 of with Frederick the Great a story of the seven years war by g a henty this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. a prisoner the next morning a horse was brought round for fergus and he at once started under the escort of a captain and lieutenant kerr and fifty troopers with thirteen other officers taken prison at lobositz seven hundred rank and file had also been captured these however were to march under an infantry escort on the following day fergus afterwards learned that sixteen officers of whom eleven belonged to the cavalry had been killed and eighty-one officers and about eighteen hundred men wounded in the desperate fighting at Lobositz. Fergus found that among the Austrians the battle of the previous day was considered a victory, although they had lost their advance post at Lobositz. I cannot say it seems so to me, he said to the lieutenant as they rode away from the camp. Why we have prevented the king from penetrating into Bohemia? But the king could have done that three days ago without fighting a battle, Fergus said, just as Schwerwin did at Koniggatz. There would have been no need to have marched night and day across the mountains in order to give battle to an army nearly twice the strength of his own. 
his object was to prevent you from drawing off the saxons and in that he perfectly succeeded oh there are other ways of doing that we had only to keep along the other side of the elbe until we faced pima then they could have joined us sounds easy fergus laughed but it would not be so easy to execute these mountain defiles are terrible and you may be sure that the king will not be idle while you and the saxons are marching to meet each other however it was a hard-fought battle and i should think that our loss must be quite as great as yours for your artillery must have played terrible havoc among our infantry as they marched to the assault of the village yes i hear this morning that we have lost about a hundred and twenty officers killed and wounded and about two thousand one hundred and fifty men and nearly seven hundred missing or prisoners what your loss is of course i can't say i cannot understand your taking so many prisoners fergus said a great many of them belong to the cavalry you see all who were dismounted by the fire of our guns were captured when our horses swept down ah yes i did not think of that i saw a good many men running across the plain when i galloped out two of the officers belonged to the third royal dragoon guards half of which regiment had taken part in the reconnaissance and both their horses like his own had been shot under him as soon as they were brought up from the tents where they had been lodged they exchanged a cordial greeting with fergus he no longer belonged to the regiment as on his promotion he had been gasseted from it on to the staff but during the time he had drilled with them in berlin he had come to be well known to all of them i thought that it was you lieutenant one of them said i was not far from you when you charged through those austrians i was unhorsed as we went forward and was running back when i saw them come out there were a good many of us and i thought their object was to capture us it was no use running and i threw myself down in hopes they would think i had been knocked over you passed within thirty yards of me our guns opened so heavily on them after you had gone through that i thought it prudent to keep quiet a little longer before i made a move and the result was that the austrian cavalry as it came along in a pursuit of our men picked me up do you know where we are bound for prague in the first instance but beyond that i cannot say i suppose it will depend a good deal on what takes place now there is no doubt that the saxons will have to surrender and i suppose that anyhow they will send us further away unless indeed there is an exchange of prisoners a long day's ride took them to prague the news of the battle had been sent off the night before and as it had been reported as a victory the inhabitants were in a state of great delight bonfires blazed in the streets church bells rang in triumphant peals and the whole population was abroad the arrival of this party with prisoners afforded a welcome confirmation of the news there were a few yells and hoots as they rode along in charge of their escort but as a rule the people stood silent as if in respect for their misfortunes for most of the captives were wounded they were taken to the military prison and comfortable quarters assigned to them and the wounds of those who required it were redressed by a surgeon there was a hearty parting between fergus and kerr as the latter after handing over his prisoners turned to ride off with the escort to the barrack i start early tomorrow for the camp again he said if you are kept here i am sure to see you again before long fergus shared a room with captain hinderman an officer of the third i don't think it at all likely we shall remain here the latter said it is more probable that we shall be sent to Omutsd or to one of the smaller fortresses in moravia the war is they will think likely to be confined to bohemia until the spring if indeed the king does not have to stand on the defensive i cannot help thinking myself that we should have done better if we had let things go on quietly to the spring it is not probable that russia and austria would have been more ready than they are now and we should have had the whole summer before us and might have marched to vienna before the campaign was over now they will all have the winter to make their preparations and we shall have france austria and russia to say nothing of poland 
on our hands. It is a tremendous job even for Frederick to tackle. They remained for three weeks at Prague and were then informed by the governor that he had orders for them to be removed to Olmutz. Accordingly, the next day, eight of the officers started on horseback under an escort. When they reached Bruin, they found that they were to be separated, and the next morning Captain Hindeman and Fergus were taken to the fortress at Spielberg. An awkward place either to get in or out of drummond the captain said as they approached the fortress very much so fergus agreed but if i see a chance i shall certainly do my best to escape before spring i don't think there is much chance of that the other said gloomily if we had been left at prague or even at bruen there might have been some chance but in these fortresses where everything is conducted on a very severe system and they are veritable prisons i don't think that anything without wings has a chance of getting away as a rule officers take prisoners in war enjoyed a considerable amount of liberty and were even allowed to reside in the houses of citizens on giving their parole the enforced embodiment of the saxons in the prussian army had however excited such a storm of indignation throughout Europe, that it greatly damaged Frederick's cause. It was indeed an unheard of proceeding, and a most mistaken one, for the greater part of the Saxons seized opportunities to desert as soon as the next campaign began. It was the more ill-advised, since Saxony was a Protestant country, and therefore the whole action alienated the other Protestant princes in Germany, whose sympathies would have otherwise been wholly with Prussia and it was to no small extent due to that high-handed action that during the winter the swedes joined the confederacy and undertook to supply an army of fifty thousand men france paying a subsidy towards their maintenance and the members of the confederacy agreeing that upon the division of prussia pomerania should fall to the share of sweden thus it may be said that the whole of central and northern europe with the exception only of Hanover, was leagued against Prussia. It was a result of this general outburst of indignation that, instead of being kept in a large town and allowed various privileges, the prisoners taken at the Battle of Lobositz were treated with exceptional severity and confined in isolated fortresses. Fergus and his companion were lodged in a small room in one of the towers, the window was strongly barred, the floor was of stone, the door massive and studded with iron. Two truckle beds, a table, and two chairs formed the sole furniture. Not much chance of an escape here, Captain Hindeman said, as the door closed behind their guards. The prospect does not look very bright, I admit, Fergus said cheerfully, but we have a proverb. Where there is a will, there is a way. I have the will, certainly, and, as we have plenty of time before us, it will be hard if we do not find a way. He went to the window and looked out, over a hundred feet, and, I should say, a precipice fully as deep at the foot as at the wall. At any rate, we have the advantage of an extensive view. I am glad to see that there is a fireplace, for the cold will be bitter here when the winter sets in. I wonder whether the rooms above and below this are tenanted. Hindeman shrugged his shoulders. He was not at present in a mood to take interest in anything. It was now the end of October, and Fergus was very glad when the door opened again and a warder came in with two soldiers who carried huge baskets of firewood, and it was not long before a large fire was blazing on the hearth. Day after day passed. Fergus turned over in his mind every possible method of escape, but the prospect looked very dark. Even if the door was open, there would be difficulties of all sorts to encounter. In the middle of the day, many people went in and out of the fortress with provisions, wood, and other matters. But at sunset, the gates were shut and sentries placed on the walls, and on getting out, he would have to cross an inner courtyard and then passed through a gateway at which a sentinel was posted night and day into the outer court which was surrounded by a strong wall over thirty feet high with towers at the angles 
Escape from the window would be equally difficult. Two long and very strong ropes would be required, and the bars of the window were so massive that without tools of any kind it would be impossible to remove them. A month later, Captain Hindeman fell ill and was removed to the infirmary. Fergus was glad of his departure. He had been so depressed that he was useless as a companion, and so long as he remained there, he altogether prevented any plan of escape being attempted. For difficult as it might be for one person to get away, it would be next to impossible for two of us to do so. For an hour in the day, the prisoners had leave to walk on the wall. His fellow prisoners had never availed himself of this privilege. But Fergus always took his daily exercise, partly to keep himself in health, partly in hopes that a plan of escape might present itself. A sentry, however, was always posted on the wall while the prisoners were at exercise, and on the side allotted for their walk. The rock sloped away steeply from the foot of the wall. The thought of escape, therefore, in broad daylight was out of the question, and Fergus generally watched what was going on in the courthouse. In time he came to know which was the entrance to the apartments of the governor and his family, where the married officers were quartered, and where the soldiers lodged. He saw that on the ground floor of the tower he occupied were the quarters of a field officer belonging to the garrison. One day he saw a number of men employed in clearing out some unused quarters. On one side of the outer courtyard, and judged that an addition was about to be made to the garrison. This gave substance to a plan that he had been revolving in his mind. That evening, when the water brought him his food, he said carelessly, I see you have some more troops coming in. Yes, the man replied. There are three hundred more men coming. They will march in tomorrow afternoon. They will be getting the room on the first floor below here, cleared out tomorrow morning for the officer who commands them. Fergus had all along considered that there would be no difficulty in suddenly attacking and overpowering the water when he came in or out of the room for no special precautions were taken. The fact that the prisoners were all in their uniforms and that on showing themselves below they would be instantly arrested seemed to forbid all chance of their making any attempt to escape it was the matter of clothes that had more than anything else puzzled fergus although he thought that he might possibly obtain a uniform from some officer's quarters it was evident that the guard would at once perceive that he was not one of the officers of the garrison the arrival of the fresh detachment relieved him of this difficulty and it now seemed that a way of escape was open to him much depended upon the hour at which the regiment would arrive the later they did so the better and as the weather had for some days been terribly rough and the roads would be deep and heavy it was likely that they would not arrive until some time past the hour fixed the next afternoon he listened for the roll of drums that would greet the arrival of the newcomers. Just as the door opened and the sergeant entered with a lantern, he heard the sound that he had been listening for. Nothing could have happened more fortunately as the man was placing his sup on the table. Fergus sprang suddenly upon him, hurled him down onto his face, and then fastened his hands behind him with a rope he had made from twisted strips of one of the rugs. He was not afraid of his calling out, as the window looked outside and it was blowing half a gale. Moreover, the sound of drums below would aid to prevent any noise being heard from the courtyard. I don't want to hurt you, Sergeant, he said, but I do want my liberty. I must put a bandage round your mouth to prevent you from calling, but you know as well as I do that there would be no chance of your being heard, however loud you may shout. Now, in the first place, I am going to see if I can get a uniform. If I cannot, I must come back and take yours. Binding the sergeant's legs as well as his arms and putting a muffler over his mouth, Fergus went out, leaving his own jacket and cap behind. The key was in the door. He turned it and put it in his pocket, shot the heavy bolts and ran downstairs. When he got to the bottom, he tried the door of the major's quarters. 
It was unbolted, and he felt absolutely certain that the major would be out as, with the other officers, he would have gone down to the gate to receive those of the incoming detachment. On opening the door, he saw the articles of which he was in search, a long cloak and a regimental cap. These he had once put on. After a further search, he found a pair of military pantaloons and a patrol jacket. Throwing off the cloak, he rapidly changed his clothes. He wanted now only a regimental sword to complete the costume, but he trusted to the long cloak to hide the absence of this. Throwing the things that he had taken off under the bed, he went out, closed the door behind him, locked it, and took the key. He had with him the short sword carried by the water, and he replied upon this to silence the sentry at the passage leading to the outer court should he attempt to stop him. This, however, was most unlikely. The night was dark, and there was no light burning. And at this hour, with fresh troops arriving and general movement in the fortress, there could be no questions of countersign being demanded by a sentry in the interior of the place. The man, indeed, only drew himself up and saluted as he dimly made out an officer coming from the major's quarters. The courtyard beyond was half full of soldiers. The newcomer had just fallen out. Some were greeted by members of the garrison who had known them before. Officers were chatting together, and Fergus made his way, unnoticed in the darkness, to the gate. As he had hoped, the baggage wagons were making their way in. A sentry was placed on each side of the gate. Now then, he said sharply, hurry on with those wagons. The commandant wants to get the gate shut as soon as possible. And passing the sentry, he went on as if to hurry up the rear of the train. Taking him for one of the officers of newly arrived party, the sentry stepped back at once and he passed out. There were six wagons still outside and unnoticed he passed these and went down the road. He had brought with him under his cloak the sergeant's lantern, and as soon as he was half a mile from the fortress, he took this out, and in order to be able to proceed the more rapidly. He had taken particular notice of the country from his prison window, and when he came down into a broad road running along the valley, he turned at once to the south. His plan had all been carefully thought out while in prison. He knew perfectly well that without money, it would be altogether impossible for him to traverse that many hundred miles that lay between him and Saxony. There would be a hot pursuit when in the morning he was found to have gone, but it would hardly be suspected that he had taken the road for Vienna, as this would be entirely out of his way. Happily, he was not altogether penniless. He had always carried five or six gold pieces sewn up in the lining of his jacket with the letters with which he had been furnished by Count Eulenfurst as a resource in case of being taken prisoner. He wished now that he had brought more, but he thought that it might have proved sufficient for his first needs. He walked all night, his candle burnt out in two hours after starting, but eleven the moon rose, and its light enabled him to keep the road without difficulty. As morning dawned, he approached a good-sized village, some forty miles from the starting point, and waiting for an hour until he saw people stirring, Fergus went to the posting house and shouted for the postmaster. Sight of a field officer on foot at such an hour in the morning greatly surprised the man when he came down. My horse has fallen and broken its neck, Fergus said, and I have had to walk some miles on foot. I have important dispatches to carry to Vienna. Bring round a horse without a moment's delay. The postmaster, without the smallest hesitation ordered his man to saddle and bring out a horse it will be sent back from the next stage fergus said as he mounted and rode on at full speed he changed horses twice not the slightest suspicion being entertained by any of the postmasters that he was not what he seemed and before noon arrived at the last post house before reaching vienna a bottle of your best wine landlord and i want to speak a word with you in a private room bring two glasses the wine was poured out and after he had drank a glass fergus said landlord i am the bearer of important dispatches and it is imperative that i should not attract attention 
as I enter the city. If I were seen and recognized there, questions might be asked and curiosity excited as to the news of which I am the bearer. I see that you are a sensible man and will readily understand the situation. To avoid attracting attention, it would be best for me to enter the city in a civilian dress. You are about my size, and I beg you to furnish me with a suit of your clothes, for which I will pay at once. I will do that willingly, sir, the landlord answered, feeling much honored by being led into what he deemed an important affair. My best suit is at your service. You can send it to me out from the town. I would rather pay for it, landlord. I may be ordered in another direction, and I may not have an opportunity of returning it. If you will say how much the suit cost you, I will hand you the money. The landlord went out and returned in a minute with the clothes. Another glass of wine, landlord, Fergus said, as he handed over the amount which the landlord valued them. Another glass of wine then, while I'm changing. Get a light trap round the door. I shall not want to take it into Vienna, but will alight and send it back again, half a mile the side of the gates. Mind, should any inquiries be made, it were best to say as little as possible. In another five minutes, Fergus was on his way again. He had procured from the landlord a small trunk in which he had packed the uniform and directed him to keep it until he heard from him. But if in the course of a week he received no orders, he was to forward it to Major Steiner at Spielberg. When within half a mile of Vienna, Fergus got out, gave a present to the driver and told him to return, and then walked towards the gate which he entered without question. He thought better not to put up in that quarter of the town, but walked long distance through the city, purchased a traveling coat lined with sheepskin, and a small canvas trunk in which he put it. It went some distance further and hired a room at a quiet inn and called for dinner, of which he felt much in need. For beyond eating a few mouthfuls of bread while a fresh horse was brought out for him, he had tasted nothing since the previous evening. After dining, he went to his room and took his boots off and, feeling completely worn out from his long journey after two months of confinement, threw himself on the bed and slept for three hours. Then he went for an hour's stroll through town. By this time it was getting dark. Snowflakes were beginning to fall thickly, and he was very glad, after sitting for a time listening to the talk in the parlor of the inn, to turn in for the night. In the morning, the ground was covered with snow. He was glad to put on his thick coat, but the cold outside was bitter. For some hours he walked about Vienna, and the contrast between that city and Berlin struck him greatly. The whole bearing and manner of the people was brighter and gayer. The soldiers, of whom there were great numbers in the street, Austrians, Croats, and Hungarians, had none of the formal stiffness of the Prussians, but laughed and joked as they went, and seemed as easy and light-hearted as the civilians around him. They were for the most part inferior in size and physique to the Prussians, but there was a springiness in their walk and an alertness and intelligence which were wanting in the more solid soldiers of the North. He spent the day in making himself acquainted with the town, the position of the gates, and other particulars which might be important to him, as he could not feel sure of the reception he would meet with when he presented his letter. In the afternoon, the city was particularly gray. Sledges made their appearance in the street, and all seemed delighted that winter had sent in in earnest. The next morning after breakfast, Fergus went to the mansion of Court Platinum, whose position he had ascertained on the previous day. The name had been scored under in his list as one on whom he might confidently rely. I am the bearer of a letter to Count Platinum, he said to the somewhat gorgeously dressed functionary who opened the door. I have a message to deliver to him personally. The doorkeeper closed the door behind him and spoke to a footman, who went away and returned in a minute or two, and told Fergus to follow him to a spacious and comfortable library where the Count was sitting alone. You are the bearer of a letter to me, sir, he said, in a pleasant tone of utterance. Whence do you bring it? From Count Eulenfurst, or Dresden, Fergus said, producing it. The Count gave an exclamation of pleasure. 
has he completely recovered he asked of course we heard of the outrage of which he was a sufferer he was going on well when i saw him last count the count opened the letter and read it and with an air of growing surprise as he went on when he had finished it he rose from his seat and offered his hand to fergus you are the scottish officer save the lives of the count his wife and daughter he said warmly how you come to be here i don't know but it is enough for me that you render my dear friend and his wife who is a cousin of mine this great service you are not here i hope on any mission which as an austrian noble i could feel it impossible to further no indeed count had it been so i should assuredly not have presented this letter to you in giving it to me the countess said that possibly the fortune of war might be unfavorable and that i might be taken prisoner in that case she said i might find a friend invaluable and she gave the letters to eight gentlemen in various great towns saying that she believed that any one of these would for the sake of the count do me any kindness in his power prevision has turned out correct my horse was shot under me at the bottle of lobesitz and i was made prisoner and sent to the fortress of spielberg three days since i effected my escape and deemed it more prudent to make my way here where no one would suspect me of coming instead of striving to journey up through bohemia you effected your escape from spielberg the count repeated in surprise that is indeed a notable feat for it is one of our strongest prisons but you shall tell me about that presently now about count eulen first the affair created quite a sensation partly from the rank and well-known position of the count partly from the fact that the king of prussia himself called upon the count to express his sincere regret at what had occurred and the vigorous steps that he took to put a stop to all acts of pillage and marauding it was said at the time that had it not been for the opportune arrival of a young scottish officer an aide-de-camp to marshal keith the lives of the count and his family would assuredly have been sacrificed and that the king in token of his approbation had promoted the officer on the spot but i pray you take off that warm coat and make yourself at home he touched the bell a servant entered immediately if anyone calls say that i am engaged on business and can see no one this morning place two chairs by the fire and bring in wine and glasses two chairs were moved to the fire wine was placed close to hand on a small table and the count fetched a box of cigars from his cabinet fergus had already adopted the all but universal custom in the german army of smoking now the count said when the cigars were lighted tell me all about this affair at dresden fergus related the facts as modestly as he could no wonder eulifer speaks of you in the highest terms said the count truly it was nobly done six pomeranian soldiers to a single sword tis wonderful the chief credit should as i have said count be given to the maid but for whose aid matters might have gone quite otherwise doubtless great credit is due to her lieutenant drummond but you see you had already defeated three and i prefer to think that you would have got the better of the others even if she had not come to your aid the countess had i hope quite recovered at the time you came away since it is she who writes the letter in her name i think that she had quite recovered for a few hours the doctors were even more anxious as to her state than that of the count but the news that he was doing well and might recover did wonders for her and she was able herself to take part in nursing him two days after he received the wound i saw by the account that my little cousin received the king she did sir and bore herself well it was no doubt a great trial to her so soon after the terrible scene she had passed through in that she had showed great calmness and presence of mind and was able to give assistance to her mother as soon as she herself was released from her bonds you were not present yourself no sir my wounds were as i said but in the flesh but was of so little consequence that i did not think 
to have it bandaged until all other matters were arranged but when i had made my report to the marshal and begged that a surgeon should be sent instantly to aid the count i fainted from loss of blood and it was some days before i was able to ride out to pay my respects to the countess and now tell me about your escape from spielberg this fergus did it was well managed indeed laughed the count you seem to be as ready with your wit as with your sword and to have provided against every emergency it was fortunate that you had hidden away those gold pieces with your letters for otherwise you could hardly have got those clothes from the postmaster it was a bold stroke indeed to use her majesty's uniform and the imperial post to further your escape now we must think in what way i can best aid you you will require a stout horse a disguise a well-filled purse eulen first authorizes me to act as his banker to advance any monies that you may require therefore you need offer me no thanks what disguise do you yourself fancy i should think that the dress of a trader travelling on business would be as good as any i could choose yes i should think it would i should give myself out as a saxon merchant fergus went on in the first place my german which i learned from a hanovian is near enough to the saxon to pass muster and my hair and complexion are common enough in saxony i will get an official paper from the city authorities stating that you are one shall we say paul muller native of saxony and draper by trade now returning to dresden i shall have no difficulty in getting it through one of my own furnishes i do not say that you could not make your way through without it should you be stopped and questioned it would facilitate matters i will see about it this afternoon i have simply to say to one of the tradesmen i employ that i am sending an agent through bohemia to eulen first and think that in the present disturbed state he had better travel as a trader and ask him to fill up the official papers and take them to the burgomaster's office to get them signed and stamped he will do it as a matter of course seeing that i am a sufficiently good customer of his horse i can of course supply you with it must not be too showy but it should be strong and serviceable animal with a fair turn of speed the clothes you had perhaps better buy for yourself together with such things as you can carry in your valises i would gladly ask you to stay with me here for a while but having arrived in that dress it might accept remarks among the servants were you to appear in a different character i regret that my wife and family are away at one of my country seats and will not be back for a week and i suppose you will not care to linger so long here i thank you count but i should prefer to leave as soon as possible i do not think that there is really any fear of my being recognized if they search at all along the vienna road it is not likely they will do so as far as this and certainly they could obtain no news of me for the first forty miles and would not be likely to push their inquiries as far for a dismounted field officer could not but have attracted attention at the first village through which he passed it would be best for you not to change your clothes at the place where you are stopping i can have everything ready for you by tomorrow morning if you wish to leave at once i should certainly prefer doing so very well then do you go out by the west gate at nine o'clock and walk for some four miles when you find some quiet spot change your clothes and walk on until within sight of the village of gulnach and there wait i will send it a confidential steward with the horse he on seeing you standing there will ask you who you are waiting for you will give my name and then he will hand over the horse and the papers to you he got up went to his table and opened the drawer here are a hundred rix dollars mr drummond which i hand you as count eulenford's banker it is a matter of pure business i could do with much less than that sir fergus said no tis better to be well supplied beside 
there are your clothes to buy and be sure and provide yourself with a good fur-lined traveling coat you will need it i can assure you your best course will be to travel through saint Poulton and lips cross the river at once and go over the mountains by the road through freistadt to budweiss it is by far the most level road from here through a good deal longer than the one through horn but there is snow in the air and i think that we shall have a heavy downfall and you may well find the defiles by the horn road blocked by snow whereas by freistadt you are not likely to find any difficulty and most of the road is perfectly flat end of chapter six Chapter 7 of With Frederick the Great, A Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Flight. After leaving Count Platum with the most sincere thanks for his kindness, Fergus went to a clothier's where he bought clothes suitable for a trader with warm undergarments and an ample cloak lined with warm though cheap fur and carried these to his inn the rest of the day was spent in strolling about and in examining the public buildings and art galleries the next morning he paid his reckoning and taking his small trunk in one hand and his fur cloak in the other started wearing the cloak he had first purchased as he thought that crossing the defiles into saxony he might very well need that as well as his cloak. As the western gate was one of the nearest to his inn, it was not long before he issued out and, walking briskly, came in three quarters of an hour to a wood. As there was no one in sight along the road, he, he turned in here and changed his clothes. Then, leaving those he had taken off behind him, he continued on his way, and in less than half an hour approached a village, which he learned from a man he met in Gulnock, he waited by the roadside for a quarter of an hour, and then saw a man galloping towards him, leading a riderless horse. He drew rein as he came up. "'What are you waiting here for?' he asked. "'Platurn,' Fergus replied. "'That is right, sir. This is your horse. Here is the letter the Count bade me give you, and also this sword, and he unbuckled the one that he wore. He bade me wish you Godspeed. Pray tell him that I am sincerely obliged to him for his kindness, Fergus replied as he buckled on the sword. The man at once rode off. The saddle was furnished with valises. These contained several articles he had not thought of buying, among them a warm fur coat with flaps for the ears and a pair of fur-lined riding gloves. He transferred the remaining articles from his little trunk to the valises and threw the former away rolled up his cloak and strapped it behind the saddle and then mounted he was glad to find in the holsters a brace of double-barreled pistols a powder flask and a bag of bullets and he also a large flask full of spirits as he gathered the reins in his hand he had difficulty in restraining a shout of joy for with an excellent horse good arms warm clothes and a purse sufficiently well lined he felt he was prepared for all contingencies as he moved on at a walk he opened the count's letter it contained only a few lines wishing him a safe journey and begging him to tell kurt eulen first that he regretted that he could not do more for his messenger to prove his good will and affection and also the official document that he had promised to procure for him tearing up the count's letter and putting the official document carefully in his pocket he pressed his heel against his horse's flank and started at a canter he stopped for the night at, at ips and on the following day rode to Linz. the snow had fallen almost incessantly and he was glad indeed that he had brought the coat as well as the cloak with him the next night he halted at freistadt as this was a strongly fortified place commanding the southern exit of the defile from the mountain he was asked for his papers the official merely glanced at them and returned them he was forced to stay here for several days 
as he was assured that it would be all but certain death to endeavor to cross the pass in such weather. On the third day the snow ceased falling, and early next morning a force of 500 men, comprising almost the whole of the garrison, started to beat down the snow and cut a way through the deep drifts. For four days this work continued, the men being assisted by a regiment that was marched down from Budweiss, and opened the defile from the northern end. The pass was an important one, as in winter it was the one chiefly used for communication between Bohemia and Vienna, and it was therefore highly important that it should be maintained in a practicable state. Fergus was in no hurry to proceed. He knew that there was not the slightest possibility of operations being commenced until the snow disappeared, which it might not be until the end of March. He therefore took matters very quietly, keeping entirely indoors as long as the snow continued to fall and going out as little as possible afterwards. He was glad indeed when the news came that the pass was clear. As soon as the gates were unlocked, he pressed on. In order to get ahead of a large convoy of carts, laden with warm clothing for the soldiers, that was also waiting for the pass to be opened. In spite of all that had been done, it was rough work passing through the defile, and he did not arrive at Krumano until nearly sunset. Budweiss lay but a few miles further ahead, but he had made up his mind not to stop there, as it was a large garrison town, and the small places suited him better. Passing through the town next day, he continued his course along the road near the river Moldo. He made but short journeys, for the snow had not yet hardened, and it was very heavy riding. He therefore took four days in getting to Prague. He thought it probable that here a watch might be kept for him, for had he traveled straight from Spielberg, this was the point for which, in all probability, he would have made unless he had gone through Silesia, and then traveled up through Breslau. He therefore made a circuit of the picturesque old city, entered it by a western gate, and then rode straight for the bridge. He had slept at a place but four miles distant, and had started at daybreak, so that it was still early in the day when he proceeded on his way. He stopped at a small town ten miles further north. Two or three squadrons of cavalry were quartered there. The landlord at the inn where he put up at once asked for his papers. These he took to the town officers, where they were stamped as being in due order. Half an hour later, as Fergus was at his meal, two officers entered. Your papers appear to be right, sir, one of them said courteously, but in times like these it is our duty to examine closely into these matters. You come from Vienna? Yes, sir. Which way did you travel? By way of Lintz and Budweiss, he said. The snow began on the day before I left the capital, and I was advised to take that route, as the road would be more level and less likely to be blocked with snow than that through Horn. You will see that my paper was stamped at Linz and also at Freistadt. I was detained at the latter place seven days. For the first three it snowed, and for the next four days the garrison was occupied with the aid of troops from Budways in opening the defile. The officer nodded. I happen to know that your story is correct, sir, and that it accounts fully for your movements since leaving Vienna. Which way do you intend to cross the passes into Saxony? I must be guided by what I hear of their state. I had hoped to have got back before the snow began to fall in earnest, but I should think that the road by the river will now be the best. I should think so, the officer said, but even that will be bad enough. However, I will not detain you further. They moved away to another table, and calling for a bottle of wine, sat down. No, we are mistaken. I don't think the fellow would have the bare-faced impotence to come through Prague, one said. The other laughed. I should think that he would have impotence for anything, Major, and in truth I rather hope that they won't lay hands upon him. A fellow who devised and carried out such a scheme as he did deserves his liberty. Of course, his overpowering the warden was nothing, but that he should have had the impudence 
to go down into the major's quarters, appropriate his clothes, leave his own uniform behind, and then, taking advantage of the arrival of another regiment, march calmly out through them all, past the sentries who took him from one of the newly arrived officers in charge of the wagons, was really splendid. How it was that they did not overtake him the next morning, I cannot make out. He had no sword with him, and no horse, and the spectacle of a field officer on foot, without even a sword, should have attracted the attention of the very first person who met him. He had not been gone two hours when troops started in pursuit, for when the major, whose door he had locked, had it burst open and found that his uniform was gone, he suspected something was wrong and had all the sergeants in charge of prisoners mustered. One was missing, the man who had charged of this young Scotchman. As he could not be found, the fellow's cell was broken open and there was the water bound and gagged. The bird had flown and parties of horse were sent off by all the roads leading to Bohemia and Silesia but no sign of the man have, as far as we have heard, yet been discovered. The only thing that I can imagine is that when he heard the cavalry in pursuit, he left the road and hid up somewhere, and that afterwards he tried to make his way by unfrequented paths and was starved in the snow. In that case, his body is not likely to be found until the spring. I cannot help thinking that a fellow who could plan and carry out that escape would hardly be likely to lose his life in a snowdrift. You see, it was not a sudden idea. On no other evening would he have found the gate open and after sunset, nor would he have been certain to have found the major absent from his quarters. He must have been waiting patiently for the, his opportunity, and as soon as he heard that another battalion was coming into the garrison, he must have resolved to act. More than that, he must have calculated that instead of arriving at four o'clock, as they were timed to do, they would be detained and not get in until after dark. They are clear-headed fellows, these Scotchmen, whether they are in our army or Fredericks. What makes the affair more wonderful is that this was quite a young fellow and probably understood no German, but I think that he would have acted more wisely had he waited until the spring. I don't know, the other said. When once the troops are all in movement north, he certainly could not have escaped in a military uniform without being questioned. And it scarcely seemed possible that he could have procured any other. He must be in more of a hurry to fight again than I am. There can hardly be much serious fighting, the other said. With us, Russia and France, and with the 50,000 Swedes who have been bought by France, we shall have 500,000 men under arms. While we know that 200,000 is the utmost Frederick can muster, and these will have to be scattered in every direction round his frontier. I am sorry that France has joined in, the other said. It is unnatural enough that we and Russia should combine to crush Prussia. But when it comes to our old enemies, the French helping us against a German power, I say frankly I don't like it. Beside, though, we may get Silesia back again, and that will be a small advantage in comparison to the disadvantage of France getting a firm foothold on this side of the Rhine, even if her share of the partition doesn't extend beyond the river. This will be her frontier nearly down to the sea, and she will have the power of pouring her troops into Germany whenever she chooses. Fergus had now finished his meal, and without caring to listen longer, he betook himself to bed. To avoid all appearance of haste, he did not start so early the next morning, but mounted at ten and rode to the junction of the Eiger with the Elbe. It was too late to cross the river that night, and he therefore put up at a village on the bank and crossed in a ferry boat on the following morning to Leitmeritz, a town of considerable size. He was now within a day's ride of the defile through which the Elbe finds its way from Bohemia into Saxony. His papers were inspected as usual by the officer in command of a troop of cavalry there. You will have a rough time of it if you push on, he said. There is no traffic through the passes now, 
so the snow will t lie as it fell and at any moment it may come down again as far as the mouth of the pass you will find it easy enough for we send half a troop as far as that every day but beyond that i should say that it would be all but if not quite impassable i advise you to stay here quietly until you hear of someone having crossed or at any rate if you go on you must take three or four peasants as guides to help you through the difficult places would it not be possible captain fergus asked to hire a boat i did not think of that yes there are flatboats that at ordinary times go down to dresden with the rafts of timber but whether you would find anyone willing now to make such a journey is more than i can say i am very anxious to be back to my business fergus said and as i should have to pay handsomely for guides to take me over and even then might lose my life it would be better for me to pay higher and get through at once on going down to the water side he saw several boats hauled up and it was not long before some boatmen seeing a stranger examining their craft came down to him i want to go down to dresden he said tis a bad time of the year one of the men replied it is a bad time of the year as far as cold is concerned but it's a good time of the year for going down the river he said for now that the frost is set in the river is low and the current gentle whereas in the spring when the snow is melting it must be a raging torrent in some of the narrow defiles this evidence that the stranger whoever he was was no fool silenced the boatman for a minute now fergus went on what is the lowest price that one of you will take me and my horse down to dresden for i am disposed to pay a fair price and not more and if you attempt to charge me an exorbitant one i shall take guides and follow the road you would never get through one of the men said well at any rate i would try and if i could not succeed by the river i would cross by some other pass i have no doubt whatever i could get through by graber and zittau the strangest acquaintance with the country again silenced the men they talked for a while apart and then one said we will take you for twenty rix dollars do you suppose that i am the emperor in disguise fergus said indignantly tis but three days journey at most and perhaps six for coming back against the stream we shall need four men master and there is the food by the way after much bargaining the price was settled at fifteen rix dollars both parties being satisfied with the bargain the men because it was more than twice the sum for which they would have been glad to do it at ordinary times fergus because he had still forty-six rix dollars in his pocket and had only bargained as he did in order not to appear too anxious on the subject the price was to include the erection at the end of the boat of a snug cover of rushes for his use he found on going down to the shore three hours later that the boatmen were engaged in covering in the whole of the craft with the exception of a few feet at each end with a roof of rushes the boat itself was some thirty-five feet in length and ten wide with straight sides and a general resemblance to a canal barge save that the beam was greater in comparison to the length the roof was high and sloped sharply a tall man can walk along it in the centre while at the sides there was all but three feet height hay and straw were extremely scarce the whole supply of the country having been stripped by the foraging parties but bundles of reeds had been thickly littered down especially near the stern shortly after his return the landlord of the inn told him that if he did not want to take the horse with him he would himself gladly buy it i have frequently to send to prague for things for the inn and besides i have to get provisions for people in the town i sold my best horse last autumn to an officer whose charger had been killed now that sledging has begun i want one which can travel fast and do the journey there in a day so if you don't want to take it 
and will accept a reasonable price, I will buy it. The offer was a welcome one. With two splendid horses at his command, for he knew that good care would have been taken care of the one left in camp, a third would only have been in the way, and this, although a good and useful beast, was scarce good-looking enough for an officer on the marshal's staff. Therefore, after the usual amount of bargaining, he parted with it for a fair price. The next morning early, he went on board. The servant of the inn, following with a great hamper of wine and provisions. He was glad to see that a bright fire burned on an earthen hearth in the middle of the boat, the smoke finding its way out partly through a hole cut in the thatch above it, partly by the opening at the fore end of the boat. He brought with him his horse cloth as well as his other belongings. The men who were clearly in a hurry to be away, pushed the boat off from the shore as soon as he had taken his place. We want to be back as soon as we can, the owner of the boat say, for it will not be long before the ice begins to form and we don't want to be frozen in. It does not feel to me quite so cold this morning, Fergus remarked. No, sir. We are going to have more snow. That won't matter to us, and if it snows for the next week, all the better. It is not often that the river closes altogether until after Christmas. In the mountains, the river seldom freezes at all. There is too much current, and beside, in shelter of the hills, the cold is not so great. Two oars were got out for the purpose of steering rather than of hastening the progress of the boat, and once well out of the current, she was allowed to drift quietly with the stream. Fergus spread his horth cloth on the rushes by the fire and found no need for his sheepskin coat the cloak loosely thrown over his shoulders and the collar turned up to keep off the draughts that blew in under the bottom of the thatch being sufficient to make him thoroughly comfortable there was nothing to see outside the shore being low and flat he had brought a large supply of meat with him and he handed over a portion of this to the men who acted as the cook of the crew and told him to make broth for them all. This was a welcome gift to the crew, who but seldom touched meat, and with the addition of barley, coarse flour, and herbs that they had brought for their own use, an excellent stew was provided. The pot was kept going through the journey, fresh meat and other ingredients being added from time to time. In addition to this, slices of meat were grilled over the fire and eaten with the bread they had brought. The gift of a bottle of wine between the crew each day and of a small portion of spirits, the last thing in the evening, added greatly to the satisfaction of the men. By nightfall, they arrived at the entrance of the defile. The snow was falling heavily, and they tied up against the bank. Fergus chatted with the men, listened to their stories of the river for some hours. All of them had at various times gone on timber rafts. They bewailed the war which would do them much harm. It would not altogether interrupt trade, for timber would be required as usual in Saxony and Hanover as a rule. Neither of the contending armies interfered with the river traffic, though communication by land was greatly interrupted, owing to the peasants' carts being impressed for military service. This, and the anxiety of everyone for the safety of his home and belongings, brought the trade between the countries to a standstill. On the river, however, the difficulty consisted not in any interference by the authorities, but from so large a number of the able-bodied men being called out for service that the amount of timber cut and brought down was greatly diminished while the needs of the army brought the trade in cattle and other produce to an entire cessation. The dangers of the river were not great, although in spring, when the snow melted and the river was swollen, navigation was rendered, especially in the narrow reaches of the defile, difficult and dangerous, for the force of the stream was so great that it was well nigh impossible to direct the course of the rafts, and indeed, the poles used for that purpose were often found too short to reach the bottom. The men were up long before daylight, but it was two hours later 
before Fergus roused himself, and shaking off the fine snow that had drifted in and lay thickly on his coat, went out to have a look at things. One of the men was already preparing breakfast. Two of the others stood at the bow with long poles, which they punted the boat along. The captain also provided with a pole stood in the stern. The snow had ceased, but the air felt sharp and cold as it came down the hill, which was all thickly covered. So there is an end to snow for the present, Captain, he said, and as he pushed aside the curtain of reeds that closed the stern of the covered portion and joined him. Yes, I am not altogether sorry, for we can see where we are going. We shall keep on now until we are through the defile. But there is no moon, Captain. No, but we can tell pretty well by the depth of water where we are, and can manage to keep in the middle of the current. There are no obstructions here to affect us, though in some places there are plenty of ugly rocks near the shore. However, if we have luck, we shall be through before midnight, and shall pass all the worst points before sunset. The day passed, indeed, without adventure of any kind. The journey was highly interesting to Fergus, for the scenery was very picturesque. Sometimes the hill narrowed in, and the stream straightened in its course, hastened its speed, and others the hills receded and were covered far up with forest, above which bleak mountain tops with their mantle of snow rose high in the air. The captain pointed out the spots where the Saxons had crossed, and where, pent in and surrounded with batteries commanding every means of exit, they were forced to surrender. It is smooth work now, he said, as they were going through one of the narrows, for the river is low and the current gentle, but in floods there are waves here that would swamp the boat did she keep out in the middle, as we are doing, and it would be impossible to pole her against it, even close to shore. You see, the ice is forming already near the bank. How do you manage coming back? In some places we can pole the boat. She will be light and will only draw a few inches of water. Then we hire a horse for a bit at one of these little villages, or when the road leaves the river, the other three will get out and tow from the edge while I shall steer. We shall manage it easily enough if the ice does not form too thickly. If the worst comes to the worst, we should stop at one of the villages, get the people to help us to haul her well up, wait till the snows are quite over, and then make our way back on foot and come and fetch the boat up when the spring floods are over. Then the pass is not so dangerous after all, Captain, Fergus said with a smile. Not when the snow is once hardened, and to men accustomed to it. As soon as the weather gets settled there, will be a little traffic, and the snow will be beaten down. Beside, where the hills come steep to the water's edge, a man on foot can always make his way along when the water is low, though a horseman might not be able to do so. In fact, I suppose, Fergus said, you all combined at Leitmeritz to represent the passes as being a great deal more dangerous than they are, in order to force those obliged to make the journey to take as many men as possible with them, or to pay two or three times the proper fare by boat. The passes over the hills would be terrible now, the man said. Most of them would be absolutely impassable until the snow hardens. As for the rest, he added with a smile, it may be that there is something in what you say, but you see times are hard. There is little work to be done and scarce any timber coming down, and if we did not get a good job occasionally, it would go very hard with us. By nightfall, they were nearly through the defile. Lanterns were placed in the bow of the boat, and until long after Fergus was asleep, the men continued to work at their poles. When he woke up in the morning, the boat was floating down a quiet river with the plains of Saxony on either side and the mountain range far astern. At noon, they neared Dresden, and an hour later, Fergus stepped ashore. He paid the men the sum arranged and handed over to them the rest of his provisions, which would be sufficient to carry them far on their way back. He soon learned that Marshal Keith was established in his old quarters 
and made his way thither he met two or three officers of his acquaintance but no one recognized him in his present attire he had hired a boy when he landed to carry his cloak and valises the saddle and bridle he had sold with the horse he was as usual passing the sentries at the gate without notice when one of them stepped in front of him what is your business sir my business is with marshal keith he said and it is particular the sentry called the sergeant of the guard you can pass me up fergus said sharply i am well known to marshal keith and he will assuredly see me soldier took him up to the anteroom lieutenant lindsay who was on duty came forward and looked at him doubtfully for a moment and then shouted joyfully why drummond is it you this is indeed a joyful meeting old fellow i had thought of you as immured in one of the enemy's fortresses and as likely to remain there till the war was over and now here you are the marshal will be delighted he cannot be more pleased than i am to be back again lindsay is he alone yes come in at once i won't announce you he opened the door a gentleman to see you marshal he said and fergus walked in the marshal recognized him at once and holding out both hands shook those of fergus cordially i am indeed glad to see you he said we knew that you were unhurt for on the morning after the battle we sent in a parliament here to brown with a list of prisoners taken and received his list in return and as your name was among them and that you were not put down as wounded my anxiety about you was relieved we tried a month later to get exchanges but they would not hear of it in the first place there is no doubt that the king's action in incorporating the saxons with our army has caused a strong feeling against him and in the second they had plenty of fortresses in which to stow their prisoners while they would calculate that the more prisoners we had to look after the fewer men they would have to fight and now tell me by what miracle you have got here i have nothing particular to do lindsay you may as well stop and hear the story tell the sergeant to call you out if anyone in particular comes to everyone else i am engaged or stay he broke off they have just told me that luncheon is ready in the next room a story is always better told over a bottle of wine so tell the sergeant lindsay that for the next hour i can see no one unless it is on a very particular business now in the first place captain drummond oh of course you have not heard he broke off in answer to fergus's look of surprise the king and i watched you charge through that austrian squadron and when he saw you reach our cavalry in safety and they turned to come back he ordered me at once to make out your commission as captain i ventured to object that you were very young and he said you had saved half his cavalry and that he would promote you if you were in infinite arms it is really absurd marshal i shall feel downright ashamed to be called captain by men still lieutenants though a dozen years older than i am i fear i have gone over lindsay's head you need not mind me drummond lindsay laughed i shall have a chance one of these days but not a soul will grudge you your promotion there were many of us who saw the you charge and i can tell you that it was the talk of the whole army and it was thoroughly recognized that it saved the cavalry for their commander would certainly have taken them against the austrians and if he had it is equally certain that none of them would have got back again and when your name appeared in orders the next day we all felt that no one ever better than deserved promotion the king inquired especially as soon as the list came whether you were wounded fergus keith said and was very much pleased when he heard that you were not now let us hear how you come to be here the marshal laughed heartily when fergus told of the escape in the disguise of an austrian field officer it was most admirably managed fergus he said when the tale was finished and your making for vienna instead of for the frontier was a masterly stroke of course your finding a friend there was most fortunate but even had you not done so i have no doubt you would have got through somehow i think the best idea of all was you taking the post horses 
and then getting a fresh suit of clothes from the postmaster. I am glad you ordered the major's suit of clothes to be sent back to him. I should have liked to have seen his face when he found that not only his uniform, but his prisoner had disappeared. It will be a good story to tell the king. He has sore troubles enough on his shoulders, for the difficulties are thickening round, and although Frederick is a born general, he really loves peace and quiet and books, and the society of a few friends, far better than the turmoil into which we are plunged. The French are going to open their campaign in the spring with an army of a hundred thousand men. Russia will invade the east frontier with certainly as many more, perhaps a hundred and fifty thousand. They say these rascally Swedes, who have not a shadow of quarrel against us, intend to land fifty thousand men in Pomerania, and that Austria will put two hundred and fifty thousand in the field. Even tempered and self-relying as the king is, all this is enough to drive him to despair. And anything that will interest him for an hour and make him forget his difficulties is very welcome. The marshal asked many questions, for, as he said, the king would like to know all the ins and outs of the matter, and he knew that Fergus would much rather than the story should be told the king by another than that he should be called upon to do so. I hope the horse came back safely, Lindsay, Fergus asked as they left the marshal's apartments. Oh, yes, he went back with the convoy of wounded, and he is now safe in Keith's stables. The other is, of course, at the courts, and I sent you things back at the same time, and when we returned here, I packed everything up and sewed them in a sack. They are all in the storeroom. What has become of Carl? Did he get safely back? Yes, but he had a nasty saber wound he got in the charge, and he was in the hospital for six weeks. The king gave him a handsome present on the day after he came in, and would have given him a commission if he would have taken it, but he declined altercating, saying that he was very comfortable as he was. His colonel would have made him a sergeant at once, but he refused that also. At present, he is still looking after your horse and helping generally in Keith's stable. His wound was on the head, and he is scarcely fit for duty with his regiment, so of course he will now fall to his place with you again. Fergus went down to the stable where he received with the greatest delight by Carl, whose pride in his master was great after his exploit at Count Eulenfurt's and had been heightened by the feeling excited in the army at his having saved the cavalry from destruction. I thought that you would be back by the spring, Captain, he said. Donald and I have talked it over many a time, and we were of one mind that if anyone can get away from an Austrian prison, you would do it. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of With Frederick the Great, A Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Prague. The next morning, Fergus rode over to see Count Eulen first, found him quite restored to health. Fergus was received by the Count, the Countess, and Thurza with great pleasure. My return in safety is in no small degree due to you, Count. Had it not been for the letter to Count Platon, with which the Countess furnished me, I doubt whether I should have been able to get through, or at any rate, if I had done so, it could only have been with many hardships and dangers and certainly great delay. I have no doubt that the help you received from the Count was of considerable assistance to you, and lessened your difficulties much captain drummond but i am sure you would have managed without it had you formed any plans as to what you would have done had you found him absent i had thought of several things count but i had settled on nothing i should have remained but a day in vienna and should have exchanged the suit i had got from the innkeeper for some other my idea was that i had best join one of the convoys of provisions going up to bohemia 
I calculated that I should have no difficulty in obtaining a place as a driver, for of course the service was not popular, and any of the men would have been glad enough for me to take his place. I might thus have got forward as far as Prague. After that I must have taken my chance, and I thought I could, in the same sort of way, have got as far as Leitmaris but there I might have been detained for a long time until there was an opportunity of crossing the defiles. It would have been difficult, indeed, for me to have earned my living there, and what was left of the money I had after paying for the landlord's suit would scarcely have lasted with the closest pinching till spring. You would have managed it somehow, I am sure, Thursa said confidently after getting out of that strong fortress it would be nothing to get out of bohemia into saxony we have not congratulated you yet the countess said upon your last promotion lieutenant lindsay came over to tell us about it and how you had gained it of course we were greatly pleased although grieved to hear that you had been made a prisoner we wondered whether at the time you were captured you had any of the letters i had written with you and whether they would come in useful it did not even occur to me that you would have called upon clout platern my cousin i thought that you might be detained at prague but vienna is the last place where we should have pictured you had we known that you had been sent to spielberg i think we should have given up all hope of seeing you again until you were exchanged for I have heard that it is one of the strongest of Austrian fortresses. I do hope, Captain Drummond, that we shall see a great deal of you this winter. There will not be many gaieties, though no doubt there will be some state balls, but there will be many little gatherings, as usual, among ourselves, and we shall count upon you to attend them always, unless you are detained on service. We learn that it is probable your king will pass the whole of the winter here. We will send your horse down to you today, the Count said. You will find him in good condition. He has been regularly exercised. Thank you very much, Count. I wrote to you before I started, but I have had no opportunity of thanking you personally for those splendid animals. Sorry as I was to lose the horse, I rode at Lobosits. I congratulated myself that I was not riding one of yours. I should have had no difficulty in replacing him, Captain Drummond, the Count said with a smile. The least we can do is to keep you in horse flesh while the war lasts, which I hope will not be very long, for surely your king can never hope to make head against the forces that will assail him in the spring, but will be glad to make peace on any terms. No doubt he would be glad to, Count, but as his enemies propose to divide his dominions among them, it is not very clear what terms he could make. But though I would grant that on paper the odds against him is enormous, I think that you will see there will be some hard fighting yet before Prussia is partitioned. Perhaps so, the Count replied, but surely the end must be the same. You know, I have been a strong opponent of the course taken by the court here saxony and prussia as protestant countries should be natural allies and i consider it is infamous that the court or rather brule who is all-powerful should have joined in a coalition against frederick who had given us no cause of complaint whatever my sympathies then are wholly with him but i can see no hope whatever of his successfully resisting this tremendous combination Various things might happen, Count. The empresses of Russia or Austria or the Pompadour might die, or the Allies might quarrel between themselves. England may find some capable statesmen who will once again get an army together and, joined perhaps by the Netherlands, give France so much to do that she will not be able to give much help to her allies. Yes, all these things might happen, but Frederick's first campaign has been to a great extent a failure it is true that he has established saxony as his base but the saxon troops will be of no advantage to him 
he would have acted much more wisely had he on their surrender allowed them to disband and go to their homes many then might have enlisted voluntarily the country would not have had a legitimate grievance and the common religious tie would soon have turned the scale in favor of prussia who as all see has been driven to this invasion by our court's intrigues with austria had he done this he could have marched straight to prague have overrun all bohemia established his headquarters there and menaced vienna itself in the spring looking at it coolly that might have been the best way count but a man who finds that three or four of his neighbors have entered into a plot to attack his house and seize all his goods may be pardoned if he does not at first go the very wisest way to work the count laughed i hope that the next campaign will turn out differently but i own that i can scarcely see a possibility of prussia alone making head against the dangers that surround her the winter passed quietly there were fates state balls and many private entertainments for while all europe was indignant or pretended to be so at the occupation of saxony the people of that country were by no means so angry on their own account they were no more heavily taxed by frederick than they were by their own court and now that the published treaty between the confederates had made it evident that the country without its own consent had been deeply engaged in a conspiracy hostile to prussia none could deny that frederick was amply justified in the steps he had taken at these parties only prussian officers who were personal friends of the host were invited but fergus who had been introduced by count eulenfurst to all his acquaintances was always asked and was requested to bring with him a few of his personal friends Lindsay, therefore, was generally his companion, and was, indeed, in a short time invited for his own sake, for the Scottish officers were regarded in a different light to the Prussians, and their pleasant manners and frank gaiety made them general favorites. Their duties as aide-de-camps was now light, indeed, although both were two or three times sent with dispatches to Berlin, and even to more distant parts of Prussia, where preparations for the coming campaign were being made on a great scale. The whole Prussian population was united. It was a war not for conquest, but for existence, and all classes responded carefully, cheerfully to the royal demands. These were confined to orders for drafts, of men for no new tax of any kind was laid on the people the expenses of the war being met entirely from the from the treasure that had since the termination of the silesian war being steadily accumulated a fixed sum being laid by every year to meet any emergency that might arise towards spring both parties were ready to take the field the Allies had 430,000 men ready for service. Frederick had 150,000 well-trained soldiers, while 40,000 newly raised troops were posted in fortresses at points most open to invasion. The odds were indeed sufficient to appall even the steadfast heart of Frederick of Prussia, but no one would have judged from the calm and tranquil manner in which the king made his arrangements to meet the storm that he had any doubt as to the issue man for man the prussian soldier of the time was the finest in the world he was splendidly drilled absolutely obedient to orders and filled with implicit confidence in his king and his comrades he had been taught to march with extraordinary rapidity and at the same time to maneuver with the regularity and perfection of a machine and could be trusted in all emergencies to do everything that man was capable of the french army a hundred and ten thousand strong was the first to move another thirty thousand men were preparing to march to join the army that had been got up by that mixed body the german federation the main force was to move through hanover to oppose them was a mixed army, maintained by British money, comprising Hanoverians, Brunswickers, and Hessians. 
some fifty thousand strong, commanded by the Duke of Cumberland. With these were some five thousand Prussians, who had, by Frederick's orders, evacuated the frontier fortresses and joined what was called the British Army of Observation. Frederick prepared for the present to deal with the Austrians, intending, if successful against them, to send off 25,000 men to strengthen Cumberland's army. The proposed Swedish invasion was altogether disregarded, but 30,000 men, principally militia, were posted to check the Russian invasion. So quiet had been the preparations that none of their enemies dreamt that the Prussians could assume the offensive but considered that they would confine their efforts to defending the defiles into saxony and silesia but this was not frederick's idea as spring approached he had been busy redistributing his troops from their winter cantonment and preparing three armies for the invasion of bohemia april had been a busy month for the staff and the aides de camp had passed their days and even their nights on horseback at last all was in readiness for the delivery of the stroke and on the twentieth the king started from Lockwich, facing the old saxon camp of perna the duke of bevern from Luisitz, and marshal schwerin from silesian and without the slightest warning the three gay columns poured down into bohemia the movement took the austrians absolutely by surprise not dreaming of such a step on frederick's part they had prepared near the frontier vast magazines for the supply of their advancing army. These had to be abandoned in the greatest haste, and a sufficient amount of food to supply the entire army for three months fell into the hands of the Prussians. Marshal Brown and General Konigsek, who commanded the Austrian armies in Bohemia, fell back to Prague with the greatest speed that they could make. The light, irregular corps that Frederick had raised during the winter and placed under experienced and energetic officers pervaded the whole country, capturing magazines and towns, putting some to ransom, dispersing small bodies of the enemy, and spreading terror far and wide. Brown succeeded in reaching Prague before the king can come up to see him. Bourbon, however, overtook Konigsek and greatly hastened his retreat killing a thousand men and taking five hundred prisoners, after which Konigsek reached Prague without further molestation, the Duke of Brevin joining Sherwin's column. The Austrians retired through Prague and encamped on high ground on the south side of the city, Prince Karl being now in command of the whole. Had this prince be possessed of military talents or listened to Marshal Brown's advice, instead of taking up a defensive position, he would have marched with his whole army against the king, whose force he would very greatly have outnumbered. But instead of doing so, he remained inactive. On the 2nd of May, twelve days after moving from Saxony, Frederick arrived within sight of Prague. So closely had he followed the retreating Austrians that he occupied that evening a monastery at which Prince Karl and Marshal Brown had slept the night before. Thirty thousand men, who were now under the command of Marshal Keith, were left to watch Prague and its garrison, while Frederick, on Tuesday, searched for a spot where he could cross the river and effect a junction with Sherwin. He knew his position and had arranged that three cannon shots were to be the signal that the river had been crossed. A platoon bridge was rapidly thrown over. The signal was given, and the Prussians poured across it, and before the whole were over, Sherwin's light cavalry came up, and an arrangement was made that the two forces should meet at six o'clock next morning at a spot within two miles of the Austrian camp, on the Liska Hills. Battle of Prague At this time, the Austrians showed inactive and permitted the Prussian columns to join hands without the slightest attempt to interfere with them. Had Brown been in command, very different steps would have been taken. 
but prince karl was indolent self-confident and opinionated and had set his army to work to strengthen its position in every possible manner this was naturally extremely strong its right flank being covered by swampy ground formed by a chain of ponds from which the water was let off in the winter and the ground sown with oats these were now a brilliant green and to the eyes of frederick and his generals surveying them from the distance he had the aspect of ordinary meadow the whole ground was commanded by redoubts and batteries on the hill which rose precipitously seven or eight hundred feet beyond the position in the batteries were sixty heavy cannon while there were in addition one hundred and fifty field guns well might prince karl think his position altogether unassailable and believe that if the prussians were mad enough to attack they would be destroyed frederick and schwerwin spent much time in surveying the position and agreed that on two sides the austrian position was absolutely impregnable but that on the right flank attack was possible sherwin would fain have waited until the next morning since his troops were fatigued by their long marches and had been on foot since midnight the austrians however were expecting a reinforcement of thirty thousand men under dawn to join them hourly and the king therefore decided on an attack the terrible obstacles presented by the swamps being altogether unnoticed with incredible speed the prussians moved away to their left and by eleven o'clock were in readiness to attack the right flank of the austrian position brown however was in command here and as soon as the intention of the prussians was perceived he swung back the right wing of the army at right angles to its original position so that he presented a front to the prussian attack massing thickly at sturbold a village at the edge of the swamps rapidly the whole of the artillery and cavalry were formed up on this face and quick as had been the advance of the russians the austrians were perfectly ready to meet them led by general winterfield the prussians rushed forward but as they advanced a terrific artillery fire was opened upon them winterfeld was wounded severely and the troops fell back the main body now advanced under schwerwin and the whole again pressed forward in spite of the incessant rain of grape and case shot the prussians advanced until they reached the pleasant green meadows they had seen in the distance then the real nature of the ground was at once disclosed the troops sunk to the knees and in many cases to the waist in the treacherous mud soldiers less valiant and less disciplined would have shrunk appalled at the obstacle but the prussians struggled on dragging themselves forward with the greatest difficulty through mud through slush through a rain of grape from upwards of two hundred cannon and through a storm of musketry fire from the infantry regiment after regiment as it reached the edge of the dismal swamp plunged in unhesitantly crawling and struggling onward never in the annals of warfare was there a more terrible fight for three hours it continued without a moment's interval thousands of the assailants had fallen and their bodies had been trodden deep into the swamp as their comrades pressed after them sometimes a regiment struggled back out of the mire thinking it beyond mortal power to win victory under such terms but the next moment they reformed and flung themselves into the fight again schwerwin seeing the regiment named after him recoil placed himself at their head and shouting follow me my sons led them till he fell dead struck by five grape shots the austrians fought as stoutly marshal brown leading them till a cannonball took off his foot and he was carried into prague to die there six weeks later while this terrible struggle was going on the prussian cavalry had made a very wide circuit around the ponds and lakelets and charged the austrian horse on brown's extreme right the first lines were broken by it but so many and strong were they that the prussians were brought to a standstill 
then they drew back and charged the second and a third time the austrians gave way prince Karl himself brave if incapable did his best to rally them but in vain and at last they fled in a headlong rout pursued for many miles by zithen's horsemen still the infantry struggle was maintained at last the prussian right wing hitherto not engaged though suffering from the artillery fire on the heights had their turn general manstein discovered that at the angle where brown threw back the right wing of the army to face the prussians there was a gap the troops there had gradually pressed more to their right to take part in the tremendous conflict and the elbow was therefore defended only by a half moon battery through the fish tanks he led the way followed by princes henry and ferdinand the whole division struggled through the mud drove back the austrians hastily brought up to oppose them captured the battery and poured into the gap thereby cutting the austrian army in two and taking both halves in flank this was the deciding point of the battle the austrians right already holding its own with difficulty was crumpled up and forced to fall back hastily the other half of the army isolated by the eruption threw itself back and endeavored to make a fresh stand at spots defended by batteries and stockades but all was in vain the prussians pressed forward exultingly the fresh troops leading the way in spite of the confusion occasioned by the loss of their commanders and of the surprise caused by the sudden break-up of their line by the inrush of manstein and the princes the austrians fought stoutly four times they made a stand but the prussians were not to be denied the austrian guns that had been captured were turned against them and at last giving way they fled for Prague, where some forty thousand of them rushed for shelter while fifteen thousand fled up the valley of the Moldau. had it not been that an accident upset frederick's calculations the greater portion of the austrians would have been obliged to lay down their arms prince maurice of dessau had been ordered to move with the right wing of keith's army fifteen thousand strong to take up a position in the austrian rear this position he should have reached hours before but in his passage down a narrow lane some of the pontoons for bridging the river were injured when the bridge was put together it proved too short to reach the opposite bank the cavalry in vain endeavored to swim the river the stream was too strong and frederick's masterly combination broke down and the bulk of the austrians instead of being forced to surrender were simply shut up in prague with its garrison the battle of prague was one of the fiercest ever fought the austrian army had improved wonderfully since the silesian war their artillery was especially good their infantry had adopted many of the prussian improvements and had brown been in sole command and had he escaped unwounded the issue of the day might have been changed the prussians lost twelve thousand five hundred men killed and wounded the austrians including prisoners thirteen thousand three hundred frederick himself put the losses higher estimating that of the austrians at twenty four thousand of whom five thousand were prisoners that of the prussians at eighteen thousand without counting marshal schwerwin who alone was worth about ten thousand it is evident that the king's estimate of the loss of the austrians must have been excessive they had the advantage of standing on the defensive the prussian guns did but comparatively little service while their own strong batteries played with tremendous effect upon the prussians struggling waist deep in the mud there can therefore be little doubt that the latter must have suffered in killed and wounded a much heavier loss than the austrians impassive as he was and accustomed to show his feelings but little frederick was deeply affected at the loss of his trusted general and of the splendid soldiers who had been so long and carefully trained and even had prague fallen 
the victory would have been a disastrous one for them for threatened as he was by overwhelming forces the loss of five thousand men to him was quite as serious as that of twenty thousand men to the confederates in keith's army there had been considerable disappointment when it became known that they were to remain impassive spectators of the struggle and that while their comrades were fighting they had simply to blockade the northern side of the city you will have plenty of opportunities the marshal said quietly to his aide de camp on seeing their downcast looks this war is but beginning it will be our turn next for it is a great task the king has set himself in attempting to carry the strong position that the austrians have taken up and he will not do it without very heavy loss to-morrow you may have reason to congratulate yourself that we have had no share in the business nevertheless as the day went on and the tremendous roar of battle rolled down upon them terrible continuous and never ceasing for three hours even keith walked in a state of feverish anxiety backwards and forwards in front of his tents while the troops stood in groups talking in low turns and trying to pierce with their eyes the dun-coloured cloud of smoke that hung over the combatants on the other side of prague when at last the din of battle went rolling down towards that city the feeling of joy was intense in many the relief from the tension and the long excitement was so great that they burst into tears some shook hands with each other others threw their caps into the air and then a few voices burst into the well-known verse of the church hymn non danket ali gott mit herzon mund und hasenden of which our english translation runs now thank we all our god with hands and hearts and voices and in a moment it was taken up by thirty thousand deep voices in a solemn chorus the regimental bands at once joining in the jubilant thanksgiving pious men were these honest protestant hard-fighting soldiers and very frequently on their long marches they beguiled the way by the stirring hymns of the church keith and those around him stood bareheaded as the hymn was sung and not a word was spoken from some time after the strains had subsided that is good to listen to keith said breaking the silence we have often heard the psalm singing of cromwell's ironside spoken of with something like contempt but we can understand now how men who sing like that with all their hearts should be almost invincible it is the grandest thing that i have ever heard marshal fergus said of course i have heard them when they were marching but it did not sound like this no fergus it was the appropriateness of the occasion and perhaps the depth of the feelings of the men and our own sense of immense relief that made it so striking listen there is a fresh outburst of firing the austrians have fallen back but they are fighting stoutly the chief effect of this great battle was of a moral rather than a material kind prague was not a strong place but with a garrison of fifty thousand men it was too well defended to assault and until it was taken frederick could not march on as he had intended and leave so great a force in the rear the moral effect was however enormous the allies had deemed that they had a ridiculously easy task before them and that frederick would have to retreat before their advancing armies and must at last see that there was nothing but surrender before him that he should have emerged from behind the shelter of the saxon hills and have shattered the most formidable army of those that threatened him on ground of their own choosing entrenched and fortified caused a feeling of consternation and dismay the french army the russians and the united force of the french with the german confederacy were all arrested on their march and a month elapsed before they were again set in motion marshal duan who had arrived at erdweiss 
fell back at once when the news reached him and taking post at the entrance of the defile he made the greatest effort to increase his army reinforcements were sent to him from vienna and all the adjacent country the duke of Veverin was posted with twenty thousand men to watch him and frederick sat down with all his forces to capture prague the siege train was hurried up from dresden and on the ninth of may his batteries on the south side of the city and those of keith on the north opened fire on the city for a month missiles were poured into the town magazines were blown up and terrible destruction done but the garrison held out firmly at times they made sorties but these were always driven in again with much loss but fifty thousand men behind fortifications however weak were not to be attacked every approach to the city was closely guarded but it became at last evident that as long as the provisions held out prague was not to be taken the cannonade became less incessant and after a month almost died away for dawn had by this time gathered a large army and it was evident that another great battle would have to be fought if this was won by the prussians prague would be forced to surrender if not the city was saved it was not until the twelfth of june that dawn a cautious and careful general in accordance with urgent orders from vienna prepared to advance his force had now grown to sixty thousand forty thousand of the garrison of prague could be spared to issue out to help him frederick had under seventy thousand and of these a great portion must be reigned to guard their siege works thus then all the advantages lay with the relieving army several officers in disguise were dispatched by dawn to carry into prague the news of his advance and to warn prince karl to sally out with the whole of his force and fall upon the prussians as soon as he attacked them in the rear so vigilant however were the besiegers that none of these messages succeeded in entering prague on the thirteenth frederick set out with ten thousand men to be followed by four thousand more under prince maurice two days later these being all that could be spared from the siege works to join beveren who had fallen back as dawn advanced the junction effected frederick joined beveren and approached dawn who was posted in a strong position near colin thirty-five miles from prague on the seventeenth prince maurice arrived and after several changes of position the armies faced each other on the eighteenth within a short distance of colon dawn's new position was also a strong one and was in fact only to be assailed on its right and the prussian army was moved in that direction their order being to pay no attention to the austrian batteries or musketry fire but to march steadily to the spot indicated this was done zeithen dashed with his hussars upon the austrian cavalry drawn up to bar the way defeated them and drove them far from the field while holson's division of infantry carried the village of Prisa on the austrian flank in spite of the austrian batteries so far frederick's combination had worked admirably holson then attacked a wood behind it strongly held by the austrians here a struggle commenced which lasted the whole day the wood being several times taken and lost he was not supported owing to a mistake that entirely upset frederick's plan of battle while three miles away from the point where the attack was to be delivered manstein whose quickness of inspiration had largely contributed to the victory of prague now ruined redrick's plan by his impetuosity the cornfields through which his division was marching towards the assault of the austrian left was full of croats who kept up so galling a fire that losing all patience he turned and attacked them the regiment to which he gave the order cleared the croats off but these returned strongly reinforced the regiment coming behind 
supposing that French orders had arrived, also turned off, and in a short time the whole division, whose support was so sorely needed by Holson, was assaulting the almost impregnable Austrian position in front. Another mistake, this time arising from a misconception of a too brief and positive order given by Frederick himself, led Prince Maurice, who commanded the Prussian center, to hurl himself in like manner against the Austrians. For four hours the battle raged. In spite of their disadvantages, the Prussians fought so desperately that Dawn believed the day to be lost and sent orders to the troops to retreat to Suchdat. But the commander of the Saxon cavalry considered the order premature, and gathering a large body of Austrian infantry, charged with them and his own cavalry so furiously upon the Holson that the latter was forced to retreat. The movement spread, the attack slackened, and the other division moved down the hill. They had all but won. Frederick in vain tried to rally and lead them afresh to the attack. They had done all that men could do, and the battle ceased. Dawn scarcely attempted to pursue, and the Prussians marched away unmolested even by cavalry. Some of the regiments remaining firm in their position until nightfall, repulsing with great loss the one attempt of the Austrians at pursuit. And Zeithen's cavalry did not draw off till ten at night. The Austrians had 60,000 men in the field, of whom they lost, in killed and wounded, 8,114. The Prussians, who began the day with 35,000 strong, lost 13,773, of whom the prisoners, including all the wounded, amounted to 5380. The news of the disaster, and with it Frederick's order to prepare to raise the siege of Prague at once, came like a thunderclap upon the Russian camp. Frederick himself and the remnant of his army arrived there in good order with all their baggage train a day later. The cannon was removed from the batteries. The magazines emptied and in no good order, and without any attempt on the part of the Austrian garrison to molest them, the Prussian army marched away and took their postings at Leitmeritz. The news that an Austrian army had at last beaten Frederick and that Prague was saved caused an exultation and joy among the Allies, equal to the dismay that had been roused by the defeat at Prague. Although there was nothing remarkable or worth much congratulation in the fact that an army in an almost impregnable position had repulsed the attack of another of little over half its strength. End of chapter 8「9 of with frederick the great a story of the seven years war by g a henty this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. chapter nine in disguise leitmeritz lying as it did but a short distance beyond the mouth of the defiles leading into saxony was an admirably chosen position Supplies for the army could be brought up by the elf, and a retreat was assured, should an overwhelming force advance to the attack, while from this spot Frederick could march at once either to the defense of Silesia or to check an enemy approaching from the west towards the defiles through the mountains. The news of the defeat at Kolin set all the enemies of Prussia in movement. The Russian army entered East Prussia, where there was no adequate force to oppose it. The Swedes issued from Stalzund. The French pressed hard upon the so-called British column of observation and forced the Duke of Cumberland to retreat before them. Another French army, in conjunction with that of the German Confederacy, threatened the western passes into Saxony. As yet, it was impossible to say where Marshal Don and Prince Karl would deliver their blow, and great efforts were made to fill up the terrible gaps created 
at Prague and Kolin. In the regiments most hotly engaged with fresh troops, who were speedily rendered by incessant drills and discipline, fit to take their places in the ranks with the veterans. The king was lodged in a cathedral close to the city. Keith, with his division, occupied the other side of the river, across which a bridge was at once thrown. Prince Maurice and Bevern had gone to Bunslaw at the junction of the Iser and Elbe, but when, upon a crowd of light Austrian horses approaching, the prince sent to the king to ask whether he should retreat. He was at once recalled, and the prince of Russia appointed in his stead. On the 2nd of July came news which, on top of his other troubles, almost prostrated Frederick. This was of the death of his mother, to whom he was most fondly attached. He retired from public view for some days, for although he was as iron in the hour of battle, he was a man of very sensitive disposition and fondly attached to his family. His chief confidant during this sad time was the English ambassador, Mitchell, a bluff, shrewd, haughty man for whom the king had conceived a close friendship. He had accompanied Frederick, from the time he left Berlin, had not even been near him on the battlefield, and it was in no small degree due to his dispatches and correspondence that we have obtained so close a view of Frederick, the man as distinct from Frederick the King and General. The Prince of Prussia, however, did no better than Prince Maurice. The main Austrian army, after much hesitation, at last crossed the Elbe and moved against him, thinking doubtless that he was a less formidable antagonist than the king. The prince fell back, but in such hesitating and blundering fashion that he allowed the Austrians to get between him and his base, the town of Zittor, where his magazines had been established. Zittor stood at the foot of the mountain and was a Saxon town. The Austrians had come to deliver Saxony, and they began the work by firing red-hot balls into Zittor, thereby laying the whole town in ashes, rendering 10,000 people homeless, and doing no injury whatever to the Prussian garrison or magazines. The heat, however, from the ruins was so terrible that the five battalions in garrison there were unable to support it, and evacuating the town joined the prince's army, which immediately retired to Bautzen on the other side of the mountains, leaving the defiles to Saxony and Silesia both unguarded. As messenger after messenger arrived at Lietberitz with reports of the movements of the troops, the astonishment and indignation of Frederick rose higher and higher. The whole fruits of the campaign were lost by this astounding succession of blunders, and on Hearing that Zittau had been destroyed and that the army had arrived at Bautzen in the condition of a beaten and disheartened force, he had once started with the bulk of the army by the Elbe passes for that town, leaving Moraes of Dessau with 10,000 men to secure the passes and Keith to follow more slowly with the baggage train and magazines. On his arrival at Bautzen, Frederick refused to speak to his brother, but sent him a message saying that he deserved to be brought before a court-martial, which would sentence him and all his generals to death, but that he should not carry the matter so far, being unable to forget that the chief offender was his brother. The prince resigned his command, and the king, in answer to his letter to that effect, said that in the situation created by him, nothing was left but to try the last extremity i must go and give battle he wrote and if we cannot conquer we must all of us get ourselves killed frederick indeed as his letters show had fully made up his mind that he would die in battle rather than live beaten the animosity of his enemies was to a large extent personal to himself and he believed that they would after his death be inclined to give better terms to Prussia than they would even grant while he lived. For three weeks the king vainly tried to get the Austrians to give battle, 
but Prince Karl and Dorn remained on the hill from which they had bombarded Zittau, and which they had now strongly fortified. The barbarous and most useless bombardment of Zittau had done their cause harm, for it roused a fierce cry of indignation throughout Europe, even among their allies, excited public feeling in England to the highest point in favor of Frederick, and created a strong feeling of hostility to the Austrians throughout Saxony. As soon as Keith and the wagon train arrived, bringing up the Prussian strength to 56,000, the king started on the 15th August, 1757, for Bernstadt and then to the stupefaction of the austrians who had believed that they had either saxony or silesia at their mercy whenever they could take up their mind which ought first to be gobbled up so rapidly did the prussian cavalry push forward that generals beck and audacity were both so taken by surprise that they had to ride for their lives, leaving baggage, coaches, horses, and all their belongings behind them. On the 16th, Frederick with the army marched and offered battle to the Austrians, but although so superior in numbers, they refused to be beguiled from their fortified hill. At last, after tempting them in vain, Frederick was forced to abandon the attempt and return to Taxony, bitterly disappointed. He had wanted, above all things, to finish with the Austrians so as to be able to move off to the other points threatened. He now arranged that Bevern and Winterfield should take the command in his absence, watch the Austrians, and guard Silesia, while he, with his 23,000 men, marched on the 31st of August from Dresden with the intention of attacking the combined French and German Confederacy force under Soubise. They had already reached Erfurt. Keith accompanied the king on his harassing march. Since the arrival of the army at Leitmeritz, Fergus had been incessantly engaged in carrying dispatches between that town and Dresden, and worked even harder while the king was trying, but in vain, to bring about an engagement with the Austrians. For the first few days after starting for Erfurt, he had a comparatively quiet time. The marshal was now constantly the king's companion, his cheerful and buoyant temperature being invaluable to Frederick in this time of terrible anxiety. Fergus would have found it dull work had it not been for the companionship of Lindsay, who was always light-hearted and ready to make the best of anything. I would rather be an aide-de-camp than a general at present, Drummond, he said one day. Thank goodness we get our orders and have to carry them out, and leave all the thinking to be done by others. Never was there such a mess as this. Here we are in October, and we are very much as we were when we began to march. Yes, except that all our enemies are drawing closer to us. They are closer, certainly, but none of them would seem to know what he wants to do. And as for fighting, it is, of all things, that which they most avoid. We have been trying for the last two months for a fight with the Austrians and cannot get one. Now we are off to Erfurt, and I will wager a month's pay that the French will retire as soon as we approach, and we shall have all this long tramp for nothing, and will have to hurry back again as fast as we came. It is unfortunate that we had to come, Lindsay. Things always seem to go badly when the king himself is not present. The princes make blunder after blunder, and I have no faith in Beverly. No, Lindsay agreed, but he has Winterfield with him. Yes, he is a splendid fellow, Drummond said, but everyone knows that he and Beverham do not get on well together, and that the Duke would very much rather that Winterfield was not with him, and with two men like that, the one slow and cautious, the other quick and daring, there are sure to be disagreements. We are going to attack a force more than twice our own strength, but I am much more certain as to what will be the result than I am that we shall find matters unchanged when we get back there. The foreboding was very quickly confirmed. A day or two later came the news that the Austrians had suddenly attacked an advanced position called the Jacobsburg, 
where winterfield who commanded the van of bevan's army had posted two thousand grenadiers prince karl undertook the operation by no means willingly but the indignation at vienna and his long delays had resulted in imperative orders being sent to him to fight nadasti was to lead the attack with fifteen thousand men while the main army remained a short distance behind, ready to move up should a general battle be brought on. The march was made at night, and at daybreak a thousand croats and forty companies of regular infantry rushed up the hill. Although taken by surprise, the Prussians promptly formed and drove them down again. Winterfield was some miles behind, having been escorting an important convoy, and rode at a gallop to the spot. As soon as he heard the sound of cannon, and brought up two regiments at a run, just as the grenadiers were retiring from the hill, unable to withstand the masses hurled against them. Sending urgent messages to Bevern to hurry up reinforcements, Winterfield led his two regiments forward, joining the grenadiers, and rushing eagerly up the hill, regained the position. But the Austrians were not to be denied, and the fight was obstinately sustained on both sides. No reinforcements reached Winterfield, and after an hour's desperate fighting, he was struck in the breast by a musket ball and fell, mortally wounded. The Prussians drew off slowly and in good order at two o'clock in the afternoon, and soon afterwards the Austrians also retired. Nothing having come of this useless battle, save heavy loss to both sides, and the killing of one of Frederick's best and most trusted generals. It was not, however, without result for Bevern, freed from the restraint of his energetic colleague, and once fell back to Schlesen, where he was more comfortable near his magazines. Keith sent for Fergus on the evening when this bad news had arrived. I want you, lad, to undertake a dangerous service, now that Winterfield has been killed, the king is more anxious than ever as to the situation. It is enough to madden anyone. It is imperative that he should get to Erfurt and fight the French. On the other hand, everything may go wrong with Bevan while he is away, to say nothing of other troubles. Cumberland is retreating to the sea. The Russians are ever gaining ground in East Prussia. There is nothing now to prevent the remaining french army from marching on berlin and the swedes have issued from Stralsund. it may be that by this time subais has moved from erfurt and this is what above all things we want to know you showed so much shrewdness in your last adventure that i believe you might get through this safely doubtless there are cavalry parties far in advance of erfurt and these would have to be passed. The point is, when you undertake this mission, to go to Erfurt to ascertain the force there and, if possible, their intentions, and bring us back word. I shall be glad to try, Marshal, that there should be no difficulty about it. I shall, of course, go in disguise. I should not be likely to fall in with any of the enemy's cavalry patrols till within a short distance of Erfurt. But should I do so, there would be little chance of their catching me, mounted as I am. I can leave my horse within a short distance of the town. Two or three hours would be sufficient to gather news of the strength of the forces there and the movements of any bodies of detached troops. Yes, you should have no great difficulty about that. A large proportion of the population are favorable to us, and being so near the frontier of Hanover, your accent and theirs must be so close that no one would suspect you of being aught but a townsman. Of course, the great thing is speed. We shall march from 18 to 20 miles a day. You will be able to go 50. That is to say, if you start at once, you can be there in the morning, and on the following morning you can bring us back news. An hour later, Fergus, dressed as a small farmer, started. It was a main line of road, and therefore he was able to travel as fast at night as he would do in the day. There was the advantage, too, that the disparity between his attire and the appearance of the horse he rode would pass unnoticed in the darkness. He had with him a map of the road, 
on a large scale, and beneath his cloak he carried a small lantern so as to be able to make detours to avoid towns where detachments of the enemy's cavalry might be lying. He had started two hours after the troops halted, and had four hours of daylight still before him, which he made the most of, and by sunset he was within fifteen miles of Erfurt. So far he had not left the main road, but he now learned from some peasants that there was a small party of French hussars at a place three miles ahead. He therefore struck off by a by-road and, travelling slowly along, turned off two hours later to a farmhouse the lights from which had made him aware of its proximity he dismounted a hundred yards from it fastened his horse loosely to a fence and then went forward on foot and peeped in cautiously at the window it was well that he had taken the precaution for the kitchen into which he looked contained a dozen french hussars he retired at once, led his horse until he reached the road again, and then mounted. Presently he met a man driving a cart. My friend, he said, do you know of any place where a quiet man could put up, without running the risk of finding himself in the midst of these French and Confederacy troops? Tis not easy, the man replied, for they are all over the country, pillaging and plundering. We are heartily sick of them, and there are not a few of us who would be glad if the king of prussia would come and turn them out neck and crop i don't care what sort of place it is so that i could put my horse on it is a good one and like enough some of these fellows would take a fancy to it i don't think that it would be safe in any farmhouse within ten miles of here but if you like to come with me my hut stands at the edge of the wood and you can leave him there without much risk thank you very much that would suit me well it is just what i had intended to do but in the darkness i had no great chance of finding a wood how far are we from erfurt now about five miles that will do very well i have some business to do there and can go and come back by the afternoon in a quarter of an hour they arrived at the man's house and he says it was but a small place not much to rob here his host said grimly they have taken my two cows and all my poultry my horse only escaped because they did not think him fit for anything this is a stranger wife he went on as the woman rose in some alarm from the stool upon which she was crouching by the fire he will stop here for the night and though there is little enough to offer him at least we can make him welcome he took a torch from the corner of the room lighted it at the fire and went out you are right about your horse my friend he said and it is small chance you would have of taking him back with you if any of these fellows set eyes on him i see your salary hardly marches with your horse fergus had indeed before starting taken off his saddle and other military equipments and had replaced them with a common country saddle and bridle getting a pair of rough wallets and the commonest of horse clothes so as to disguise the animal as much as possible. I'm sorry that I cannot give you a feed for the animal, the man went on, but I have none, and my horse has to make shift of what he can pick up. I have one of my wallets full. I baited the horse at inns as I came along. He may as well have a feed before I take him out into the wood. He poured a good feed onto a flat stone, and as he did so, the peasant's horse lifted up his head and sniffed the air. You shall have some too, old boy, Fergus said, and going across was about to empty some of it on the ground before it, when its owner, taking off his head, held it out. Put it into this, he said. It is seldom indeed that he gets such a treat, and it would not that he should lose a grain. Fergus poured a bountiful feed into the hat. Now, he said, I can supplement your supper as well as your horses and from the other while he produced a cold leg of pork that carl had put in before he started together with three loaves and two bottles of wine carefully done up in straw the peasant looked astonished as fergus took these out and placed them upon the table no no sir he said we cannot take your food in that way you are hardly welcome to it fergus said 
if you do not assist me to eat it it will be wasted tomorrow i shall breakfast at Erfurt and maybe dine also i will start as soon as i get back well well sir it shall be as you please the man said but it seems to me that we are reversing our parts and that you have become the host and we are your guests it was a pleasant meal by the torchlight many a month has passed since the peasants had tasted meat and the bread fresh from prussian bakeries was of a very different quality to the black oat bread to which they were accustomed a horn of good wine completed their enjoyment when the meal was done the man said now master i will guide you to the wood there was no occasion to lead the horse for it as well as his companion had been trained to follow their masters like dogs and to come to a whistle the wood was but two or three hundred yards off and the peasant led the way through the trees to a small open space in its centre the saddle and bridle had been removed before they left the cottage and fergus tethered the horse by a foot rope to a sapling growing on the edge of the clearing then he patted it on the neck and left it beginning to crop the short grass it won't get much the peasant said for my animal keeps it pretty short but it is his best feeding place now and i generally turn him out here at night when the day's work is done what is its work principally there is only one sort now the man said i cut faggots in the forest take a cartload into euphrit twice a week i hope by the spring that all these troubles will be over and then i cultivate two or three acres of ground but so long as these french and the confederacy troops are about it is no use to think of growing anything now sir is there anything that i can do for you he went on after they returned to the cottage and had both lit their pipes and seated themselves by the fire i can see that you are not what you look a farmer does not ride about the country on a horse fit for a king or put up at a cottage like this yes you can help me by leading me by quiet paths to Erfurt. i tell you frankly that my business there is to find out how strong the french and confederacy army is in and around the town also whether they are taking any precautions against an attack and if there are any signs that they intend to enter hanover or to move toward dresden i dare say i can lay all that for you without difficulty for i supply several of the inns with faggots there are troops quartered in all of them and the helpers and servants are sure to hear what is going on not of course in the inns where the french are quartered but where the german men are lodged they speak plainly enough there and indeed everyone knows that a great many of them are there against their will the hess and gotha and dresau men would all prefer fighting on the prussian side but when they were called out they had to obey at what time will you start i should like to get to erfurt as soon as the place is astir that is by five the man said there is a trumpeting and a drumming enough by that time and no one could sleep longer if they wanted to then we should start at dawn the peasant would have given up his bed to fergus but the latter would not hear of it and said that he was quite accustomed to sleeping on the ground whereupon the peasant went out returned with a large handful of rushes which as he told fergus he had cut only the day before to mend the hole in the thatch fergus was well content for he knew well enough that he should sleep very much better on fresh rushes than he should in the peasant's bed place where he would probably be assailed by an army of fleas as soon as the man and his wife were astir in the morning fergus got up bathed his head and face in a tiny streamlet then ran within a few yards of the house then after cutting a bunch of bread to eat on their way the two started they did not come down upon the main road until within a mile and a half of the town and they then passed through a large village where a troop of french cavalry were engaged in grooming their horses they attracted no attention whatever and entered Urfurt at a quarter past five they separated when they got into town agreeing to meet in front of the cathedral at eleven o'clock fergus went to an eating place where he saw a party of French non-commissioned officers and soldiers seated. They were talking freely, confident that neither the landlord 
the man who was serving them nor the two or three germans present could understand them it was evident that they had very little confidence in subways one would think a sergeant said that we were going to change our nationality and to settle down here for life here we have some fifty thousand men and there is nothing to stop our going to dresden except some ten thousand or twelve thousand prussians they say that dawn has an army that can eat up frederick and it is certain that he could not spare a sergeant's guard to help by the way i cannot understand it comrades this leisurely way of making war may suit some people but it is not our way and we must admit that it is not the prussians way another said they are our enemies though why i am sure i don't know that is not our business but the way that they dash out and set the austrians dancing is really splendid i wish that our own generals had a little of fritz's energy and go there was a general murmur of assent here we are september beginning and next to nothing done now there would be enough to do if fritz could get away from dawn and dash off in this direction yes another said there would be plenty to do but i would not mind majoring that we should not wait for him and after all i am not sure if it would not be the best thing to do for these germans with us are little better than a rabble that is so francois but mixed up with us as they would be they would have to fight whether they liked it or not at any rate if we don't mean to fight what are we here for that i cannot say another laughs but i own i am not so eager to fight as you seem to be we are very comfortable we ride about the country we take pretty well what we like it is better than being in barracks at home while on the other hand it is no joke fighting these prussians the fights are not skirmishes they are battles it is not a question of a few hundred killed it is a question of ding dong fighting and of fifteen or twenty thousand killed on each side no joke that for my part i am quite content to take it easy at erfurt and to leave it to the austrians to settle matters with these obstinate fellows so they continued talking and fergus saw that so far no news whatever of frederick's march against erfurt had reached them he learned too that although there were some outlying bodies to the north the main bulk of the force lay in and around erfurt the contempt in which the french soldiers spoke of the german portion of the army was very great each little state had by the order of the council of the confederacy been compelled to furnish a contingent even if its representatives in the council had opposed the proposal therefore very many of the men had joined unwillingly while in other cases the french declared that the levy had been made up by hiring idlers and ne'er-do-wells in the towns so as to avoid having to put the conscription into force in the rural district the officers were declared to be as incapable as the men and had not been that an austrian contingent some five thousand strong had been joined with them and the drilling largely undertaken by the non-commissioned officers of this force nothing approaching order or discipline could have been maintained all the frenchmen lamented their fortune in having to act with such allies instead of being with the purely french army that was gradually pressing the duke of cumberland to the seaboard Fergus waited until the party had left the inn, when the landlord himself came across to hand him his reckoning. Bad times, master, he said, bad times, shaking his head ruefully. Yes, they are bad enough, landlord, but I should say that you must be doing a good trade with all these soldiers in town. A good trade? The landlord repeated. I am being ruined. Do you not know that, in addition to living a heavy contribution on the town they issued a regulation settling the price at which the troops were to be served at beer shops and inns breakfast and you saw what those fellows ate four pence a tumbler of wine one pence dinner five pence for well, each item cost me more than double that and as nobody brings in cattle for these might be seized on the way and no compensation given so meat gets dearer 
we are waiting until there is none to be had on any term and then we shall send representatives to the general to point out to him that it is absolutely impossible for us to obey the regulations ah these are terrible times we could not have suffered more than this had colbert joined frederick though they say that richelieu's french army is plundering even worse in hanover and the country behind it that Subais is doing here moreover one would rather be plundered by an enemy than by fellows who friend who pretend to come hither as friends if frederick would march in here i would open my house free to all comers and would not grudge the last drop of wine in my cellar there is never any saying fergus replied the king of prussia always appears when least expected and more unlikely things have happened that he should appear here some fine morning. As he was sallying out, a mounted officer dashed by at a headlong gallop. His horse flecked with foam, and it was evident that he had ridden far and fast on an important errand. Having nothing to do until he should meet the peasant, Fergus followed the officer at a leisurely pace, and in five minutes came up with the horse, held by a soldier at the entrance gate of a very large house sentries were pacing up and down in front of it and officers going in and out is that the headquarters of the french general he asked the townsman yes and the man walked on with a muttered malediction a few minutes later several mounted officers rode out and dashed off in haste in various directions there is evidently something up fergus said to himself perhaps they have got news of the prussian approach in a quarter of an hour several general officers arrived and entered the house it was evident that a council of war had been summoned half an hour elapsed and then a number of aides de camp and staff officers rode off in haste a few minutes later a trumpet sounded a regimental call and then the assembly before it had died away similar calls echoed from all parts of town soldiers ran hastily through the streets mounted officers dashed in every direction and the citizens came to their doors in surprise at this sudden movement fergus had no longer any doubt about the cause of the stir the great thing now was to ascertain whether the army would advance to take up some strong position outside the town and oppose the prussian advance or whether they would march away being fifty thousand in number the former would appear to be the natural course for a general to adopt as frederick had with him but twenty three thousand men of this fact however survives would be ignorant and might only have heard that the prussian army was marching to annihilate it before long baggage wagons began to clatter through the streets they were being driven westward and it was in the same direction that the regiments made their way fergus followed them to the plain outside the town the tents had already been struck the troops as they arrived from the town and camp were marshaled in order a long train of baggage wagons were already making their way westward and there was no longer any grounds for doubt that subides was retreating it was just eleven o'clock when fergus returned to the cathedral the peasant was awaiting him they all seemed on the move the latter said i have heard much about them it does not matter now fergus replied i must get back to your place as quickly as i can not a word was spoken until they had left the town they must be going up into hanover to join the french army there the peasant said they are running away frederick will be here tomorrow night or at any rate the next day the news seems too good to be true, master. How have you learnt it? I have learnt it from no one here. I am one of the king's officers, and I came out here to find out whether the enemy would be likely to come out and fight, or would bolt when they heard of his advance. The Lord be praised, the man said piously, taking off his hat as he spoke. I thought, sir, that there was something curious in your having such a horse, and still more so, in your wanting to find out all about the force of the enemy here but it was no business of mine and i felt that you must be a friend for 
Had you been Austrian or French, you would have ridden boldly into the town. As they went along the road, they were met by several troops of cavalry, riding at full speed. Is the way we came this morning the shortest? Yes, sir, by a good mile. Then we will return by it, said Fergus. As soon as they left the main road, they went at a run for some distance and then broke into a fast walk. In an hour from the time of leaving Erfurt, they arrived at the hut. I will run along and fetch your horse, sir, the peasant said. No, I will go myself. He does not know you, and he might refuse to let you come near him. In a few minutes, Fergus returned with his horse. The saddle, bridle, and wallets were quickly put on. Fergus dropped his pistols into his saddlebag, buckled on the sword he had brought with him. It was not his own, the one he had bought at starting, a good piece of steel but with a battered and rusty sheath that showed that it had been lying for weeks, possibly for months, on some field of battle before being picked up. Then, with a word of adieu and thanks to the peasant and his wife, and slipping a crown piece into the hand of the latter, he mounted and rode off. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of With Frederick the Great, A Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 10, Rossback. Fergus knew that there were several cavalry posts ahead and thought it likely that some of these might be left to give warning of the Prussian approach. He therefore rode across the country for some miles. He had begun to think that he must have gone beyond the limit of their outpost when he saw a hussar pacing across the line in front of him, his beat evidently being between two small woods three or four hundred yards apart. He checked his horse as he saw Fergus approaching. He was a good-tempered-looking fellow and nodded to Fergus, as much as to say that if he could speak his language, he would like a chat with him. The latter at once checked his horse and said good day in French. Ah, you speak our language, the soldier said. I am glad to exchange a word with someone. It is hot here, especially when one's time is up, and one ought to have been relieved an hour ago. Yes, I can understand that. I expect you have been forgotten. Well, it does not make... Much difference. I shall get off my next guard in consequence. You will have to wait some time before you are relieved if you stop here. What do you mean, the soldier asked. I mean that when I left Erfurt, your army was all moving west, and as I rode along, I met several troops of cavalry galloping to join them. That is strange news. Nothing whatever was known when I came out here. No, the news only arrived at Erfurt, this morning, that Frederick's army is win a day's march, and I saw the troops march out and the baggage wagons on their way before I started. I don't say that your troop may have gone. They may have stopped to form a post of observation. Well, at any rate, I shall go into the village and see. I ought to have been relieved an hour ago, and if they had such news as that and had remained there, they would have been sure to have sent to order all videttes to use vigilance. We have only been posted here as sort of a practice, for we did not think that there was an enemy within 150 miles. And now, if the news is true, we may have the Prussian cavalry coming along at any moment. Well, thank you for warning me, and turning his horse, he went off at a gallop. As the outposts would not have been set except by the party most in evidence, Fergus knew that there was now no more risk of falling in with the enemy unless a cavalry force had been sent forward to endeavor to get an idea of the force of the Prussians. But as the generals had so precipitately decided upon a retreat, it was not likely 
that they would have ordered any reconnaissance of this kind to be made. He therefore presently regained the main road and, riding fast, arrived at the place where the Prussians had pitched their camp, thirty miles from Erfurt, having made a twenty-mile march that day. He dismounted at the house where Keith had established his quarters. I have bad news for you, sir, he said. Word of your coming reached Erfurt at eight o'clock this morning, and by eleven the whole army were on their march west with bag and baggage. That is bad news, Fergus. You could hardly have brought worse. The king had hoped to have struck a heavy blow and then to be off again to face the Austrians. What strength were they? About 50,000. How did they get the news of our coming? That I cannot say, sir. They had gone into Erfurt soon after five and had already picked up a good deal of news from the talk of a party of French non-commissioned officers who were taking breakfast at a small inn and who, not imagining that I could understand them, talked very freely over affairs. They sat over their meals some time, and I did not go out until they had left. Just as I did so, a mounted officer galloped past at a speed that showed he was the bearer of an important dispatch. I followed him to Sumai's headquarters. While there, I noticed several mounted officers rode out in great haste a quarter of an hour later several general officers arrived there was a consultation for half an hour and then officers rode off in all directions and in a few minutes trumpets were sounding and drums beating all over the town in a very short time a movement began towards the western gate by ten o'clock the tents were all struck round the town the wagons loaded and they were on their way west an hour later, and the whole force was in movement in that direction, and as I issued from the town on this side, I met the cavalry that had been scattered among the villages, galloping in. I don't think that there is, at the present moment, an enemy within ten miles of Erfurt. You were in no danger yourself? None at all, sir. I passed the night at a friendly peasant's hut, five miles this side of the town, inside their advanced post. I left my horse in a wood, and my peasant guided me by paths to the town. I did not exchange a word with anyone except the landlord of the hotel where I breakfasted. He was bitterly hostile to the enemy. I also spoke to a solitary French vidette, who had, in the hurry of their retreat, been left behind and told him that he had best be off as the whole army was in full march to the west. Well, if you breakfasted at six this morning, you must be hungry. My dinner will be ready in half an hour, and you had better share it with me. I must go now and tell the king the news that you have brought. I said nothing to him about my having sent you. In twenty minutes, the marshal returned. The king wishes to see you, Fergus. Of course he is vexed, but he always takes bad news well, unless it is the result of the blunder of one of the officers. He does not say much, even then, but it is very bad for that officer when he sees it. Frederick never forgives the blunder. Well, Captain Drummond, so you have been playing the spy for us. I have been doing my best, Your Majesty. And the French are gone, bag and baggage? Yes, sire. They have gone off west. To perch themselves somewhere among the mountains, I suppose. Perhaps they will get bolder. Presently they will hear that they are more than double my strength. Did you learn anything more than what Marshal Keith has told me? I heard a great deal of talk among a party of French non-commissioned officers, sire. They expressed great dissatisfaction with their general and at the long delays. They also spoke with absolute contempt of the Confederacy Army, both officers and men, and said that if it had not been for the drilling by the Austrian non-commissioned officers, they would be nothing better than a rabble. I dare say Soubiz is of the same opinion, the king said, and wants them to have a few weeks more drill before he sets them in line of battle. However, I have no doubt we shall manage to bring him to book before we return. Well, I am obliged to you for your zeal, Captain Drummond, and although Keith tells me that you got in without being questioned, such business is always dangerous, 
mayhap next time you will have a better opportunity for distinguishing yourself as you managed to pass so freely among them after you made your escape from prison you can clearly be trusted on work of this kind fergus saluted and retired the next morning the troops started as usual at daybreak they were to make but a short march but they had no longer any occasion for speed and they had made the hundred and fifty miles at a very rapid pace but when they halted frederick with the cavalry rode straight on into euphorit don't wait to put on your uniform now keith said to fergus on his return from the royal quarters dinner is waiting and i am ready if you are not lindsay is going to dine with me too well lindsay the marshal said as the latter entered you see the advantages of this young fellow being able to speak german well if you had been taken prisoner at lobositz you would have been fast in spielberg at present and you see he is now able to undertake perilous missions and peril means promotion i quite see that marshal lindsay said with a smile but though i can get on with french fairly enough my tongue doesn't seem to be able to form these crack-jawed german words and you see marshal it is not the only one that does not i think sir that bad as my german is it is not much worse than your own and you have been here much longer than i have the marshal laughed you are right i cannot say half a dozen german words but you see i have not had your motive for acquiring it and cannot very well get promotion and again it would not do for me to speak better german than the king of prussia who beyond a few words necessary for animating his troops on occasion knows very little german himself for general work here french is amply sufficient because every officer speaks it but as you see german is very useful too to a young officer who wishes to push himself forward and is willing to undertake special work of this kind but even then marshal he would have no advantage over a prussian officer who speaks french it depends a good deal upon the prussian officer the greater portion of them are mere machines splendid fighting machines no doubt but of no great use outside their own work any one could detect with half an eye nineteen out of twenty of them dress them how you would disguise them as you like they step the regulation length bring their foot down in the regulation way and are as stiff as if they had swallowed a ramrod they have neither suppleness nor adaptability they are so accustomed to obey that they have almost lost the power of originating and would be taken and shot before they were in the enemy's lines ten minutes now fergus has the advantage of knowing both languages and of being quick-witted and sharp the next two months were passed in marches to and fro sedlitz with some cavalry took possession of gotha to the great satisfaction of the duke and duchess and the king himself rode over and dined with them when sedlitz remained there as governor with a couple of regiments of horse a strong body of french and austrian hussars grenadiers and artillery marched against gotha sedlitz having so few men to oppose them evacuated the place and the enemy marched into it in triumphant procession the duke and duchess made the best of matters and invited all the principal officers to a banquet just as they were sitting down to this sidlitz with his prussians reappeared his men being so awfully scattered about that they appeared a great deal stronger than they were the enemy was seized with panic so Beast and his generals mounted in great haste and in a few minutes the whole were retreating at top speed sedlitz pursuing for some distance killing thirty and taking sixty prisoners with a large amount of baggage and plunder and then returning to gotha to eat the dinner prepared for the enemy ferdinand of brunswick with his division had been sent off to check if possible the movements of the french army under richelieu near magdenburg in october came the startling news that berlin itself was threatened and that a force said to be fifteen thousand strong under general haddock was in rapid motion towards it prince maurice was ordered to hasten to its defence and the king also moved in that direction the invading force 
was but four thousand strong their numbers however were so magnified by rumour that the governor of berlin who had but four thousand troops did not venture to oppose them but sent the royal family and archives away under a strong escort haddock occupied a suburb of the city but knowing that as soon as his real force was known he would be hotly opposed and receiving news that prince maurice was rapidly approaching demanded a ransom of forty five thousand pounds finally accepted twenty seven thousand pounds and then hurried away prince maurice arrived twenty four hours later the consequences of this little success magnified by report into berlin captured prussian royal family in flight turned out very advantageous to frederick the enthusiasm in paris and vienna was enormous and orders were dispatched to the armies to set to without further delay and finish the work fifteen thousand men were sent from richelieu's army to reinforce Suvise, who thereupon issued from his mountain stronghold and marched against leipzig frederick however arrived there first ferdinand and maurice joining him a day or two later and while waiting there frederick received the joyful news that england requested him to appoint duke ferdinand of brunswick commander-in-chief of the army until now commanded by the duke of cumberland who had just sailed for england pitt had now risen to almost absolute power in england and was busied in reforming the abuses in the army and navy dismissing incapable officials and preparing to render some efficient aid to its hard-pressed ally the proposal that prince ferdinand should assume the command of the army whose efforts had hitherto been rendered negulatory by the other incompetence of the duke of cumberland who although personally as brave as a lion was absolutely ignorant of war afforded immense satisfaction to the king no better choice could have been made ferdinand was related to the royal families both of england and prussia he was a capable general prudent and at the same time enterprising firm under difficulties ready to seize opportunities and under his command there was no doubt that the northern army which had hitherto been useless and had only been saved from absolute destruction by the incompetence of the french generals would now play a useful part on october thirtieth soubise in spite of his orders to fight and the fact that he had doubled the strength of the prussians fell back before them soubise himself felt no confidence in his troops but upon the other hand his officers and those of the confederate army were puffed up with vanity and remonstrated hotly against the retreat the next day frederick came in sight of soubise army which was camped on a height near the town of wiesenfels frederick had but one half of his force with him the other half under keith being still detached five thousand men garrisoned wiesenfels but frederick made short work of the place his cannon burst down the gates and his troops rushed forward with all speed but the garrison fled across the bridge over the sal which had already been prepared for burning and they set it on fire in such haste that four hundred were unable to cross and were made prisoners the fugitives joined their army on the other side of the elbe and its guns opened upon the burning bridge to prevent the prussians from trying to extinguish the flames the prussians returned the fire and the artillery duel was kept up until three o'clock by which time the bridge was consumed frederick had already fixed upon a spot suitable for the erection of another and during the night while the enemy were falling back to take up a fresh position upon higher ground the engineers working diligently succeeded in throwing a bridge across keith arrived at Burstburg the next morning strong force lay opposite ready to dispute the passage but when Subi's found that the king was crossing by his new bridge he called in all his detachments and marched away 
to a strong position and there set himself in array ready to receive an attack keith's bridges were finished on the third of november and that afternoon he crossed and joined frederick on the fourth the army was on the move by two o'clock in the morning a bright moon was shining and by its light it was discovered that the enemy had shifted his position for one much stronger with approaches protected by patches of wood and bog the prussian army therefore marched back to their camp the king hoping that being so far from their base of supplies the enemy would be forced ere long to make some movement that would afford him a chance of attacking them under better circumstances the ground from wiesenfels rises very gradually to a height of a hundred and twenty feet or so which in so flat a country is regarded as a hill on this slight swelling are several small villages of these rossback is the principal standing high up on its crest here frederick's right ring was posted while his left was at bedra the king took up his quarters at a large house in rossback and from its roof at eight o'clock on the morning of the fifth he saw that the enemy was getting into motion and moving away towards their left the movement had begun much earlier half an hour later they had passed through the village of grost and were apparently making their way to Freiburg, where they had some magazines. Hoping to have a chance of attacking their rear, Frederick ordered the cavalry to saddle, and the whole army to be in readiness, and then sat down to dinner with his officers at noon. Little did he dream at the time that the slow and clumsy movement that he was watching was intended by the enemy to end in a flank attack on himself. On the previous day, Subais, with his general, looked down on the Prussian camp, had reckoned their force at 10,000. In reality, they had seen only a portion of their camp, the site being hidden by a dip of the ground. Even Subes thought that, with the odds of over five to one in his favor, he could fight a battle with a certainty of success and planned a masterly march, by which he could place himself on Frederick's left and rear drive him into the bend made by the sail and annihilate his army in his enthusiasm at this happy idea he sent off a courier to carry the news to versailles that he was about to annihilate the prussian army and take the king prisoner frederick's dinner was prolonged there was nothing to be done and patience was one of the king's strong points at two o'clock an officer who had remained unwatched on the housetop hurried down with news that the enemy had suddenly turned to the left the king went up to the roof with his officers and at once divined the intention of his foes it was a glorious moment for him at last after three weary months he was to meet them in battle instantly his orders were given and in half an hour the prussian army was all in movement with the exception of some irregular corps which were left to occupy the attention of the enemy's horse, which had been posted as if to threaten Rossbeck. By the line taken, the Prussians were at once hidden behind the crest of the hill from the enemy, and so Subais thought that the Prussians, being afraid of his attack, were marching away with all speed for Keith's bridge at Merseburg. He accordingly hurried on his cavalry and ordered the infantry to go at a double for the purpose of capturing the runaway Prussians. In the meantime, Sedlitz, with 4,000 horse, trotted briskly along until he reached, still concealed from the enemy's sight, the spot towards which they were hurrying. In two great columns headed by 7,000 cavalrys, he allowed them to move forward until he was on their flank, and then dashed over the crest of the hill and charged like a thunderbolt upon them. Taken completely by surprise, the enemy's cavalry had scarce time to form. Two Austrian regiments and two French were alone able to do so, but there was no withstanding the impetus of the Prussian charge. They rode right through the disordered cavalry, turned formed and recharged and four times cut their way through them until they broke away in a headlong flight and were pursued by sedlitz until out of sight from the hill when he turned and waited 
to see where he could find an opportunity of striking another blow. By this time, Frederick, with the infantry, was now pouring over the crest of the hill, their advance heralded by the fire of twenty-four guns. Rapidly in echelon, they approached the enemy. In vain, Subais endeavored to face around the column, thus taken in flank, to meet the coming storm. He was seconded by Broglio and the commander of the Confederate army, but the two columns were jammed together, and all were in confusion at this astounding and unexpected attack. Orders were unheard or disobeyed, and everything was still in utter disorder when six battalions of Prussian infantry hurled themselves upon them. When forty paces distant, they poured in their first terrible volley and then continued their fire as fast as they could load, creating great havoc among the French troops on whom they had fallen, while the way on each flank the Prussian artillery made deep gaps in the line. Soon the mass, helpless under this storm of fire, wavered and shook, and then Sedlitz, who had been concealed with his cavalry in a hollow a short distance away, hurled himself like a thunderbird on their rear, and in a moment they broke up in headlong flight. In less than half an hour from the first appearance of the Prussians on the hill, the struggle had ended, and an army of from fifty to sixty thousand men was a mob of fugitives, defeated by a force of but twenty-two thousand men, not above half of whom were engaged. The loss of the Allies was three thousand killed and wounded, five thousand prisoners, and seventy-two guns, while the Prussians lost but one hundred and sixty-five killed and three hundred and seventy-six wounded. The victory was one of the most remarkable and surprising ever gained for these figures by no means represent the full loss to the defeated. The German portion of the army, after being chased for many miles, scattered in all directions, and only one regiment reached Erfurt in military order, and in two days the whole of the men were on their way to their homes in the various states composing the Confederation. The French were in no less disgraceful a condition plundering as they went a mere disorganized rabble they continued their flight until fifty-five miles from the field of battle and were long before they gathered again in fighting order the joy caused in prussia and in england by this astonishing victory was shared largely by the inhabitants of the country through which the french army had marched everywhere they had plundered and pillaged as if they had been moving through an enemy's country instead of one they had professed to come to deliver the protestant inhabitants had everywhere been most cruelly maltreated the churches wrecked and the pastors treated as criminals the greater portion of germany therefore regarded the defeat of the french as a matter for gratification rather than the reverse in england the result was enormous it had the effect of vastly strengthening pitt's position and twenty thousand british troops were ere long dispatched to join the army under the duke of brunswick which was now called the allied army and from this time the french force under richelieu ceased to be dangerous to frederick france and england were old antagonists and entered upon a duet of their own a duel that was to cost france canada and much beside to establish England's naval preponderance and to extinguish French influence in the Netherlands. Fergus Drummond was not under fire at the memorable Battle of Rossbach. Keith's division was not, in fact, engaged, the affair having terminated before it arrived. Keith, however, had ridden to the position on the brow of the hill where the king had stationed himself and his staff following him had the satisfaction of seeing the enemy's heavy columns melt into a mass of fugitives and spread in all directions over the country like dust driven before a sudden whirlwind what next i wonder fergus said to lindsay who had three days before been promoted to the rank of captain as much to the satisfaction of fergus as to his own i suppose some more marching lindsay replied you may be sure that we shall be off 
east again to try conclusions with prince karl beveren seems to be making a sad mess of it there of course he is tremendously outnumbered thirty thousand men against eighty thousand but he has fallen back in silesia without making a single stand and suffered prince karl to plant himself between breslau and schwarznitz and the prince is besieging the latter town with twenty thousand men while with sixty thousand he is facing bevern four days after the victory indeed frederick set out with thirteen thousand men leaving prince henry to maintain the line of the Saal and guard saxony while marshal keith was to go into bohemia raise contributions there and threaten as far as might be the austrian post in that country fergus however went with the king's army the king having said to the marshal keith lend me that young aide-de-camp of yours i have seen how he can be trusted to carry a dispatch at whatever risk to his life he is ingenious and full of devices and he has luck and luck goes for a great deal i like him too i have observed that he is always lively and cheery even at the end of the longest day's work i notice too that even though your relation he never becomes too familiar and his talk will be refreshing when i want something to distract my thoughts from weighty matters so fergus went with the king who could ill afford to lose keith from his side with none was he more friendly and intimate and now that schwerin had gone he relied upon him more implicitly than upon any other of his officers but keith had been for some time unwell he was suffering from asthma and other ailments that rendered rapid travel painful to him and he would obtain more rest and ease in bohemia than he could find in the rapid journey the king intended to make on the fifth day of his march frederick hurried to his stupefaction that schweidnitz had surrendered the place was an extremely strong one and the king had relied confidently upon its holding out for two or three months its fortifications were constructed in the best manner it was abundantly supplied with cannon ammunition and provisions and its surrender was inexcusable the fault was doubtless to a large degree that of its commandant who was a man of no resolution or resources but it was also partly due to the fact that a portion of the garrison were saxons who had at pima had been obliged to enter the prussian service great numbers of these deserted a hundred and eighty of them in one day going over from an advanced post to the enemy with troops like these there could be no assurance that any post would be firmly held a fact that might well shake the confidence of any commander in his power of resistance the blow was none the less severe to frederick from being partly the result of his own mistaken step of enrolling men bitterly hostile in the ranks of the army still disastrous as the news was it did not alter his resolution and at even greater speed than before he continued his march sometimes of an evening he sent for fergus and chatted with him pleasantly for an hour or two asking him many questions of his life in scotland and discoursing familiarly on such matters but never making any allusions to military affairs on the tenth day of the march they arrived at gorlitz where another piece of bad news reached frederick prince karl after taking schwednitz had fallen with sixty thousand men on bevern he had crossed by five bridges across the low but each column was met by a prussian force strongly entrenched for the space of fifteen hours the battles had raged over seven or eight miles of country five times the austrians had attacked five times had they been rolled back again but at nine o'clock at night they were successful more or less in four of their attacks while the prussians left wing under the command of zethen had driven its assailants across the river again during the night bevern had drawn off marched through breslau and crossed the oder leaving eighty cannon and eight thousand killed and wounded a tremendous loss indeed 
when the army at daybreak had been thirty thousand strong beverin himself rode out to reconnoitre in the grey light of the morning attended only by a groom and fell in with an austrian outpost he was carried to vienna but being a distant relation of the emperor was sent home again without ransom it was the opinion of frederick that he had given himself up intentionally and on his return he was ordered at once to take up his former official post at stettin where he conducted himself so well in the struggle against the russian armies that two years later he was restored to frederick's favour as if this misfortune was not great enough two days later came the news that breslow had surrendered without firing a shot and this when it was known that the king was within two days march and pressing forward to its relief here ninety-eight guns and an immense store and magazine were lost to prussia frederick straightway issued orders that the general who had succeeded beverin should be put under arrest for not having at once thrown his army into breslau appointed zithin in his place and ordered him to bring the army round to glogau and meet him at parchwitz on december second which zithin punctually did in spite of the terrible misfortunes that had befallen him frederick was still undaunted increased as it was by the arrival of zithin his force was but a third of the strength of the austrians the latter were flushed with success while zethan's troops were discouraged by defeat and his own portion of the force worn out by their long and rapid marches and by the failure of the object for which they had come calling his generals together on the third he recounted the misfortunes that had befallen them and told them that his one trust in this terrible position was in their qualities and valor and that he intended to engage the enemy as soon as he found them and that they must beat them or all of them perish in the battle enthusiastically the generals declared that they would conquer or die with him and among the soldiers the spirit was equally strong for they had implicit confidence in their king and a well-justified trust in their own valor and determination that evening frederick eager as he was to bring the terrible situation to a final issue cannot but have felt that it would have been too desperate an undertaking to have attacked the enemy posted as they were with a river known as the schweidnitz water and many other natural difficulties covering their front and having their flanks strengthened as was the austrian custom with field works and batteries fortunately the austrians settled the difficulty by moving out from their stronghold dawn had counseled their remaining there but prince karl and the great majority of his military advisers agreed that it would be a shameful thing that ninety thousand men should shut themselves up to avoid an attack by a force of but one-third their own strength and that it was in all respects preferable to march out and give battle in which case the prussians would be entirely destroyed whereas if merely repulsed in an attack on a strong position a considerable proportion might escape and give trouble in the future the austrians indeed having captured schwedenitz and breslau defeated bevern and in the space of three weeks made themselves masters of a considerable portion of silesia were in no small degree puffed up and had fallen anew to despising frederick the blow dealt them at prague had been obliterated by their success at kolin and frederick's later success over the french and federal army was not considered by them as a matter affecting themselves although several austrian regiments had been among subice's force the officers were very scornful over the aggressive march of frederick's small army which they derisively called the potsdam god's parade and many were the jokes cut at the military messes at its expense the difference then with which the two armies regarded the coming battle was great indeed on the one side there was the easy confidence of victory 
the satisfaction that at length this troublesome little king had put himself in their power on the other a deep determination to conquer or to die a feeling that terrible as the struggle must be great as were the odds against them they might yet did each man do his duty come out the victors in the struggle and what do you think of this matter lad frederick said laying his hand familiarly on the young captain's shoulder i know nothing about it your majesty but like the rest i feel confident that somehow you will pull us through of one thing i am sure that all that is possible for the men to do your soldiers will accomplish well we shall see it is well that i know all the country round here for many a review have i held of the garrison of breslau at the very ground where we are about to fight their position is a very strong one and i am afraid that crafty old fox dawn will hear as he did at prague persuade prince karl to hide behind his batteries were it not for that i should feel confident whereas i now but feel hopeful still i doubt not that we shall find our way in somehow end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of With Frederick the Great, Story of the Seven Years' War by G. A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 11 Luther. At four in the morning on Sunday, December 4th, Frederick marched from Parchwitz, intending to make Newmarket a small town some fourteen miles off his quarters when within two or three miles of this town he learned to his deep satisfaction that the austrians had just established a great bakery there and that a party of engineers were marking out the site for a camp also that there were but a thousand croats in the town the news was satisfactory indeed for two reasons the first being that the bakery would be of great use for his own troops the second that it was clear that the austrians intended to advance across the schwednitz water to give battle it was evident that they could have had no idea that he was pressing on so rapidly or they would never have established their bakery so far in advance and protected by so small a force he lost no time in taking advantage of their carelessness but sent a regiment of cavalry to seize the hills on both sides of the town then marched rapidly forward burst in the gates and hurled the croats in other confusion from newmark while the cavalry dashed down and cut off their retreat one hundred and twenty of them were killed and five hundred and seventy taken prisoner in the town the Austrian bakery was found to be in full work, and 80,000 bread rations, still hot, were ready for delivery. This additional success, and the unexpected treat of hot bread, raised the spirits of the troops greatly, and was looked upon as a happy augury. Two or three hours before Newmark had been captured, the Austrian army was crossing the river and presently received the unpleasant news of what had happened surprised at the news that the prussians were so near their generals at once set to work to choose a good position this was not a difficult task for the country was swampy with little wooded rises and many villages they planted their right wing at the village of nypern which was practically unapproachable on account of deep peat bogs their centre was at a larger village named luthen their left at sagschutz the total length of its front was about six miles the prussians started before daybreak next morning in four columns frederick riding on ahead with the vanguard when near born some eight miles from newmark he caught sight in the dim light of a considerable body of horse stretching across the road in front of him as far as he could make out the line the prussian cavalry were at once ordered to charge down on their left flank 
The enemy proved to be five regiments of cavalry placed there to guard the army from surprise. They, however, were themselves surprised and were at once overthrown and driven in headlong flight to take shelter behind their right wing at Nypern, 540 being taken prisoner and a large number being killed or wounded. Frederick rode on through Born, ascended a small hill called Schoenberg to the right of the road, and as the light increased could from that point make out the Austrian army drawn up in battle array, and stretching from Nypern to Sagschutz. Well was it for him that he had reviewed troops over the same ground, and knew all the bogs and morasses that guarded the Austrian front. For a long time he sat there on horseback, studying the possibilities of the situation. The Austrian right he regarded as absolutely impregnable. Luthen might be attacked with some chance of success, but Sag shoots offered by far the most favorable opening for attack. The formation of the ground offered special facilities for the moment, being effected without the Austrians being aware of what was taking place, for there was a depression behind the swells and broken ground in front of the Austrian center, by which the Prussians could march from Born unseen by the enemy until they approached Sagschutz. It was three hours after Frederick had taken up his place before the four columns had all reached Bourne. As soon as they were in readiness there, they were ordered to march with all speed as far as Redaxford, thence to march in oblique order against the Austrian left. The Austrians all this time could observe a group of horsemen on the hill moving sometimes this way, sometimes that, but more than this they could not see. The conjectures were various. As hour passed after hour, Dawn believed that the Prussians must have marched away south, with the intention of falling upon the magazines in Bohemia, and that the cavalry seen moving along the hills was placed there to defend the Prussians from being taken in flank or in rear while thus marching general lucchese who commanded the austrian right wing was convinced that the cavalry formed the prussian right wing and that the whole army concealed behind the slopes was marching to fall upon him in the belfry of the church at luthen on the tops of windmills and on other points of vantage austrian generals with their staffs were endeavoring to obtain a glimpse behind those tiresome swells and to discover what was going on behind them but in vain there were the cavalry moving occasionally from crest to crest but nothing beyond that lucchese got more and more uneasy and sent message after message to headquarters that he was about to be attacked and must have a large reinforcement of horse the prince and dawn at first scoffed at the idea knowing that the bogs in front of Nypern were impassable. But at last he sent a message to the effect that, if the cavalry did not come, he would not be responsible for the issue. It was thought, therefore, that he must have some good ground for his insistence, and Dawn set off the reserve of horse and several other regiments drawn from the left wing and himself off at a trot at their head to see what was the matter. It was just as he started that the Prussians, with their music playing and the men singing, Give das ich dru mit fleece was mir zu thun gebont, grant that with zeal and strength this day I do, had passed Radford and reached Lobetinitz and were about to advance in an oblique line to the attack. The king saw with delight the removal of so large a body of horse from the very point against which his troops would in half an hour be hurling themselves nothing could have suited his plans better at a rapid pace and with precision and order as perfect as if upon level ground suddenly the prussians poured over the swells on the flank of the sanctuaries the dusty who commanded the austrians there was struck with astonishment at the spectacle 
of the prussian army which he believed to be far away pouring down on his flank the heads of the four columns the artillery and zithin's cavalry appeared simultaneously marching swiftly and making no pause being a good general he lost not a moment in endeavouring to meet the storm his left was thrown back a little a battery of fourteen guns at the angle so formed opened fire and he launched his cavalry against that of zithin for the moment zithin's men were pushed back but the fire from an infantry battalion close by checked the austrian horse they fell back out of range and zithin making a counter charge drove them away in the meantime the prussian infantry as they advanced poured a storm of fire upon the austrian line aided by a battery of ten heavy guns that prince maurice who commanded he had planted on a rise a clump of fir trees held by croats in advance of the austrian line was speedily cleared and then the prussians broke down the abatis that protected the enemy front charged furiously against the infantry and drove these before them capturing nadasti's battery in ten minutes after the beginning of the fight the position of the austrian left was already desperate the whole prussian army was concentrated against it and being on its flank crumpled the line up as it advanced prince karl's aides de camp galloped at the top of their speed to bring dawn and the cavalry back again and austrian battalions from the centre were hurried down to aid nadasti's but were impeded by the retreating troops and the confusion thickened until it was brought to a climax by zethin's horse which had been unable to act until now but firwood quagmire and abatis had all been passed by the prussians and they dashed into the mass sabring and trampling down and taking whole battalions prisoners prince karl exerted himself to the utmost to check the prussian advance batteries were brought up and advantageously posted at luthen heavy bodies of infantry occupied the village and its church and, and took posts so as to present a front to the advancing tide another quarter of an hour and the battle might have been retrieved but long before the dispositions were all effected the prussians were at hand nevertheless by great diligence the austrians had to some extent succeeded luthen was the centre of the new position lucchese was hastening up while nadasti swung backwards and tried as he arrived to form the left flank of the new position all this was being done under a storm of shot from the whole of the prussian artillery which was so terrible that many battalions fell into confusion as fast as they arrived luthen a straggling hamlet of over a mile in length and with two or three streets of scattered houses barns farm buildings and two churches was crowded with troops ready to fight but unable to do so line being jammed upon the line until sometimes a hundred deep pressed constantly behind by freshly arrived battalions and in front by the advancing prussians some regiments were almost without officers into this confused straggling helpless mass prevented from opening out by the houses and enclosures the prussians ever keeping their formation poured their valleys with terrible effect in such fashion as drake's perfectly handled ships poured their broadsides into the huge helpless spanish galleons at gravelines with a like dogged courage as that shown by the spanish the austrian masses suffered almost passively while those occupying the houses and church facing the prussians resisted valiantly and desperately from every window every wall their musketry fire flashed out the resistance round the churchyard being specifically stubborn the churchyard had a high and strong wall and so terrible was the fire from the roof of the church and other spots of advantage that the tide of prussian victory was arrested for a time at last they made a rush the churchyard gate was burst in and the austrians driven out luthen was not yet won 
but frederick now brought up the left wing which had till this time been held in reserve these came on with levelled bayonets and rushed into the fight the king was as always in the thick of the battle giving his orders as coolly as if at a review sending fresh troops where required changing the arrangements as opportunity offered keeping the whole machine in due order and by his presence animating all with the determination to win or die and an almost equal readiness to accept either alternative at last after an hour's stubborn resistance the austrians were hurled out of luthen still sternly resisting still contesting every foot of the ground lucchese now saw an opportunity of retrieving with his great cavalry force the terrible consequences of his own blunder and led them impetuously down upon the flank of the prussians but frederick had prepared for such a stroke and had placed drazen with the left wing of the cavalry in a hollow sheltered from the fire of the austrian batteries and bade him do nothing attempt nothing but cover the right flank of the infantry from the austrian horse he accordingly let lucchese charge down with his cavalry and then rushed out on his rear and fell suddenly and furiously upon them astounded at this sudden and unexpected attack and with their ranks swept by a storm of prussian bullets the austrian cavalry broke and fled in all directions lucchese having paid for his fault by dying fighting to the last his duty thus performed drazen was free to act and fell upon the flank and rear of the austrian infantry and in a few minutes the battle was over and the austrians in full retreat they made however another attempt to stand at sarah but it was hopeless and they were soon pushed backwards again and hotly pressed poured over the four bridges across the swidnitz river and for the most part continued their flight to breslau until the austrians had crossed the river the prussian cavalry were on their rear sabring and taking prisoners while the infantry was halted at sarah the sun having now set exhausted as they were by their work which had begun at midnight and continued until now without pause or break not yet was their task completely done the king riding up the line asked if any battalion would volunteer to follow him to lisa a village on the river bank three battalions stepped out the landlord of the little inn carrying a lantern walked by the king's side as they approached the village ten or twenty musket shots flashed out in the fields to the right they were aimed at the lantern but no one was hurt there were other shots from lisa and it was evident that the village was still not wholly evacuated the infantry rushed forward scattered through the fields and drove out the lurking croats the king rode quietly on into the village and entered the principal house to his astonishment he found it full of austrian officers who could easily have carried him off his infantry being still beyond the village they had but a small force remaining there and believing that the prussians had halted for the night at sarah they were as much astonished as frederick at his entrance the king had the presence of mind to hide his surprise good evening gentlemen he said is there some room left for me do you think the austrian officer supposing of course that he had a large force outside bowed deeply escorted him to the best room in the house and then slipped out the back collected what troops they could as they went and hurried across the bridge the prussians were not long in entering and very speedily cleared out the rest of the austrians then they crossed the bridge and with a few guns followed in pursuit the army at sarah on hearing the firing betook itself again to arms and marched to the king's assistance the twenty-five thousand men in their bands again joining in the triumphant hill nundag and alingot as they tramped through the darkness when they arrived at lisa they found that all was safe and bivouacked in the fields never was there a greater or more surprising victory never one in which the military genius of the commander was more strikingly shown the austrians were in good heart they were excellent soldiers and brave well provided with artillery 
and strongly placed and yet they were signally defeated by a force little over one-third their number had there been two more hours of daylight the austrians would have been not only routed but altogether crushed their loss was ten thousand left on the field of whom three thousand were killed twelve thousand were taken prisoner and one hundred and sixteen cannon captured to this loss must be added that of seventeen thousand prisoners taken when breslow surrendered twelve days later together with a vast store of cannon and ammunition including everything taken so shortly before from brevern liegnitz surrendered and the whole of silesia with the exception only of schweidnitz was again wrested from the austrians thus in killed wounded and prisoners the loss of the austrians amounted to as much as the total force of the prussians the latter lost in killed eleven hundred and forty one and in wounded about five thousand prince maurice upon whose division the brunt of the battle had fallen was promoted to the rank of field marshal fergus drummond had been with the king throughout the terrible day until the battle began his duties had been light being confirmed to the carrying of orders to prince maurice after which he took his place among the staff and dismounting chatted with his acquaintances while karl held his horse when however the fir tree wood was carried and the king rode forward and took his place there during the attack upon the austrian position at sagschwitz matters became more lively the balls from the austrian battery sung overhead and sent branches flying and trees crashing down sagschwitz won the king followed the advancing line and the air was alive with bullets and case shot after that fergus knew little more of the battle being incessantly employed in carrying orders through the thick of it to generals commanding brigades and even to battalions the roar of battle was so tremendous that his horse maddened with the din and the sharp whiz of the bullets at times was well nigh unmanageable and occupied his attention almost to the exclusion of other thoughts especially after it had been struck by a bullet in the hind quarter and had come to understand that these strange and maddening noises meant danger not until after all was over was fergus aware of the escapes he had had a bullet had cut away an ornament from his headdress one of his reins had been severed at a distance of an inch or two from his hand a bullet had pierced the tail of his coatee and buried itself in the cantel of his saddle and the iron guard of his claymore had been pierced however on his return to the king after carrying a dispatch he was able to curb his own excitement and that of his horse and to make the formal military salute as he reported in a calm and quiet voice that he had carried out the orders with which he had been charged it was with great gratification that he heard the king say that evening as he and his staff supped together at the inn at lisa you have done exceedingly well today captain drummond i am very pleased with you you were always at my elbow when i wanted you and i observed that you were never flurried or excited though indeed there would have been good excuse for a young soldier being so in such a hurly-burly you are over young for further promotion for a year or two but i must find some other way of testifying my satisfaction at your conduct and indeed when the list of promotions for bravery in the field were published a few days later fergus's name appeared among those who received the decoration of the prussian military order and on a fully as much valued as promotion for a time he lost the service of karl who had been seriously although not dangerously wounded just before the austrians were driven out of luthen the news of the battle filled the confederates with stupefaction and dismay prince karl was at once recalled and was relieved from military employment dawn being appointed to the supreme command the prince withdrew to his government of the netherlands and there passed the remainder of his days in peace and quiet his army was hunted by zither's cavalry to koningratz 
losing two thousand prisoners and a large amount of baggage and thirty seven thousand men only of the eighty thousand that stood in battle array at luthen reached the sheltering walls of the fortress and those in so dilapidated and worn out a condition that by the end of the week after arriving there no less than twenty two thousand were in the hospital thus after eight months of constant and weary anxiety frederick by the two heavy blows he had dealt successfully at the confederates stood in a far better position than he had occupied at the opening of the first campaign when as his enemies finally believed prussia would be captured and divided without the smallest difficulty frederick wintered at breslau whither came many visitors from prussia and there was a constant round of gaieties and festivities frederick himself desired nothing so much as peace once or twice there had been some faint hope that this might be brought about by his favorite sister wilhelmina who had been ceaselessly in her efforts to effect it but the two empresses and the pompadour were alike bent on avenging themselves on the king and the reverses that they had suffered but increased their determination to overwhelm him great as frederick's success had been it did not blind him to the fact that his position was almost hopeless when the war began he had an army of a hundred and fifty thousand of the finest soldiers in the world the two campaigns had made frightful gaps in their ranks at prague he had fought with eighty thousand men at lutheran he had but thirty thousand his little kingdom could scarcely supply men to fill the places of those who had fallen, while his enemies had teeming populations from which to gather ample materials for fresh armies. It seemed even to his hopeful spirit that all this could have but one ending, and that each success, however great, weakened him more than his adversaries. The winter's rest was, however, most welcome, for the moment there was nothing to plan nothing to do save to order that the drilling of the fresh levies should go on incessantly in order that some at least of the terrible gaps in the army might be filled up before the campaign commenced in the spring seventeen fifty eight began badly for early in the year the russians were on the move the empress had dismissed and ordered to be tried by court-martial the general who had done so little the previous year had appointed field marshal firma to command in his place and ordered him to advance instantly and to annex east prussia in her name on the sixteenth of january he crossed the frontier and six days later entered konigsberg and issued a proclamation to the effect that his august sovereign had now become mistress of east prussia and that all men of official or social position must at once take the oath of allegiance to her east prussia had been devastated the year before by marauders and its hatred of russia was intense but the people were powerless to resist some fled leaving all behind them but the majority were forced to take the required oath and for a time east prussia became a russian province nevertheless its young men constantly slipped away when opportunity offered to join the prussian army and monies were frequently collected improvised people to dispatch to frederick to aid him in his necessities a far greater assistance was the english subsidy of six hundred and seventy thousand pounds which was paid punctually for four years and was of supreme service to him it was spent thriftily and of all the enormous sums expended by this country in subsidizing foreign powers none was ever laid out to the tenth of the advantage of the two million six hundred and eighty thousand pounds given to frederick in the north the campaign also opened early ferdinand of brunswick bestirred himself defeated the french signally at crefeld and drove them headlong across the rhine frederick too took the field early and on the fifteenth of march moved from breslau to schwidnitz the siege began on the first of april and on the sixteenth 
the place surrendered. 4,900 prisoners of war were taken, with 51 guns and 7,000 pounds in money. Three days later, Frederick, with only 40,000 men, was off. Deceived Dawn as to his intentions, entered Moravia, and besieged Olmutz. Keith was with him again, and Fergus had returned to his staff. The march was conducted with the marvelous precision and accuracy that characterized all Frederick's movements. But Olmutz was a strong place and stoutly defended. The Prussian engineers, who did not shine at siege work, often opened their trenches 800 yards too far away. The magazines were too far off, and Dorn, who, as usually, carefully abstained from giving battle, so cut up the convoys that, after five weeks of vain endeavors, the king was obliged to raise the siege, partly owing to the loss of the convoy that would have enabled him to take the town which was now at its last extremity, and partly that he knew that the Russians were marching against Brandenburg. He made a masterly retreat, struck a heavy blow at dawn by capturing and destroying his principal magazine, and then took up a very strong position near Koniggratz. Here he could have maintained himself against all dawn's assaults for his position was one that Dorn had himself held and strongly fortified. But the news from the north was of so terrible a nature that he was forced to hurry thither. The Cossacks, as the Russian army advanced, were committing most horrible atrocities, burning towns and villages, tossing men and women into the fire, plundering and murdering everywhere, and the very small Prussian force that was watching them was powerless to check the swarming marauders. Frederick, therefore, evading Dorn's attempts to arrest his march, crossed the mountains into Silesia again. At Landshut, he gave his army two days' rest, wrote and sent the paper to his brother Prince Henry, who was commander of the army defending Saxony from invasion, telling him that he was on the point of marching against the Russians might well be killed, and giving him orders as to the course to be pursued in such an event. He left Keith in command of 40,000 men to hold Dawn in check, should the latter advance against Silesia, and he again took Fergus with him, finding the young officer's talk a pleasant means of taking his mind off the troubles that beset him. In nine days, the army, which was but 15,000 strong, marched from Landshut to Frankfurt on Oder. Here the king learned that, that through Questrin, which the Russians were besieging, still held out. The town had been barbarously destroyed by the enemy. In fierce anger, the army pressed forward. The Russian army itself, officers and men, were indignant in the extreme at the brutalities committed by the cossacks but were powerless to restrain them for indeed these ruffians did not hesitate to attack and kill any officer who ventured to interfere between them and their victims the next morning early frederick reached the camp of his general dona who had been watching although unable to interfere with the russian proceedings the king had a profound contempt for the Russians. In spite of the warning of Keith, who had served with him, that they were far better soldiers than they appeared to be, and he anticipated a very easy victory over them. Early on the 22nd of August, the army from Frankfurt arrived. Dona's strength was numerically about the same as the king's, and with his 30,000 men, Frederick had no doubt that he would make but short work of the 80,000 Russians, of whom some 27,000 were the Cossack rabble, who were not worth being considered in a pitched battle. Deceiving the Russians as to his intentions by opening a heavy cannonade on one of their redoubts, as if intending to ford the river there, he crossed that evening 12 miles lower down and, after some maneuvering, faced the Russians who had at once broken up the siege on hearing of his passage. 
Femur sent away his baggage train to a small village called Kleinkalmen, and planted himself on a moor where his front was covered by quagmires and the Zaborn stream. Hearing late at night on the evening of the 24th that Frederick was likely to be upon them the next morning, the Russian general drew out into the open ground north of Zorndorf, which stands on a bare rise surrounded by woods and quagmires, and formed his army into a great square, two miles long by one broad, with his baggage in the middle, a formation which had been found excellent by the Russians in their Turkish wars, but which was by no means well adapted to meet Frederick's method of impetuous attack. Being ignorant as to decide upon which Frederick was likely to attack, and having decided to stand on the defensive, he adopted the methods most familiar to him. Frederick had cut all the bridges across the rivers, Warta and Oder, and believed that he should, after defeating the Russians, drive them into the angle formed by the junction of these two streams and cause them to surrender at discretion. Unfortunately, he had not heard that the great Russian train had been sent to Kleinkalmen, had he done so, he could have seized it and so have possessed himself of the Russian stores and all their munitions of war and have forced them to surrender without a blow, for the Cossacks had wasted the country far and wide and deprived it of all resources. But he and his army were so burning with indignation and the desire to avenge the Cossack cruelties that they made no pause and marched in all haste right round the Russian position so as to drive them back towards the junction of the two rivers. Femur's Cossacks brought him in news of Frederick's movements, which were hidden from him by the forests, and seeing that he was to be attacked on the Zorndorf side, instead of from that on which he had expected it to come. He changed his front and swung round the line containing his best troops to meet it. On arriving at Zorndorf, Frederick found that the Cossacks were already set the village on fire. There was no disadvantage to him, for the smoke of the burning houses rolled down towards the Russians, and so prevented them from making observation of the Prussian movements. The king rode up to the edge of the Zorborn Hollow, and finding it too deep and boggy to be crossed, determined to attack at the southwest with his left and center, placing his cavalry in rear and throwing back his right wing. The first division marched forward to the attack by the west end of the flaming village. The next division, which should have been its support, marched by the east end of Zorndorf. Its road was a longer one, and there was consequently a wide gap between the two divisions. Heralded by the fire of two strong batteries, which swept the southwestern corner of the Russian quadrangle. Their cross-fire plowing its ranks with terrible effect. The first division under Mantufel fell upon the enemy. The fire of the Prussian batteries had solely shaken the Russians and had produced lively agitation among the horses of the light baggage train in the center of the square and heralding their advance with a tremendous fire of musketry. The Prussian infantry forced its way into the mass. Had the second division been close at hand, as it should have been, the victory would already have been won. But although also engaged, it was not near, and Femur poured out a torrent of horse and foot upon Mantufel's flank and front. Without support and surrounded, the Prussians could do nothing and were swept back, losing 24 pieces of cannon, while the Russians, with shouts of victory, pressed upon them. At this critical moment, Seedlitz, with 5,000 horse, dashed down upon the disordered mass of Russians, casting it into irretrievable confusion. At the same time, the infantry rallied and pressed forward again. In 15 minutes... The whole Russian army was a confused mass. Femur, with the Russian horse, fled to Kratzdorf, and, had not the bridge there been burnt by Frederick, he would have made off, leaving his infantry to their fate. These should now, according to all rules, have surrendered, 
but they proved unconquerable, save by death. Sedlitz's cavalry saved them until fatigued by slaughter. The Prussian infantry poured their valleys into them, but they stood immovable and passive, dying where they stood. At one o'clock in the day, the battle ceased for a moment. The Prussians had marched at three in the morning, and seeing that altogether half the Russian army had been destroyed, the other half had gradually arranged themselves into a fresh front of battle. Frederick formed his forces again and brought up his right for the attack on the side of the Russian quadrangle, which still stood. Forward they went, their batteries well in advance, but before the infantry came within musket range, the Russian horse and foot rushed forward to the attack, and with such force that they captured one of the batteries, took a whole battalion prisoners, and broke the center. Here were the regiments of Dona, perfectly clean and well accoutred, but being less accustomed to war than Frederick's veterans, they gave way at once before the Russian onslaught, and in spite of Frederick's efforts to prevent them, fled from the field and could not be rallied until a mile distant from it. The veterans stood firm, however, until Seedlitz, returning from pursuit, again hurled his horsemen upon the Russian masses, broke them up, and drove their cavalry in headlong flight before him. End of chapter 11